everybody, and welcome to day three of the TMT Vegas Open. Before we get into all of the action today, I have two very special guests on the broadcast to reflect on the past of TFT and look forward to the future. This is going to be Jeff Virtue, the executive producer of TFT, and of course, Michael Sherman, the global head of organized play. How are you both doing this morning? Great. I think that this show has been awesome so far, and it's really lived up to all the dreams that we had. You know, we started working on this about 18 months ago, and it started as a really small dream. We were inspired by things like the World Series of Poker and Evo, and I know that for the team, getting together in an in-person land has been something that we've been looking forward to for so long. And I know as a community and as players, this is something that we've all been looking forward to as well. So I'm personally super excited to be here. The play so far has been really top notch. I think there's been some upsets. Definitely was surprised on some of our knockouts on day one, uh, but I'm, I am so stoked and geared up for this, this final eight here. No, it's been, it's been awesome to see the response and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having us. And, um, everybody here has just been in incredible over the last two days and excited to see how everybody uh, finds day three. I have heard nothing but positive sentiments about this event, <laughs> which is, makes me so excited because when you think about the competition, I love that you bring that up because I agree with you. We've seen some incredible high-level play here. Did you ever think that we would see an Alawi three-star? Uh, I didn't. <laughs> you know, I think we talked a little bit yesterday about some of the bag changes and, and you know, how Headliner works. And seeing that Alawi three-star was insane, you know, the eight tentacles on the board and just um, watching that is, has been really fun. I'm curious if in the final eight we're going to see any five-cost three-stars. What do you think? I, I think it's just been so cool to see how people have, have been able to build their boards. We, we implemented um, live stats for the first time in TFT. So we have data about every game that's been played in this tournament, uh, how players have individually played. I know you've gotten to see some of it as a, as a caster. Um, and it's been cool to be able to see things like how many uh, games were won with a player with just one health left, or like just seeing all of the nuances, how many players unfortunately died at creep rounds. Um, so it's been a lot of fun to see how people play, and then also, you know, with so much going on and, and sometimes being backstage and running around, it's been cool to still be able to get a recap and, and see all the amazing things that have happened. I think for the, the creep round piece too, I know that Sherm and I were talking backstage and we were like, do we want to reveal who that was? And I think, I think we don't. I, I think that would be something that you know, the community would really like to know, but probably the player wouldn't. Well, I heard it was players and then we yeah. actually yeah. had four people that ended up losing to some creep yeah. rounds there. But don't worry, they recovered after that. So yeah. that's definitely good to see. But you know, this competition has been amazing. This event has been amazing and it's, really unique to look at where TFT is now, especially looking at where it all started. So did you ever imagine that we would be here in Vegas to do an event like this? You know, that has been a dream for us. And, and one of the things that I'm super excited to, re to reveal today is that we're actually the world's biggest PC strategy game. Um, and that's, that growth has just been amazing. Yeah, thank you everyone. Um, honestly, we couldn't do this without all of you and, and that's why we kind of come in every, every single day. Uh, but, you know, dreaming up Vegas, when we first started talking about this event, that was, that was part of the inspiration is, you know, where do we go where you can hire roll? And, and Vegas is that place, right? And I think throughout the entire combination, we've seen players really leaning into that, really trying to push their luck. The recombobulators that we're seeing, some of the board <laughs> shuffling, like, the, you know, you're, you're second place in the lobby and you're literally selling your headliner and trying to roll down as fast as you can just to see if you can reposition. And I think that that's been really, really awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I, when I first joined the team, it was a lot of listening to, to feedback from players um, directly. And, and one of the most consistent notes I got was, you know, we really want to see championships as LAN events. And, you know, when we, would, when we went and thought about it, it's like, you know, to do something like that, we'd have to qualify players as an example two months into a set. Uh, and so it's just, you know, I, I understood the sentiment and so much of it was like, how do we build something that, uh, players really want to meet. They want a place to be together. They want to. They want to have that that amazing moment. They want to play on a stage, um, and so they'll you know, kind of kicked off this journey of how do we build something? And it might not be what's being asked for. It may be like a totally different iteration of it. And an open bracket just felt like a great way to bring that to life in a way that just gave everybody the opportunity to get here and be a TFT champion.
I think the thing that's been really cool about the stage too is listening to players talk about what it's like to play on the stage versus <laughs> listening to players talk about what it's like to play on the floor. And the nerves on the stage are a real thing that our competitors have to deal with. And, and that endurance and you know, being able to have all eyes on you while still making those critical you know, strategic decisions each one, each sort of setup in here feels like it has its own sort of like nerves component. You have like in the open pit, you've got players literally standing right behind you and like really close. Uh, if you're on the main stage, you've got all the lights and the, the sounds and the crowd. And then if you're in uh, the co-streaming pit, you also just know that uh, uh, some streamer is out there uh, critically analyzing everything that's going on. Um, and so it's just, it's a totally different setup depending on uh, where you're seated. I've definitely heard a lot of people liken it to like the MLG events of old. And I feel like that was such a nostalgic feeling for a lot of people to have walking into a venue like this, being able to sort of relive that. And when I kind of reflect on that, I, where are we in TFT right now in terms of just this new era? Where do you see us from like set nine to even set 10? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I think set nine was resoundingly a positive effect for TFT. And, and really, we've seen so much success um, with Return to Runeterra. And, and um, you know, that ranged from a couple of things. The thematic was really resonant with our players. Players absolutely adored the, you know, the core Runeterra IP. And that really made approachability for, for set nine really high because you understood who the champions were, you understood who the traits were, um, and that allowed a lot of people to get in. And then we tested some new stuff. We had region portals, and region portals added game-to-game -game variants, which was so important. And now we see that moving forward into, into set 10 with Remix Rumble. Uh, one of the things that's really, really cool about our dev team is that we're constantly trying to learn. And so we'll test things in a particular set. If it really resonates, then we'll try to bring that to a future set. Sometimes they'll stay, sometimes they'll go. But I think that that's part of the fun of TFT. And then, you know, we, we did have some challenges. We had some balance challenges uh, in, in set nine. And, you know, the teams learned really from that and started to roll that forward. And there's kind of two areas that we've really deeply invested. We've talked a lot about the three set per year model and how we're moving into that format. Remix Rumble is the, the first time that we're really seeing that start to come online. We have three full teams at Riot that are working in parallel on set development now, and they kind of work in a leapfrog fashion. So that gives us a lot more time for balance. That gives us a lot more time to kind of soak and figure out you know, what's working and what's not working. And then in addition to that, we've built a game analysis team. And that's an internal team that's composed of a lot of pro players. And, and so they sit right with the dev team. They're a part of the dev team. And they're helping us to understand what's working, what's not. You know, how, do we, how do we really iron out some of those balance challenges? So that's, I think, been, been really cool to kind of see so far with, with Set9. Yeah, I mean, Set9 was just so much fun, too, from an, an eSports perspective, because we got to see um, kind of like a lot of people get back into competitive play. We timed Set9 with the announcement of, of Vegas, too. So there was just like so much excitement going into that set um, at all levels that it was kind of like it started people's journey to the, even this event all the way back in May. It's been so much hype building over the past six months, a year, and to see the growth of TFT, especially from the esports perspective, is something that I feel like everybody has picked up on. Even just looking at the NA events, which is really my home region, I cannot believe some of the level of competition. You talked about kind of one of the some of the day one players sadly not making it forward, but we kind of saw that too when it came to the esports side. A lot of fan favorites and a lot of veterans also not make it forward, paving this way forward for some of these newer players. Yeah, you know, our, our vision for TFT Esports is to make it approachable to all players. And that doesn't mean that, you know, every a gold player needs to qualify for uh, a set championship, but it means that players see a competitive path that, uh, that they're able to participate in. Um, and uh, all the way, and we, we like to describe it as like, well, what's a competitive player? Is it masters beyond? And I was like, no, a competitive player is anyone who thinks they should be ranked higher than they are, um, <laughs> where they, they kind of care about the way that they uh, compete in the game and play the game. And so um, a lot of that has sort of steered the way that we talked about and built around TFT Esports, and I'm really excited to say that you know, we've seen now um, three sets of, of growth for TFT from like a engagement and viewership standpoint at our, our esports events. Um, so we're really excited to think like, okay, this is starting to work. We're, we're learning a lot along the way. How do we keep snowballing that into sort of like a, a, our continued growth for the, the esport? 
And to Sherman's point, I think one of the things that's been really cool about this open format, and one of the reasons that we're so excited about it, is that it does allow a lot of different ranks to come in and compete. Yeah. And so, you know, I would give a shout out to every 512 players that were here if I could. One of my favorite stories is Kato Kite and how Kato Kite was able to join the tournament and really rise to the level that he did. He was on Reddit this morning, and I was actually seeing he's got an AMA going on with that as well, which has been really exciting to see. So cool. Yeah, just the, the, his OPGG, or LOL Chess, uh, 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 history got shared around yesterday, and it was like, this guy was gold in, in set one and like silver in set two, and only hit masters right in set nine uh, to even purchase a ticket for this event. Just so to see them do so well and make it to the round of 32, his, his interview was amazing too yesterday. Oh, Jeff. it was I don't so know good. Who, yeah. 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 <laughs> It was so fun to be able to hear that passion, not just from him, but from all of the players that have been participating at this event. And I feel like everybody is so hungry now to be able to do this again. So piggybacking off of the success that you saw in set number nine, going into set 10, what were some of the key takeaways that you ended up finding from set nine to bring forward into the new set? Yeah, so I mean, I talked about region portals. Obviously, we had portals come back, and that offers tremendous game-to-game -game variance, which is so important. Um, you know, and then another thing that uh, is harking all the way back to set four is, is chosen, and we brought that back as headliner. Um, the team, I am, I am so indebted and proud of them, worked really hard on this mechanic. And when we build TFT, we think about the theme, the champions, the traits, the mechanic. Um, and that mechanic is, is so kind of structural and important. And about halfway through development, we made some major modifications to Headliner. Uh, and then it started to just really click. And the team was just buzzing. And, and I think one of the things that's so exciting for me is when we're all in the office and you hear literally the entire pit light up. And sometimes, like, I'm not even joking. Like, there's, there's so many people here right now in Vegas. But, like, sometimes that energy that you feel in Vegas, we feel on the dev team. And so we'll have certain changes that we're making or, like, certain things that we're doing from the dev side. And then it's just, like, you know, so energetic within the pit. And so Headliner's a great example of that, you know, taking something that was a beloved mechanic, really plus-plusing that, leveling it up, and then seeing where we can evolve it. And, and then that's manifested in, in Remix Rumble and I think a really tremendous way. And, and I think that, you know, the, the team is so proud of the, the patch and how balance has landed and, and how everything's looking currently. Feels like a, such a sweet spot for TFT to be in right now. And I'm actually kind of curious, what's your favorite Remix? from Remix Rumble. Do you have an idea in mind? That's a, that I favorites? have a lot. I think I have to say that they're all my favorite Remix because uh, I'm, a, I'm a dev on the team, but if I just select one, and, and again, they're all my favorite children, so I, I can't say that they're not, but if one was my favorite child, um, Jin, I think that like the whole like uh, violin, you know, coming through is, is so good. I'm also a big fan of uh, jazz, so I know that's contentious right now because of some of our balance patches, but um, I really loved the saxophone track and, and kind of how that mixed into everything. Um, and I think all of you got to hear that a lot as jazz was pretty prevalent a couple weeks ago. So. <laughs> Well, Jeff stole mine. Like, I was a day one jazz player. Uh, may, not because I thought Bard was good, but uh, just because I like the music. So it's been fun to like play around with it. I've even seen, I know there's community tools out there where you can like build your own remixes and just kind of play around with all of it. And I've spent quite a bit of time just like trying to see what you can, what all you can hear. I think one of the things that's been really cool is like on YouTube, sometimes you'll find people that are like DJs and they're just putting out their own mixes. Yeah. And I had, you know, like everyone here, like I have those late nights where you're like, you know, stumbling down a, a YouTube rabbit hole or something strange and it's like 10 o'clock at night. And I think I listened to like 15 or 20 different fan made remix tracks of some of our, you know, stingers and, and tracks yeah. that we had for, uh, for remix rumble. And it was so inspiring. Like some of those are, they're, they're bangers. Like yeah. they're so good. And then, you know, I think credit to Steve Aoki, who we worked with for the cinematic and credit to our publishing team, because that has been, I think, one of the coolest things. And I've probably watched it. There's like, I think like 28 or 29 million views. I have to be like three and a half million of those views. At this point, so. Is it just on loop for it you does, when you're yeah, working? I wake up in the morning and then I work and it's just in the background and then yeah. <laughs> Jeff just got the 10 hour loop on YouTube. It's constantly running. <laughs> I love it. I might actually have that on my PC right now too. I'm not nice. going to lie. Nice. Uh, but you know, when you look at the set 10 structure and forward, Sherman, I'm curious from your perspective, how that might have influenced or shaped the way that you view esports now from set 10 and beyond. Yeah, I think it's exciting for us to think about um, you know, set 10 and the, the launch of three sets a year means that we have the opportunity to, to sort of rethink how does a set of TFT esports work? Um, you know, so 
we're, we're kind of in set 10. It's going to be a little bit of a shortened set due to, to this and the holidays. Um, but as we get into set 11, it really opens us up to, you know, how should a four-month set of TFT esports work? Let's not just like take everything we were doing and shorten it down. Um, so let's be really methodical about how we continue to iterate and approach the, the space. Um, and I think I'm just really excited to have another championship. You know, we're, we're looking at uh, just a, a thinking about prize pools next year with an additional championship and a lot of the ways that we're kind of continuing to grow around the world. I'm pretty sure TFT Esports will hit over $2 million in, in prize pool next year in total. That's wow. crazy. Yeah. And that's all coming from Sherman's bank account. Yes, yes. Yeah. Himself, so. From all the cosmetics people are buying, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's hard not to when you take a look at some of those amazing little legends and those boards. Absolutely. I've definitely pity rolled a few things. Um, I always pity roll, which I don't, everybody says that devs get what? cheats, but I never get cheats. It's only Mort and maybe Wit Rock sometimes that get cheats, <laughs> but. I got the KDA board on my you first did? roll. Yeah, it was. I, I, I usually never get them yeah. ever. Oh. That's just a state of envy right there. Yeah, first. I'm first. still working on it. But yeah. when you look at how we are closing out the year, basically, with this giant land in Las Vegas, can you give us a sneak peek of what's coming for 2024? I think everybody would be curious to know. I think we could. I think we could. So we've got a little bit of stuff that we're going to share today. You know, the first thing that I want to talk about was the inspiration for, you know, Set 10 and, and all of that and, and the Vegas Open. Really, this was a marquee cultural moment where we really wanted to bring kind of TFT out and, and bring it into the forefront. And I think that we've delivered on that. And we couldn't, as I had mentioned earlier, have done it without all of you as players that are here and then all of you that are tuning in virtually or watching the VODs. So that's, that's been really energizing for us as a dev team. Uh, but as we start to look towards the future, one of the things that uh, we're going to reveal today is something that we're calling a set revival. Um, and a set revival is a new event that we're going to be bringing to TFT. And basically what that means is that we're going to be resurrecting some of our old sets that you may be familiar with. We're not yet ready to say which set, but you know, if you loved a Mac or if you loved any of these other things, then you might be excited about this. And that will launch in 2024 with Lunar Rebel. And so uh, that'll be our new game mode. You'll be able to jump in, play some of the old set content. Uh, and if that format works well, that's something that we want to move forward and kind of adapt and continue to do in the future. Uh, but then as we look even further ahead, a little little couple other spoilers for everybody. Uh, we're talking a little bit about Set 11 today, and that's going to be a mythological journey. Um, and it's really inspired by the hero's journey and then Shanghai Scrolls. And I can't tell you how good that is in early playtests right now. Um, the team has been killing it on this. We had a design jam day about three weeks ago. I think the whole team played like 11 games of set 11. Uh, the, the trait web's coming together really well. The champions are super fun. Uh, the mechanic, which we're gonna talk about when we officially reveal the, the set is awesome, like really awesome. And the thing that's so inspiring about the dev team is we continue to find new ways to approach mechanics and really level up in that space. And so, um, you know, if that continues to work, that, that's something that's been really compelling. So stay tuned for set 11, which is gonna come next year. Uh, and then a little spoiler on set 12, we're gonna be leaning into magic schools. So you could imagine maybe uh, portal magic or some of these other like really wacky twists on how magic might appear in the convergence and in TFT. Uh, so the team is early on that. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have three full set teams now that are working on these sets in parallel. Um, so there's gonna be like a little bit of different spice for each of these. And then later in the year, uh, we're going to have our five-year anniversary of TFT, which is crazy to think about because it feels like it's been <laughs> like oh. one day, but also it feels like it's been 15 years. <laughs> so I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I definitely have some, some more gray hair now. Um, <laughs> but we'll have our five-year anniversary of TFT, and we're going to be having a new game mode for that. Uh, we're not yet ready to reveal what that new game mode is, but uh, that's going to be really exciting to see. And then as we move later into the year, and you know, obviously talked about the set revivals earlier, we'll be bringing another set back if that works and if that's something that all of you as players really enjoy. Um, so please give us feedback. And then finally, finally, the final thing will be, uh, we'll be talking a little bit later next year about set 13 and we're not ready to reveal what that is yet. It's gonna be a big question mark. Uh, but expect something really compelling and really exciting there. But, but third set confirmed. Third set confirmed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're, you, ha you have to hold us to it. What about set 16? Set 16, we finished that, you know, two years ago. <laughs> We've just left that in the closet, and uh, no, we haven't. I don't even know what set 16 is. Somebody on the dev team might be thinking about it. Um, or all of you as players, if you have crazy ideas, 
Um, we do send out surveys. We read all of the different you know, social medias and the Reddits and the Discords and everything. So if you have ideas for how you want to see new themes appear in the future of TFT, definitely post online. Um, one of my favorites that I've heard is Food Fight Tactics. I don't know if we'll ever do that. <laughs> but if you could imagine every single champion being some different type of like fruit bowl or burrito, um, maybe maybe someday we'll do that. So I've, I've also heard that that's more dog's favorite set. It's not. <laughs> we tease him about that at work all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe that'll be something that we see in the future. But I think we have one last reveal for what What's we want to talk about next year, um, which is I think everybody has had an amazing time this year at the TFT Vegas Open. And uh, we're excited to ask that you help join us when we do this again next year. Uh, <laughs> Now, I, I will say, uh, I think Claire is from North America. You will have to travel a little bit further. Uh, we're not ready to talk quite about a date, uh, but we are excited to, to see what it looks like to do this in another part of the world. It sounds like we have so much to be excited for. Looking at the roadmap, we have a ton of events, sets ahead of us. I wish you'd tell us a little bit more about set 12. But <laughs> soon, soon. I know. you if gotta keep working. some secrets close to you. Keep I it understand. secret, keep it safe. Keep it secret, keep it safe. But I'm so happy to hear that this has been a resounding success in both of your eyes in terms of the event, the way that the player base has reacted to this. And we're getting a chance to do it again. Absolutely. I can't believe it. No, I think, you know, it, it truly is when we started this project, it was all about. Yes, we want to create an esports event, but we really want to create a celebration for the community. Um, you know, I think we, we kind of talk about it. We built a room with computers and lights, but like players from Lab came out here in lab coats, and DSG signed every player under the sun that they could that they could possibly sign. It's just it's been incredible to see how players have taken this and truly made it their own. Um, and, and, and players have just kind of made it everything we, we could have hoped it would be. So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody out here who's joined us online, in person, who's just been our, our, our champions for this since day one. Um, you know, we were really excited to do something different for Riot. I think doing an open bracket event was something that we've never really gone very deep on. Um, and so to, to jump straight into a 512 event and see players just show up like with like immediately like tickets selling out we were like i hope we sell out what happens if we're two months out and we haven't sold out um so it's just been incredible to see people's response and reaction to this and, and we couldn't be excited to, to do more of them i think it was really funny like early on we were we were definitely nervous we were like hey is the world ready for in-person events again like how do we need to approach this uh but but seeing the tickets sell out, I think, gave us some confidence. Now, I know that uh, for all of you as players and for those that are tuning in at home, there were definitely some areas that we can improve on that. And so we've, we've gathered that feedback. We've heard that. And that's as you know, we look towards the next open, something that we really wanted to kind of look into and learn from. So for everybody that was able to purchase a pass, you know, thank you. And for everybody who wasn't, we definitely hear your feedback. And you know, thank you for being patient with us. Um, the other thing that I'd just love to echo from, from what uh, Sherman said is we, we do this for all of you. And, and I, I really mean that. Like, everyone at Riot is intrinsically motivated by, by our players. And um, I think all of us are players. And if you can't tell, you know, um, hopefully that came through. We've got a huge number of our dev team and our publishing team and our esports team here. And the reason that they're here is because they wanted to be and they wanted to meet all of you and they wanted to hear from all of you. And so uh, this gives us energy. Working with all of you as players is, is really like, you know, the, the you know, job of a lifetime for, for all of us. And so thank you from all of us at Riot. Um, it really means a lot that, that you choose to play TFT, that you choose to play Riot games. Um, and that you choose to spend your time here with us. So again, you know, thank you. I think that that is as good a note as any to be able to end this segment on. Jeff, Sherman, thank you both so much for not only sharing your passion with everybody here, but of course, into the games itself. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks everybody. And thank you good all luck. for being here. Yeah, good luck today.
Azale here with Panda. And Panda, we have had so many incredible games this weekend. 512 players narrowed down to the final eight after two incredible days of competition. And I've got to say it, we've ended up with four NA representatives and four EMEA representatives, an even field for the final lobby. And for this regional rivalry, we have to look at really the historical context. Set three galaxies, double 61, who's on this stage today, winning it for EMEA. Recently though, NA massive resurgence. Re Set eight monsters attack, re replay, getting that big win for NA. Is this considered maybe the international tiebreaker with an event of this caliber for the day three? I mean, I think it has to be the tiebreaker, right? It's going to be coming down to this. We have had these players playing incredible throughout this weekend to make it here. They're playing for that TFT Vegas Open title for the $100,000 first prize, but they're also playing for the pride of the region. A lot of these players work together, prepare together from the different regions, and they really want to be able to represent themselves and their region well. And that's gonna be it here. We're gonna start things off with a pre-show for the final day three of the Vegas Open. I'm sure the crowd is so ecstatic to be here today. Let's, Let's go! go. Pre-show. Azale Panda, thank you both so much for the introduction to the final day of the TFT Vegas Open. We're just gonna keep the ball rolling with all of the action here, especially after all of that amazing news that we heard about the future of TFT get a chance to look forward to the future now. It's been an amazing weekend so far. I mean, it's yeah, we said at the top of the show, it's the energy, the atmosphere in here, it is electric. And now that we're here in finals day, right, you can feel it in the air. Everybody here in the stage, you can see people standing it's all the packed. way in the back, right? Yes. Everybody yep. wants to be here to watch the finals happen. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible moment. to hear that we're going to get to do this again. That's so amazing. And the fact that, you know, all those announcements, having the fact of be able to play an old set once again, you know, for all the people who have those nostalgia feels about those sets saying, oh, yeah, this previous sets are my favorite. It's so awesome to see all those different things. As well as the announcements of when the new sets are, you know, that gives us a little bit of an idea how the competitive circuit will look like, when that world championship is going to roll around. So I'm very excited for that as well. I'm expecting everybody in this room to join an esports event at some <laughs> point for TFT. <laughs> Try it out. There's been so many cups that have happened to you that I feel like still reflect that open bracket style of play, but still with the, of course, coveted title of a champion at the very end of that road. And one person here is gonna take that title today. It has been a very long weekend, action-packed, so many games, but at the end of it all, we have one final lobby of eight players that are due it out today. That's right, we got the checkmate format today, right? We've got eight players remaining. We're playing the same one through eight scoring system that we've seen all weekend long. And the players today are playing for the biggest share of the $300,000 prize pool with the first place finisher taking home 100,000. And that's so much money. I was talking to our hair and makeup person this morning and she was like, so so what do you what do you win here? Is it just the title? And I was like, no, actually no, it's like a lot. 100 grand on the line and she nearly fell over. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. And it completely changes the way these players are going to have to play. You know, we have had a lot of people playing for first anyway because of the harsh cut on top two. But now you have to be able to lock in that first place once you reach check to secure that belt and all the money. And there's tension there too, right? Because you want to stick to the game plan that's gotten you here thus far, right? You don't want to divert from the plan that has found success. However, like you're saying, in the checkmate format, you have to imagine that if you are just scamming out third and fourth place finishes <laughs> all weekend long, finding yourself yeah. here, you might put yourself into check, but you have to actually reach that top position. Are you trying to reference position. someone I'm here? not going to name any names. We'll just see. We'll see how it all plays out. <laughs> Listen, sometimes you can just high roll. I mean, we talked to these amazing people at the beginning of the day that were like, hey, guess what? You could just high roll because you're in Vegas. Uh, it's all entirely <laughs> true, true, not true. out of the realm of possibility here. But we have eight players that are incredibly deserving of their spots on this main stage. You can see them on the screen right now. And take a moment to be able to give them their roses, their flowers oh, before they the even crowd. come up here. I know, yeah. everybody's hyping them up. Cheering Rightfully them. so. These guys have been amazing for the past two days. But of course, I have to kind of let my biases shine. Four players out of EMEA making it to that top eight with only like 20% player base coming into the tournament. You have to respect that.
Look, I got to respect the conversion rate. I absolutely have to do, do so. But I want to start talking about the North American players a little bit, and especially one that, in my opinion, is a big favorite for NA coming in to this final, and that is Broccoli. He is someone who has consistently been a top player in North America, but he found his most success peaking in set five and six. We saw multiple final lobby performances in set six. We saw a fifth at set five mid set. He actually even finished fourth at mid set in set at eight, he's continued to keep that form, but a lot of times Broccoli has not quite cracked our top 15 when it comes to power rankings. Coming to this tournament though, Broccoli seems to have a meta read that is quite different than a lot of other players. We see him rolling a lot more earlier in the game, stabilizing on very strong boards, and then wind streaking throughout stage three and stage four. One of the things that he has said in the past is he likes to play a group of guys around stage three. <laughs> a and rag four. Tag. ragtag group rag of guys. Ragtag group of guys. It's, it's specifically a ragtag group of guys to just try and find wins in that mid game. And I think he's really found his stride playing around his comfort in this uh, tournament so far, and he's had massive amount of success. So you're saying chosen Olaf as one of the ragtag guys. <laughs> right. Hold no, on, that actually. was Candace. I know. But I, <laughs> I'm, I think Broccoli's, Broccoli's, no. <laughs> Broccoli's got the tech. You better believe Broccoli's got the tech. In, in fact, it seems he doesn't really like to play around a lot of the one and two costs. We've seen a lot more of him kind of lose streaking stage two and then playing around a three cost headliner and pushing with that. I think the big story for me from NA has to be Broccoli. And everybody I talk to, you know, you kind of walk around after day two. You talk to players, you're like, who do you think's got it? Broccoli is the player that has been named the most. He is up there on the leaderboard, and he is definitely one of the players to watch. And the big thing is a lot of players would say Broccoli, but the other player that would come to mind for a lot of the North American challenger players, the players who compete a lot, is Malala. He has con pretty consistently cracked into that top 15 since set seven. It was really set seven where he had his big breakout. He had multiple very good placements, but then it was set eight that he had his best performances, right? Mid set, second place. He top eighted regionals, yes, eighth place, but he did get to the final lobby of regionals, which is an incredible feat. And across set nine, it, he left a little bit to be desired because we started to have such high expectations for him. It wasn't a bad set by any means, but he didn't quite make regionals and he's a player we consistently expect to get there. So there's no surprise to see Malala in the final lobby of Vegas. This is a player who has been near the top of North American TFT and he's always been someone we expect to spike a tournament. This is kind of the one that you'd want to spike if you're gonna hit one though. No, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> And Malala, you know, uh, in the grand scheme of things, is representative of this kind of changing in the guard that we saw in North America, right? When set, came, uh, set 8 came out, we had players like Wajin Iverson, Bosso Skills, Malala kind of come out, and players like Milk and Pocky Gum take a step back those spots were filled by these players like Malala who found the consistency through the set. The craziest part about it is that was all one big study group, really, right? The Bosso, Malala, Weijin, that whole group. I mean, there's, actually, I could sit here for like five minutes and keep rattling off names, all but we're right, not going to do all that. All right, let me just stop <laughs> to that, because <laughs> while I already said there's four EMEA players coming through, there is one country that has absolutely solidified their standing on the stage with not one, but two players coming out of Germany. And that's very special to me, of course, seeing them kind of rise up in their region, in the local TRC. But I do want to talk about both of them just a little bit. Kevin Parker, in the last set, just barely not making it to Worlds, had an amazing run throughout the entire set, sits at the top of the EUS ladder again and again and again. That guy is grinding games like no one else and he is in it to win it. That is, is his entire goal, and I'm so, so happy to see him here. It's been so cool to hear all of the stories as well about just kind of the comeuppance of these EMEA players. I know for a few sets now, we've talked about NA dominance, but I believe that Kevin Parker is one of those players that is a huge contender in this race, and I think the stats speak for themselves. I know Germany is one of those regions in EMEA that actually produces a lot of kind of the superstars, right? They've got the talent on the high end. And in fact, I know we've actually even talked about the fact that Germany may not always have 
the, uh, the, the, the structure, the format, the underbelly of <laughs> development, <laughs> but they produce the superstars. And there's something to be said about going to the big stage, showing up in Vegas, putting your country on the map. And that's one of the things that's so unique about Vegas, right? You're not just playing for yourself. You're playing for your country. You're playing for your friends. You are representative of something bigger than yourself. And I think Kevin Parker is a great example of that. He is. And with him is Zaza, the other German player coming through here. And like you were saying, the TRC in Germany has been kind of here and there. But what hasn't is the community between these guys. There is a big, big, big German player group here. And one of the breakout talents that we have to shout out from Rising Legends, from the EMEA circuit, has to be Zaza, the only player in EMEA to win two major cups in two different sets. That is is a major, major success. And while he wasn't able to go all the way at like a high finish at Worlds, he is here as one of the top eight players. And I do have a little bit of a very cute, fun fact about him because him and his girlfriend have this ritual where they make a candle for important events and they light it when the event happens. And so I'm sure back in Germany, there's like a TFT open Vegas candle. And I'm sure it's probably still flickering too. It has to be. Yeah, the magic keeps going because he still made it here. And, you know, Zaza was really impressive to me because there was a game where he actually went fast 10. He was the only fast 10 I ever saw in the tournament. And that ended up being, he, he fell in fifth. It wasn't the best game. And I thought, oh, maybe Zaza is going to be out. But he's so consistent. His fundamentals have been so good that he kept putting up placement after placement and continued through the rest of the tournament. And you were kind of alluding to it earlier, Gangly. He hasn't really found those wins just yet. But I feel like that's even the more impressive to be here without actually getting first places, with how cutthroat this format was. And I am so sure he's going to show up. So even leading into the event, I had a, a quick chance to speak to Zaza. And he, he said that, you know, I'm not super comfortable playing around these fast nine, fast 10 boards. I want to play around level eight. I want to be able to build a strong board there and solidify my spot in this top four. The thing is, it's a very strong strong way of playing the game and obviously it works and you know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest we have some North American players who are like that as well in in this in this same tournament right so it's not it's definitely not a bad way to play the game the question is can Zaza take what he's built on and then convert that into a first place finish today we'll have to see now we've talked a little bit about some of the big heroes right the big North American and EMEA heroes let's hear a little bit about the underdog starting with Humbug, the representative of the lab. Let's go! <laughs> Back there! This is a player that so many people may not know too much about, but he is a representative of the lab, one of the largest study groups in North America. He is a self-proclaimed... You can hear that. Yeah, you absolutely yeah. <laughs> can. Self-proclaimed reroll master, and his strategy going into this event was, you know what? I cannot find an edge by going fast nine, fast 10 like other players. What I can do is play around verticals, fall back on rerolls. And we talked with Azale uh, on, on Friday about this, that in a field this large, it's not enough to actually just be the best. You have to find unique edges on the field. Humbug is a player, and you can see him. Look at, Look this. at this. Oh yeah. my goodness. There's Ashbu and Humbug Cass. right there. That oh, was that's such the moment. A yes, moment. Cass, I remember you were there, right? You you saw this moment actually happen where Ashbu and Humbug both qualified together to the top eight. That game was still going on. I was standing behind <laughs> Ashbu when Solus was eliminated in fifth. Ashbu and Humbug were still in the top four, and both of them only needed that. And Ashbu popped up and ran over to Humbug. There's still four of them left in the game, and they started hugging and jumping up and down because they knew they had locked in the spots. It's important to recognize that even if you don't find that your edge is being the most well-rounded player in the field, Humbug has taken this pr approach of saying, I'm going to play to my strengths, play what I know I can play well, and if it falls in my favor, I can convert better than anybody else here. And I'm gonna say, he is actually the player I was saying kind of scammed his third, 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 third into oh. top eight. I didn't even know I was flaming two EU. Of them. EU yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we both got one. Humbug, absolutely an under, uh, underdog of the tournament. Amazing run to make it here. A challenger player in North America that absolutely deserves his spot in the top eight. I'm very, very proud to see it happen. Now, We've got one other underdog from North America I want to talk about, which is... He deserves that title like no one else, I feel like. Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? And this next one, though, Ashmu, another underdog from North America, has a fascinating story, right? Ashmu started his competitive set in, in set eight, went into the Defender Cup, and immediately found success with a 15th place finish. I got to speak to Ashmu, who said, 
I went into that final day knowing that I was able to win. And when I couldn't actually convert, it hurt so badly that I wanted to take a step back from competitive TFT, nearly did not return to the competitive scene, but found its way back in set nine, returned to play, and now is here today. Yeah, I remember speaking to him as well, and in the interviews that he gave, <laughs> you could feel the emotion. You could feel how much he wanted this. And I can't believe Cassidy did it again. He walked away from his PC, and then he just grabbed the first. Yeah, it's, it's actually the most fun stat about Ashmu, is he has uh, <laughs> most games Games not sitting at his PC when the game ends. It was, it was, like it was, his PO it was, at this point. You know, it's like it's like that Phineas and Ferb meme. Is like yeah, if he had a nickel for every time he had done it, he'd have two nickels. But it's kind of funny that it happened twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty awesome that it happened twice. One time he twice. walked away and he went first. The second time it was when he had locked in top eight and he didn't care what happened the rest <laughs> of that game. You saw him hugging Kerm there. The game's still going on. <laughs> One of the things about Ash Moo is that he believes his edge is in the fact that he's an intuitive player. He's very good at finding edges in an unsolved patch. And guess what? We are on the third day of this brand new patch. Most of these players had a travel day, and he did not get to actually prepare in the same way that a lot of players did. He had to finish, he studied, spent the last two weeks studying for his finals, finished his last final, got on a plane, wow. flew here, and figured it out on the spot. This is an intuitive player who can find an edge in a field, Absolutely deserving to be here. So happy to see Ashmu on the stage. We have two other players, though, that we would be so remiss to talk about. And the war first one that I really want to hone in on is Noel. Noel is one of the EMEA players that is left in the competition and has earned his spot in this top eight. And Noel has been such a treat to watch. I remember getting a chance to watch his performance in the top 32. We wanted to try to grab an interview with him after he won his first game. And he was like, uh, I can't right now but we'll do it after I win the next one. And he yeah. ended up going first wow. first. So pretty <laughs> That's stellar. And I think it's also going to speak volumes to how he might be able to perform today because in this checkmate format, you want to get as many first under your belt. Obviously, it only matters after you hit the checkpoint, but Noel's definitely a player that I feel like can do that. And he's also having a return to form with this tournament. Yeah, one of the big things that I noticed when I was talking to him earlier is I was, you know, asking where he traveled from, and I found out that he's one of only two Hungarian players that made it to the event. So as much as we were talking about Emiya's conversion rate as a whole, Hungary has a conversion rate of 50% <laughs> into the top eight. Awesome. Still made it in. I mean, Hungary is part of it. <laughs> it's kind of true. We have like this meme uh, in Emiya that every time in her local finals, there is one Hungarian just knocking it out from out of nowhere. These these guys, I don't know what they're doing over there, but TFT is amazing for them. Yeah, I feel like I don't know what they like were fed for breakfast, but I feel <laughs> yeah. like it's really going to convert over into some big success today. But of course, our eighth and certainly not last player that we have to go over is the man, the myth, the legend. It's KC Double Sixty One. That is a player that I feel like is just really needs no introduction when it comes to TFT. But in case you're out of the loop, this is the very first world champion in TFT. Ended up earning that title in Galaxy. And now coming here today is, is here off of the back of so many separate successes after that. And just this morning, he tweeted saying, I feel exactly like I did on day three of set three. That is a threat. Come on. I mean, Definitely. I think by and large, Double 61 has to be considered the favorite coming in, right? Just the pedigree of player. He is a world champion. And it's not that he stopped after his world championship. He's still been a top player in EMEA for the long run. And it's so interesting to also see kind of the juxtaposition of talking about Noel and Double 61 looking at their stack cards, because both of them actually go kind of level eight or even level nine at the very beginning of stage five. And I think that's also something that might play a little bit of a role when it comes down to how all these players interact in this final lobby. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes down to finals day, confidence is actually significantly more important than any other day, right? We, we talk about finding edge in gameplay. We, find, we talk about finding edge in in unique lines. Finding edge by having nerves of steel, by knowing how to win, by knowing how to clutch up, is the way to win finals day, because going 2-2-2-2-2 two, 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 is just not going to be enough. Yeah, I mean, every single game is worth more and more money at this point. There is so much on the line in the final lobby specifically, right? Making small increases throughout the tournament. Once you get here, every point is massive. Yeah, and it's checkmate after all, so that can always throw a wrench into whatever is going on. And I'm 
just very scared a little bit, to be honest, because I've been there twice now that games have ended after four <laughs> games for a check in. Oh, oh no. So let's just all hope that that's not what's happening today. I think everybody in the crowd would be very excited to get a long show today. But that's another element that does play a role in terms of the nerves that might come into this final lobby is the fact that we have an amazing crowd here to support all eight of our players that are taking that main stage. And they really are going to have to be in peak form and hopefully not get nervous about the fact that they are playing in front of such an amazing audience. We are about ready to get started with the show. So let's go. Let's go. It feels amazing. I, I would have never expected to, to make it this far. My goal was basically not to get day one, so right now I'm feeling pretty confident. <laughs> I'm honestly going into the final eight, I feel kind of nervous. I kind of have like a reputation for choking in really big tournaments, but I'm looking to, you know, break that curse. Once I get onto stage, it's going to feel absolutely amazing, and I'm going to be absolutely so stressed. I think I can make it. I can win. The main person that worries me in the lobby is, of course, Ashmu, because I think he's my biggest competition. We go in together, and now we're going to have to pit, face off against each other. I think it's going to be me or Ashmu. It's actually funny that four EU players are going to play against four NA players. The big names didn't make it, like Setsuko, Disop, so I don't really know them that much. Hopefully, EU will take it home. The whole NAEU thing, I don't even know where it originally stemmed from. Double 61, he won Worlds in set three, but then we had a replay win in set eight. So we're kind of at like a stalemate right now. So I think this will finally just prove like the tiebreaker that we've all been waiting for. And it's all at Vegas. And I'm happy to represent NA. Player that well, worries me the most is probably Double 61. He's kind of like the goat of EU. Double 61, I have faced him in, in birds. Uh, faced him in a couple of tournaments, uh, and he's probably the best EU player. I won the world in set 3.5, so uh, I did the, the hardest thing to do in TFT. People can can stress because uh, I mean there is a crowd, and uh, there is no wall jump in the in the table except me. So yeah, I think uh, they can they can be stressful. On the big stage, there's lights and stuff. Like there's there's noises and stuff. It's uh it's gonna be definitely harder for me to keep my nerves in check. I'm gonna do my best, and I'm gonna make sure that I uh, have nerves of steel. I think it's 50-50. Uh, Either I win or I don't. Being in the final is an overwhelming feeling, but feeling all the support behind you, like it's starting to pay off. You just feel proud of yourself and a lot more confident that you can do it. I can be the person who wins Vegas Open. of competition. We started with 512 players that gathered here from all over the world to compete here, not just for, of course, this gorgeous champion belt, but the title of the TFT Vegas Open champion. We have eight players now that we are about to welcome onto the stage, so please join me in welcoming your final eight. <laughs> Your first player that needs no introduction, it's the man, the myth, the legend, Casey Double 61.
Your next player, the proclaimed underdog that could turn big dog, it's Ashmo. Your next player, hailing from North America, who I hope has got the vitamin D in his veins, it's Broccoli! Your next player that has been welcoming in the new age of North America TFT, it's Malala! Your next player, join me in welcoming to the stage, it's Sasa! Your next player, who I am convinced might just be an undercover superhero, Kevin Parker! Your eighth player, and certainly not least, and definitely going first today, it's Noel. Welcome to the show. I'm doing incredible, man. This weekend has been so much fun. And I think the lobby is kind of this perfect mix of competitors from around the world. But also some of these stories like Ash Moo, who's just a complete, you know, underdog coming into this and performing so incredibly well. We have people like Broccoli who hasn't, you know, been playing at this at this highest heights uh, for a while now. You know, he's kind of been more up and down. He's playing incredibly well. It's just been such an incredible event to watch. It has been, and I feel like for Broccoli, there's a whole nother narrative here where for the entire event, he's been saying like, I know something that everyone else is failing to do, but I won't tell you what, and we can see it paying off. So I am so, so happy we get to watch it oh, closely. Hold on, I just see Mordog, he's not even looking at us. He's just taking it all in. Yeah. He's looking away, um, surveying, hey, hello Mordog, we're over here. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm enjoying the players. Look how excited they are to be here. A couple of them are taking selfies, they got to do that walk up like it's so surreal the audience is packed like this is just this is everything i'm i'm excited yeah it's incredible and the crowd has been amazing who here is excited to watch the final lobby of the tmd vegas open <laughs> I mean, the great part about it is that now everyone comes together and is watching one game, right? We started out with 32 different lobbies playing on day one. People spread around, you know, watching their favorites, watching individual players. Now everyone is gathering together to watch the top eight competitors buy for that $100,000 first place prize. It's been years in the making as well. I mean, we waited for so long for TFT to have this moment, right? We've had an opportunity where we had land competitions in the past, but, you know, 
know, quite frankly, we were robbed of that. I know maybe an unfortunate yeah. event happened on the globe, so we had to push that back. So TFT's been out for how long? We're like four, four and a half years. Four and now. a half years. And now. so, and yeah. we were finally here on the big stage, and I think it's also starting to catch up to some of the players. They're talking about how they're not nervous, the pressure's off, but the lights and the cameras, the intros, <laughs> the big penguin, Negro, welcoming them in. You can't help but feel like the stakes have never been higher. Yeah, for sure, right? You've come this far, right? And the gap between eighth place and first place, that's a big difference in prize pool. That's going to be pretty major here. And the fact that anytime there makes a big play, you're going to hear the audience roar today. It's going to be loud, right? And we talked before about how some players, like when they hear that, it can be really distracting. So it'll be interesting to see how they deal with that. But they've had at least two days to adjust to that. And so hopefully they've got it and they can keep it together. Well, if I can sell you any more on the German players, they have some experience playing at Lance in the local true. German league. They padded for a while with audience even. So I feel like maybe we have an edge. <laughs> well, and I think these players have shown already that they can handle that pressure, right? Yeah. You know, we've talked to so many pros across this weekend <laughs> and so many people were pointing out the fact that they, were, they found it really, really hard to focus and they found that pressure so much higher hearing the noise from the audience, hearing people behind them talking and discussing their plays. But these are the players that have succeeded, that have excelled in this environment, and that have really risen to the occasion. So I'm expecting them to be playing at their best. I think the other big thing to talk about here is the fact that we came off a fresh pass, right? And so, like you said, there are people learning what's going on, but we've seen now a ton of tournament play. Everyone's had a chance. Did the players go back and start studying again? Are there going to be some new tricks they pulled out? Did people learn maybe some of Broccoli's tricks like we were talking about? So what kind of play do we see today, and are there any major adjustments? Well, and it's so interesting, right? Because people have had different stylistic types of play. Broccoli, I think, you know, as far as his placements, he's averaging a 2.2, which is just ridiculous to get here. Crazy. So he has been statistically the most dominant player. He's playing really kind of uh, low econ, low spend early games. He's often starting out on loose streaks. He's often starting out behind on HP, but he's using that to slingshot himself forward at these opportune moments to really take over lobbies. And then you look at someone like Ashmu, who's been playing more heavily towards re-roll comps, you know, and playing towards this kind of different style than a lot of these other competitors. And I feel like the big storyline has to be that there are some players that lean towards similar uh, techniques here because double is very similar to broccoli in terms of play style with like going for the lost streak, finding hard steel, finding a low uh, cost boards, going for whatever the shop gives you, not investing gold into rolling at all for a very long time and it might clash. All right, I just got word that are ready. The countdown has begun. The players are loading in one more time. Las Vegas, are you ready? I think they are. Let's get underway and load into game one of the final lobby here at the Team Fight Tactics Vegas Open. Again, we get to see the portal intro every time for the last day. That, uh, you know, can see what portal we're going to be playing, but that three, two, one, that countdown to get us going. One important thing, if you haven't tuned into our tournament yet, we are playing a different format than maybe the traditional type of TFT tournaments you're watching. We're playing checkmate. First, you need to get to 20 points, and after that, you can't win unless you get a first place. Exactly. Once you reach that 20 point mark, you put the lobby in check. You have to get that first place to be able to take it down. Uh, there is eight total games that could be the maximum. If no one actually gets that, then it will come down to the total average placement in this lobby. But we have seen some of the times this goes through really, really quick. At the last set championships, it actually only took four total games. Oh, yeah. That's right. the fastest possible that it could have been. I'm still not over it. Yeah, both of you were there casting yeah. it. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Here. Sometimes someone just goes Super Saiyan in the finals, and they're it just going to take it down. It could be. And uh, we're going to see what ends up happening. We're starting off here with Golden Finale. We're going to pause here very quickly just to make sure everything's okay to get things started. Uh, but one thing that we didn't bring up at the very beginning here that is a little bit on the table, the players teased it, and I'm glad that we have Manx here on the couch. It's for Europe versus for North America, excuse me, for EMEA yes. versus for North America. And even within EMEA, right, how many sub-regions divided? Germany able to actually show up and prove their dominance, even though France also had an all-star lineup as well. I mean, double is here, right? So, so let's not forget that. France is still showing up a little bit of an unfortunate lobby matchmaking, I would say both 
double and Canvas ending up in the same lobby, ending up tying. Canvas actually the one to break out double, save him from that unfortunate eighth place in that very last game. It was all, I think, very emotion filled for the players going into this. Zale, you've watched NA versus EMA robbery. <laughs> <laughs> A, a while, I would yeah, say. Yeah. Uh, what, when you see it um, on the stage here in CFD, what goes through your mind? I mean, I think there is just that regional pride, right? These are the people that you play against, play with and against all year long. And you want to show that you are the stronger region, that you are the better region. You know, it does become a really big source of pride that it's not just about you. It's about more than you. It's about your, your fellow competitors, the people that you've played with, the people that you practiced and prepared with. You want to represent them well and show that, hey, you know, we are the best. You may have not taken it down, but I did it for us. And North America, admittedly, we've talked a little trash towards the <laughs> EMA way. A little. A little bit, especially after we won the Monsters Attack Championship with Re Replay. Uh, but then in Rune Terror Force Championship, EMA struck back, went jung jungler, able to get that second place and get that slight little edge. Although I would argue that title was just capping everybody. Was it really the EMA win? I think that's where some uh... of that heated rivalry is starting to cook up a little bit. I feel like with Wet Jungler, yet another young German player coming up and taking a true. big, big title win. Hey. We are going to go back into the game here, though. You kind of do have to respect the EMA players coming in. So Portal, by the way, now that we're back in game, was uh, the, we're going to have a gold augment for our final augment. So this okay. is a pretty standard game. Players should be very comfortable in this situation, sort of knowing what they'll expect, knowing that there isn't going to be like a prismatic on 4-2 to throw everything off or anything like that. So now it's really just about finding that good start that you can have, what items you get, things like that. And I'm just so excited to see what kind of a game plan the different players are going to come in with. You know, are some of these players going to come out right out the gate, try to play really aggressive, look for those first place finishes? Are people going to try to feel out the lobby, see what the pace of the game is going to be, you know, look more for those top fours to try to stack up some points? I think that talking to a few of these players beforehand, there is a little bit of a trap of saying like, oh, I have to play for first to win. You have to get past that threshold first. And sometimes Absolutely. in TFT, as you know, more talk maybe has even designed <laughs> to talk about it, you can't really try to force things to happen, especially in Remix Mobile. It's very difficult to try to enforce your will upon certain situations. So I think sticking to the game plan is mostly on the player's mind. Let's see what happens in the 2 1 augment. Going to be Golden Augments coming out here to start us off. You already said it. We're going to have Golden Augments in the end as well. So good chances it will be Triple Golden Stationary Aww. coming in. I feel like these dummies are so popular for the Golden Augments. Banshees is really interesting. We are in what many people consider to be a melee four-cost meta where you try to play around Zed, Akali, Viego, etc. But Banshees is also a little bit on the weaker side early more. So what do you assess of the situation? Target dummy is good early, but what about this item? So I think to the point there, we saw on the board, he actually had 10 gold and no items, so he got a gold start as yeah. well. Oh, wow. So that's going to give him a situation where he can lost streak, like you said, not play to the strength of Banshees, but have that for later and play for one of those much stronger late game boards. I would expect a full lost streak. On the other side, though, oh, Kevin Parker, you know, okay. has... It's has gem. that gem, which is really nice. You get the economy going. It's also very powerful late game, you know, for that ascension proc essentially. And he did hit that Annie too naturally, and has already slammed the Shojin. So he's got quite a strong board here. True damage active as well, and he's going to be in a good spot to proc this gem each and every round in the early game. It's good, not quite perfect because as a target dummy, you still want it to absorb some of that damage. You actually don't want to put it in the back line, ideally because that might be something that can't tank. So, you know, very good scenario for him to be able to capitalize on that gold late game. Don't be surprised if he even uses some of this target dummy to actually not get a lot of gold value. Yeah, but I think the power of this one in particular is early on, the fights are so slow, you're almost guaranteed that drip economy. Exactly. And again, we've talked about this before, that like, even if the augment just said two gold per turn, that's already insanely powerful, let alone the damage, the extra health from the dummy. So that's just a lot of power from that augment on 2-1. And that's why I think it's it's so important that he, he kind of had a strong board there, right? Because if you end up with that gem, you have a really weak board, then it's a lot more difficult to actually be able to proc that consistently. So, yeah, you do lose out on the value of being able to actually put that in the front and have a tank, yeah, but uh, getting the good economy early on. But, of course, in those first stages, we're already seeing some of those items slammed. And I, as if I knew it, Kevin Parker and Zaza here, both of them already on a little bit of an AP trend with the Shojin, with the Archangels, getting that direction there. And I don't know if you count it, but we're at least on four stationary. Yeah, I was going to ask, who doesn't have <laughs> a stationary support augment to start things off at this point? Almost everyone's showing the entire suite of support items. 
Uh, Kevin Parker, wow, onto a two streak right away and still stack racking up that gold. Looks really, really powerful, but Sasa also recognizes the advantage of lose streak in this spot. Also, one thing to note, I noticed a lot of people not buying the early headliners more. What do you think about these kinds of strategies of being a little bit more patient about that stuff? Uh, again, I think the big thing here is if you recognize that your board has the potential to be very strong, great. Pick up that headliner, play around that. But if not, but not buying it is going to give you more options to find something like a heart steel that could be much more powerful and lost streak around it, right? We saw a lot of these stationary supports have a little bit of the weaker items that aren't as good early. Yeah. So that's saying, hey, it's time to just kind of lost streak, get our economy up. And look at the gold totals right now, right? We've already got three players at 20 at the bottom. They've got a very clear plan. It's time to strengthen up that economy, play for the late game. Absolutely. I do think it's, it's also taking a little bit of a page out of Rockley's book, right? Because this is something that he has been doing, you know, playing these weaker early games sometimes delaying the headliner, looking for these more powerful, higher cost headliners to be able to tech in later, and has really been able to make that work for him in the mid game. Oh, unfortunate. Uh, Humbug not able to get that extra kill. And, and it might seem like not that big of a deal. Oh, what, you know, one, two HP isn't really that big of a deal. These players truly push things to the limit. So want to kill as many units as possible. Interesting setup as well. I saw Samira on that board, but uh, Tom Kench that had bruisers the headline. Not exactly a situation. Plus, Humbug is loose streaking. Keep an eye out for Spatula that. Spatula in the carousel. Oh, okay. We have to talk about this. So first off, we have the four stationary supports. That's definitely something to talk about. But the other one here is Broccoli has the uh, the uh, twos augment, and this is something we've been talking about for a while. This augment in the data looks really bad. But we've seen it a couple times at this tournament. We saw it as he was prepping for this tournament that he knows how to play this augment in an insane way to where he actually even beat you, Froden, with nine Wait, true damage. Uh, so <laughs> this augment can do some pretty like, wild whoa, whoa, stuff. Whoa, whoa. He already whoa. fully forgot about it. Well, that's how you know he's an I insane player. Memory. You know he's able to take down Froden. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, actually. He was able to exec uh, execute a really good game plan with two healthy. And a lot of people look at this and say, hey, you can play it with maybe the KDA Spellweaver board. Right? You have Seraphine as a two-cost Spellweaver. You have Gragas. You want to play maybe some of the super fans. You have naturally a lot of low-cost units you can splash in. But Broccoli goes above that and says, I actually can find different ways that are even more unique, which I think was really special. Yesterday, he played a really cool Lulu game and stayed in all the way to the end of stage five, to which many people like Soju and all them were like, is this even good? I feel like I disagree, but he was getting results. Yeah, and speaking of results, this Senna, I mean, she's been at the forefront of this entire tournament, but with that augment, even more so something that Broccoli has been running a lot, and she is so, so good. If you can find that extra true damage, like you were alluding to, Mord, that might just be what you're gonna run in the long run here. Yeah, this, it's just this augment almost feels like his secret weapon, again, because yeah. we always talk about how a lot of these high-level players, they look at the stats and they're like, hey, that augment looks really bad in the data, but Broccoli has figured out multiple lines and ways to play it to the point where a lot of people just aren't expecting it. He gets those uncontested units and can play really well. We can see Malala sitting on a pair of MFs. And I always find this a really difficult situation, right? Because when you are early on the game, you find a pair like that. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a trap when you're sitting on it for too long, you're holding it, it can really grief your economy. So he's actually going to put both the MFs in and that's going to be the angle. He's going to sell off his head is, is two cost jinx. Yeah, jinx. so Malala has also told me that he's been focusing a lot on his uh, real estate job. And, you know, Malala comes in as a player that has historically actually underperformed the final lobby built with expectations. But he said, I'm just gonna stick to my game plan. Every single time where I'm expected to be a favorite, I, I joke. But every time that I've been not under pressure, where like expectations are off, I perform well. So I'm just gonna stick to my game plan. This force is under, under contested three cost, three will composition. Maybe it leans into that this game. We'll see. Yeah, the other big thing to call out here in our, our lobbies normally, we do have Humbug on that five loss streak, but nobody's on a win streak, right? Normally we see someone at like 100 health doing okay, but not yeah. this time. Everyone has managed to lose Close. at least one fight. So that's going to lower the total economy and keep the pressure off. We see Ashwin on that four win streak playing around those static shivs, but he wasn't able to win his first fight. And there's a lot of hopes and dreams from North America on DSG Broccoli. He's actually one of the biggest beneficiaries of this because it's when you're in the very top and streaking, you feel good. If you're on the very bottom, you miss your HP, but you still feel good about the amount of gold you have. It's the people in the middle who are win-loss, win-loss. You saw Broccoli, 16 gold. Everyone else, like, you know, 30 plus. He's actually the biggest beneficiary because no one is climbing that much farther ahead of him. Yeah, for sure. You've got to, like I said, it's always nice to be on one of those extremes. 
but if you're caught in the middle, you need something to really swing it your way. So we go into Krug, see what kind of items we can get, and this is gonna make a difference. Plus, we're looking at the board where we got the spatula off the carousel, right? And that spatula can make for some very powerful options. We've seen heart steal, we've seen true damage, we've seen KDA, okay. so we'll have to see what we can get. How are you feeling about the double status shift for Ashby, right? Like, how is this going to actually set up for his mid game? Because obviously it's extremely strong with the augment in the early stages, but, you know, a lot of the AP lines don't even really rely on Shred because of the value of Ziggs, and we've talked a lot about that. So this augment in particular is really good tempo. That flat damage from Static Shiv projected by the augment ends up being really good. It does usually fall off, but if again, if we're talking about this you know, checkmate format, if you come out of this game with a third or something like that, that's gonna be great. That's a great start to the day. And so I do like this play. As soon as he got it set up, my guess is he probably didn't have the Jinx 2 until 2-2, but as soon as he did, it's projected and he's on this four win streak. And you can see it kind of burned down the back line. The big like thing is- Lulu. Yeah. She's back. The Lulu's back for Broccoli. And this is a pretty impactful play. Ashman, you can see he's reacting because if he loses this, he loses his streak. And if Brock is able to get oh, the advantage, that could be a big time loss. With he's Poppy early is actually a pretty decent tank. He's got it. He's this. got it. Yeah. And it looks like he's going to go Ashman's way. But you can see the emotions riding oh. onto the uh, onto Ashman's oh. face. It's oh. very, very close. Oh my gosh. Oh. Wait, hold on a second. Oh! oh. Holy oh. God. He said he had it. It looked really close It there. looked really dicey. Kaisa Woo! almost pulled it out there. That was wild. Man, and that keeps his five streak. That's absolutely massive. That's because huge. when you talk about you know committing to the status control augment, slamming a second static shift, you have got to be able to have tempo in the early game. You've got to be able to win streak because you are going to fall off, right? It limits a lot of your comp options going into the mid game, going into the late game. So you need to be playing with a massive HP advantage. Okay, teaming up. Interesting choice. And you got Aegis of the Legion. What's your assessment, Mord? Uh, Aegis of the Legion here, not too amazing. It's one of those, it's like, it's a little bit of extra power. It can start some fights. I think it'll help push the tempo early, though, with the Jinx, giving that extra attack speed so it'll help yeah. you. Shivs. Yeah, with the shivs should be good. The thing that I'm a little worried about, and this is what I was going to say, is that flat damage falls off as people get really high health totals. Yeah. And so the late game, that's where it really struggles. I mean, he's going to have so much attack speed on the Jinx. Obviously, he has rapid fire, and Jinx has high attack speed naturally. And then he has the Aegis as well. So you're getting so many more autos out to proc those static shivs, trying to get the most possible possible value from that augment. All right, looking at this board here, the Kaisa doing some good work. We talked about the Lulu. The Lulu's been pretty phenomenal. Uh, great for holding things down while the Kaisa can slowly take them down. That Lulu providing that extra CC that's just so valuable in slowing down the fight. There's one thing too also about Brock's positioning. He's putting Lulu in the back center. Actually, hold oh, that thought. Ash oh, lose the oh, stream. No. A devastating moment, double 61, ice cold. Yeah, yeah, that's healing warps, the power of that early on, and an Akali very early on, had the yeah. QSS slammed on that Akali, and you know, was able to get those resets and barely stay alive. So the lost streak there, really punishing for Ashman. Yeah, that's right. And Broccoli able to get back on track, but he's been win-loss, win-loss every game. Ooh, an interesting shop here for Noah with Thresh and Ari. So this setup is really funny, by the way. Sometimes you'll see this one. We have the stationary support, and then we have the crash test dummies. And they and work together. They work together. So what ah. you're going to see is the dummy in the back line now. Now you actually get the full value, right? Because you can Banshees the back line. The, ba the Banshees is going to give that extra attack speed. And then the dummy will jump forward, and you'll still get the full value. Yeah, and I think he's not the only one that shows that Aquant, if I saw correctly. There's one more player on the Crash Test Dummies coming through here on the other side. Double 61 does not have the extra stationary to get that extra support in, but it is nice <laughs> to see them all geek in. It's also worth noting, he slammed an 8-bit fast, That's right? right. So he's on 4-8-bit right now. Um, you know, while we haven't, I don't think, seen it at all this tournament, you know, 6-8-bit, it is more possible to cash out on this patch. still incredibly hard, obviously. You have to Very really, hard, really so. high roll. Mm -hmm. But if it happens in the finals, that would be insane, because it's basically an instant win if you can make it happen. Yeah, uh, we're on this patch where that high score got lowered down to 345,000. So as long as you can get that, it can be great. Uh, having it early is good. I found really the best way to do it is a quirky three, though. Yeah, and we're not seeing too. a quirky three. So it seems unlikely that we'll reach that point. There's a lot of players I think 4 8 bit is that awkward dead man zone. You don't really want 4, you want either 2 or 6. So we'll yeah. see if we actually go for that vertical or we splash it in. But if you're, if you're going to go 6, you need to have it on a headliner, right? And you're yeah. playing Corkin 2, so you need to be able to go. There's Board a spatula spats. available. Yeah, Another big reaction spats. from the crowd as that one came around. And Double is going to oh, get the okay. free pick here. Second.
second round in this carousel, but a Karthus open, you have the Zed here, a lot of good units on this carousel. Yeah, absolutely. And Humbug is on a full loss streak. He's yes. getting very low. He's sitting on this open spat right now. So we have to see, you know, when he's going to make the transition because he has really been getting hit hard and is going to have to try to stabilize his board here very soon. Yeah, Crown Guard even Shroud makes me think he wants to lean toward Pentakill, maybe that uh, a Viego and using maybe a Kali as well to potentially clean up, but he has a lot of options. There's a lot of times I also believe True Damage Emblem is also the strongest in the game currently. So I want to see what Humbug's got up his sleeve. Either way, I like his setup for an AD melee carry. Viego, Akali, Zed, and potentially some other surprises depending on what the headliners are offered. But he finished rolling. Is this good enough, more? Yeah, this board scares me a little bit. Doesn't really have the items. Has that even shroud that's not really helping out the Vex. This feels like really trying to stop the bleeding a little yep. bit. So pretty nervous from this spot. At least has the Akali to do some work, right? That's pretty yeah, good items on this Akali. One star board, though. If, if exactly. Only two stars is headliner. You know, he has no value from this spatula. If you lose from here, you know it, it's so rough. The that's one thing that is good though is that these are when players are weak. So exactly. The matchmaking is working out perfectly here for Humbug. One of the first players that actually does go level 7 here meets up with Casey Double, who's still sitting on his gold pod, hasn't really invested in the board just yet. So that just might be enough for now. One of the other things to talk about here is an interesting augment choice. Kevin Parker took Rich Get Richer which is not an augment we see a lot of at this high level competitive play. For a while, he was sitting on 70 gold. We see him at 60 gold right now, trying to take advantage of that extra interest that he could generate. Um, but again, it's just not an augment we see a lot of. We see him playing the headliner 10 in here, generally a weak board, but taking advantage again of that that gem to try to get that extra economy and take advantage of that. There's two situations. One, he recognized that he can greed because he took it two rounds ago, he lost two, but he said, hey, I'm healthy enough. I can go for a big level eight. Most players believe level eight is the, the golden area that you want to roll, get a big headliner. The other could be, you just didn't have that much better options and felt like, hey, I have to go for a big level eight roll down strategy because my other options are too weak. Now, another thing to talk about here, we're looking at Noel's board here, has the eight bit spat like we talked about. and. The other way you can often get that high score is if you end up in a situation where you've been win streaking for so long and then you end up a little weaker in the late game and the fights draw out because late game fights tend to have a lot of damage which will increase that score. And so the fact that he's on this win streak is going to be able to keep this. We could end up in a situation where he's the strongest player in the late game, falls off, generates those high scores, and maybe we see it. And I mean, that'd be crazy. Such, such a nice position when you can actually sit on this Corky too. You don't have to roll at all. Yeah. You can just use that to push yourself to the late game. You know, you can stay on that Corky for a long time if you can keep that win streak up. And we've seen it, you know, in some of these main stage lobbies, people still oh. playing Corky two as their carry going into stage five. So pay close attention to how Malala handles his level seven. He's gonna roll here. He has four copies of Misfortune. Misfortune is not a contested unit, so he can hit that headliner and potentially get online very quickly. But at the same time, the police holder knows best. He has two copies of Zed. So he's keeping his options open here, and he has two lines that he's primarily thinking about, either playing around that crowd diver Zed or playing around this misfortune to see what he does. Yeah, the Zed in particular, you gotta look at the items, but he does find an Edge of Night, which oh is my. really good. Wow! wow. Hold on, he one second. Now. He's got a three-star immediately. But, oh! oh, oh, oh wow! <laughs> Are you kidding me? Just hit, Froden! Just hit! You gotta wow. be less biased on the cast it. here! Wow! That, oh my goodness! You gotta that be is... lucky to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that was our wise stage advice. Wants to see if he can get better frontline. The only limiting factor is playing a one-star Lilia, one-star Echo. But hey, that's a misfortune three. Man, that, that's one of those moments that I want to see a heart rate monitor on him. Like, yeah, how much yeah, of that yeah, spike yeah, yeah, right? he saw? His face gave <laughs> nothing away. He is, he is <laughs> dead straight. Like, hey, I'm just a real estate reaction. developer, man. I'm just here to have some fun and make some yeah, friends. and this lobby is free real estate. And we were oh, talking about I like that. I like that. <laughs> I will Humbug say. Humbug in the position that we were mentioning before or has some oh, boards that right. you can face that are low, but now players are starting to invest. And Malala coming around with that massive upgrade of the MF3 has to her 26 HP already in 4-1. And an RE2 headliner. That is a strong board. Yeah, Ash is still healthy, but uh, really good for Malala. Last one on that. You got Jazz Misfortune, which is way superior to Big Shot Misfortune. That's what I was going to say. The, the fact that you got the Jazz there, yeah. that's going to allow you to hit that four Jazz more realistically. That's a pretty big spike. Jazz definitely falling off compared to last patch, 
but four Jazz can make some really strong boards still. Exactly, and I always feel like when I hit the big shot variants, it's it's so awkward oh. because you don't really, it's, it's difficult oh. to actually fit that four big shot. He's There's cooking. the Ezreal headliner, that's a really nice hit. Oh, interesting. I thought there was a possibility that we might put the 8-bit eight eight emblem bat onto on Ezreal because he capitalized off that. More, you're shaking your head, you disagree with that. Yeah, the problem is if you only have two 8-bit, it's not enough AD, it's not really worth the item slot. I see, I see. And so unless you're gonna keep that four 8-bit in, but that means you might be having to run weak units right like the okay. ribbon to keep that in so I, th I like this plan a lot and then if the score gets up there then you can switch it back so this is a this is a great that short term play it's interesting though because he's, he's not playing necessarily strongest board right like he actually you know puts in the heart steel you know trying to actually get three heart steel in there uh for a little while sure you get mosher from the set but like you could be playing a fresh on this board you yeah be playing yeah. something that's a little bit more valuable right now and that's a good point is though because 91 hp he's got a lot of room to work with he's exactly. also speaking so he could use his opportunity to maybe look at level nine which would be very early and this is a really big fight for what it's worth. We just saw Malala find that huge upgrade. Oh and gosh. now Noel is going up against him. Noel on eight wins, losing out here, starting to lose some of that HP. So that misfortune, if you looked at the augments, by the way, also had a uh, healing orb to keep yep. it alive and gifts of the fallen. So when it's the last one alive, its stats are going to be even higher than before. So that misfortune is going to be a crank by the end of those fights. So really good augment choice, knowing that that's going to be the Big time win for Broccoli. Again, he rolled to zero. It's a really big deal. He rolled to zero. And I think this is almost acknowledging Broccoli says, I can't win the game. I don't think I'm going to yeah. be able to get first place. Then probably maybe top two. But I'm going to try to play to preserve my HP and maybe bleed for a top three or four. So that way I can be in contention for checkmate. Yeah, I mean, the big thing is we look at the status of the lobby, right? We have Humbug right now, only okay. three gold, 13 health, kind of in a rough situation. But then we've got like KC Double, still on 50 gold, still comfortable, kind of pushing for that level eight a little bit later. Broccoli, like you said, zero gold, right? Noel already level eight, 30 gold. So we're starting to see that difference in the pacing. And so we might see some fights in health swing for now, but late game is going to be a big deal. Well, I think it, it's a really good point that you're making for them, right? Because you have to be so good at recognizing the spot that you're in, right? And playing for every single placement. You've seen so many lobbies decided by one, two points. You know, whether you're going to be able to move on, whether you're not. And in this final lobby, you've oh, got to be able no. to stick together everything that you possibly can. And oh, oh, how much damage is this? Oh, oh no! Four, three, you're dying. That is brutal for Humbug. Yeah, and that just goes to show that Blue Streak does have its risks. Yes, you could potentially make a big comeback, wow. you get Carousel priority, but you need to turn that around. And it did not look like Humbug was able to do that. Look at Malala, the absolute sigh of relief there, barely able to win another round. That MF3 is really powerful, but he's been scraping by in some of these. The healing orbs has been making such a difference in these fights. Yeah, I personally, we saw that MF yesterday as well. I'm not the biggest fan. I feel like she has fallen off since the last patch. I mean, she definitely has, but I feel like she's in a position where that's not necessarily the comp you want to run in in a lobby like this one it's more like a lobby or a board you run into to save yourself and i didn't feel like it was really necessary for a lot of we had so much to work with yeah. taking a look at uh kc double 61's board he has two damage emblem again considered to be one of the strongest hits caitlin which is actually a fantastic we, holder of this yeah we, we saw this a lot yesterday the true damage caitlin just uh, gets her to get through the front line does wow. massive damage to the back line the itemization is really good here i fully expect that to get moved over the only thing is we just need something like an infinity edge to make sure we hit those, that spell to really crit but otherwise we're hitting that six true damage this is a great board state to be in no execution or replacement for a colleague, so kind of awkward, but you can put this Nash to temporarily. This Nash feels a little awkward. Clearly, we played around center early to try to get a lot of DPS to preserve HP, but did we preserve HP? We're at 28, and we don't have much HP left to lose. Yeah, it's definitely not ideal, but at least you can put it on the center in the late game to give her that bling bonus, be some extra supporting oh, no. damage. It's not ideal. Goes not up against enough. this MF3, though, and the, uh, the fact that we didn't move that emblem puts him in such a bad state here. I mean, honestly, Malala hitting that really early MF3 has really kind of ramped up the pace of the lobby. Yeah, yes, there were yes. so many people that were on blue streaks and were sitting on low health, and then you rolled a zero, and you were depending on your ability to stabilize, start winning some rounds, and rebuild that economy. But then you rotate into an MF3, and all of a sudden, you're on one life. This is what made the Vegas Open so particularly interesting, because 
people who play with other players who are willing to reroll at three costs, accelerate the tempo yeah. of the lobby, you're talking about Country Samir, you're talking about Misfortune, Jazz, Senna, etc. But then you play in lobbies like, wait, everyone in my lobby fast nine. That was crazy. It's because none of these people are open to the reroll. That's what happens if you hit MF3 really early. Zaza rolling down here, finding that Twist of Fate headliner, really good for him to make use of the items, trying to find a carry. Only problem I see here is the front line is a little bit meh. The front line is, but he, he does have that Parasonas. He already found the early Alawi, so he does have you know some strong units and some potential outs. I would say the front line is actually sneak deceptively strong because Alawi tentacles early on stage four can be really disruptive to single target things. Also, we're going up in depth double 61, who has this true damage gem finally converted, and now oh, oh. showing off uh, <laughs> why that power of that true damage can be really, really strong. The head shake from Kevin Parker, absolutely realizing what he's run onto here, but he still has a lot of gold to work with. And I think this goes to show you the power of units like Caitlyn, that she can go past frontline, which is why, yeah, that frontline is sneakily deceptive, but at the same time, Caitlyn jumps past and sometimes snipes those backline units. Yeah, for sure. Malala, turns out Misfortune 3 at 4-1, pretty good. Yep. On a five-round win streak now because of that. Noel's still really high up, though. And last we checked, he was already at the 150,000 mark as far as his high score. So there is that potential. If he can stay healthy, we might start to hit that really high score here. Looking at Kevin Parker's board, though, we've got that Ari with two items. Pretty solid stuff here. Yeah, he has, he has the gem, obviously. You know, has it in the back still, looking to actually proc for that ascension. And he's trying to go nine, right? You know, he's been putting his gold not in the rolling, into experience. He's still sitting on 50 gold. He has about 20 XP on the way to nine. And if you're looking at the bottom row there, I love this graphic so much. Both Noel and Ashman not really spending gold into yeah. the shop rerolls, preserving for as much as they can. And for what it's worth, they're second and third in the overall lobby standings for now. So that's really realizing what units you can play around and I believe it was uh, Casa earlier on the desk saying like oh you need to play like a ragtag team in the middle game. Huge uh, opportunity for Malala. Echo is a three cost but Mort's lying. He's actually like a five cost. <laughs> Upgrading this Echo in the mid game can be really tough and one of the hardest things to do and he stops here because he says I'm strong enough to, to stop here. What else am I going to roll for? I can probably go to nine. Well the big thing for him is like I said we've got that jazz right? So every level up is a new trait or two that you're activating. If he can level up one more time and find that Lucian, that's going to be a very powerful 61. The yeah. pathing from the Akali was a little bit unfortunate. Had to do the rock round, didn't really get to fight right away. But maybe for the Caitlyn, this is actually not too bad. Yeah. He's had a lot of good shots in the okay. backline there. Double did win the previous round, so is going to continue that and preserve as much as he can claw space for space. Are you kidding me? I, Kali 2 with that setup, having Asterix as well as the Edge of Night and the Quicksilver, so nothing can really lock her down. And then Caitlyn damaging the back, scaling with 8 bit. Uh, Double 61 looks primed to charge for that top four, even with 15 HP. All right, we're level nine here. We've got a big roll down. We've sold, or we're, keep, we're keeping the headliner Ari for now, just trying to get some powerful units. That's something that we saw a lot of players yesterday kind of get baited by, is like sell that four cost headliner, try to yeah. find a five cost. But we're not falling for that here, right? We're just playing strong units. We hit the blitz too, try to play something like that. We've got this thresh. Honestly though, not really finding what it, he was looking for, it looks like. Yeah, I think the big target has to be the Kiana that you're running a pair of. Everybody is kind of aware that Kiana is a very oh. strong legendary for what it's worth. Sure too. So that not coming online for Kevin is quite unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. We can see the transition made by the 8 bit player. You know, has the six now. Malala, you know, has dropped the streak. Let's see if he's going to have enough to push through. But it doesn't look like it's even going to be close here. Kevin Parker has just gotten so strong at this point. And this is a big win and a big matchup because, again, Malala is conserving his strength. He recognizes he's not the strongest in the lobby, but he also has nothing to roll for our deed. So this is an awkward phase for him. Kevin is going to match up. That's a lot of legendaries oh in the shop. But it isn't the one he was looking That's for. He has the Maui pair, he has the Kiana pair, and then now he has one Yorick and one Zix. Gives you a pretty big outs though, Yorick right? Here. Like you, you have a number okay. of Okay, oh there we go. God. That's okay. what he wanted. That's a lock, I think. <laughs> Or do you even just commit to him buy it now? It depends on his HP state. 27 is that danger zone more? Like, are you are you selling to buy this or are you asking to hope? I think at this point, you just take the round, you lock it in, it's okay. fine. He does sell, sells one, gets the Kiana. The Kiana can be pretty important here if she gets that first cast. Okay. So that makes a big difference here. And we watch this Kiana as she casts for the first time, generating that extra value, copying those items. Really powerful here. Unfortunately, it goes down quicker before she can generate any extra. And so now it's coming down to Ari versus Twisted Fate. And Ari just really struggling to get through this poppy. Finally gets through the Ascension procs. 
and it should be okay. Lucian trying to sneak oh. a few shots in, but Ari should be able to seal this. Just need a big okay. cast, and there it is. Woo. That was close. Yeah, I mean, Ari does start to struggle a little bit in these late game boards. Not a lot of AoE to push through, but still, you know, so much time bought. The big gem procs. Who gets a Sona? The Sona could be a huge thing for a lot of these players. Ashman is looking for it. Sasa immediately beelined. He's not gonna let that one go. The, the big talking point right now is how close this lobby's gotten, right? Yes. The health, like, we still have seven players alive on 5-4, which doesn't happen that often. Everyone's between that, like, 40 to 15. I don't think even double is on one life yet. Is he's, that, a, he's streaking on 15, 15 HP, I believe. Yeah. Is that a Sona 2 for Sasa? Because he has one on board, right? So I don't, we don't know if he has one on his bench. I'm not sure. It could be, but the difficulty of Sona is you need items for yeah, her. You just have Sona blade. with no... Oh, he has a Wraith Blade. That's Kevin. That's so Kevin, Kevin, I apologize. But we're going to need to check in with Zaza to see if that was the Zona 2 indeed or just the Zona up here. But we are at that point where players are looking for the legendaries. And here you see it. She's there, but no items. Ah, okay. So the ability to buff the attack speed uh, for Sona is really powerful with Twist of Fate. But yeah, no Shoujin, no range, no way to cast fast. So how good is this buff? Yeah, we talked about this yesterday, actually, and that oftentimes an item with Sona 2 is kind of just a waste of 10 gold. You are getting a little bit of extra attack speed with each auto she does, but watch, I, I'd almost be skeptical if she's even going to cast. The only thing is that I think Ash Moves Boy on the other side is lower power level already. We trade off a lot of that early game power. Now her HP is within threatening range, so it kind of depends on which switch to fake to go down first. That and it does not look like it's doing anything. Up. Is Sasa alive? And Sasa is down for the count. The open bracket hero, Ashmu, is charging back on the streak. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, right? We saw the, uh, unfortunately, the Sona didn't even cast, so it was far too late. Didn't really matter. Getting a look at this board here, playing around. We have the Sona, Emo Sona. This is really interesting. Emo Sona, she has such a high mana cost. The ability to lower that down and get even more rapid cast can be very great here. We've got that strong front line. And again, with He's too healthy. Emo. Yeah, he's on, he's on four emo, so it's actually going to make a pretty big difference oh. now. Actually changing it out, so he's going to be down to three, checking an EDM. So this is another use of flexibility of augment, saying, "Hey, look, this was good to get me here. I don't have to be beholden to always commit to two healthy value, and that's the mark of a seasoned player knowing when to commit and when to back off." And there's still a lot of upgrade potential if you're looking across the board specifically for the Zona, for the Ari. Now that Zaza's out, that has two Zonas, you're probably going to have a better chance to find them in the lobby oh or in gosh. the store. But on the other side is Noel, 14 HP, and he's fighting for his life here. Casey double and 15 has been streaking. Can Noel do the same thing? Can oh he no. preserve? Can he stay in? And the uh, answer is yes. That step up, the Ari targeted the wrong unit. Zig stayed alive barely. That was very, very close. And double lost. Oh, yeah. I mean, Broccoli's just, just lacking AoE damage, right? It's just so hard. He's playing against the Yorick 2 board. If your R gets stuck on ghouls, if your R gets stuck on tentacles and things like that, it wastes so much time. He doesn't have that damage to push through these weak units to get to the key ones. Alternatively, too, another way you can look at it is Broccoli's playing one-star Sona, one-star Ari, and he's <laughs> making it really work with a really awkward situation. So in some ways, how is this guy still at so much health growth as everybody else when they have crazy two-star five costs, and he's playing Ari 1? Yeah, it's pretty wild here. And again, looking at the health goals, right? Kevin Parker clearly looking like the strongest in the lobby, but we could have one of those situations where three players died this yeah. round. That's right. This that's is right. really wild here. Noel, Malala, double, all on basically one life. Ashmu could go down. It would have to be a really brutal loss. But 17 is not a lot of health to work with at this point. And there's a lot happening right now. Most of the players, except for Broccoli, going to nine, rolling down, finding those upgrades. We just saw it happen for Malala here as well with finding that. Nico is going to help in the front line to protect that misfortune just a little bit more. Is going to get actually not two terrible items here. Warmogs could be pretty good for the Guardian value on Nico install for that misfortune, but he does not have Rage play, which is often sometimes awakened to ramp up that misfortune with attack speed as we see what potentially could be multiple eliminations here. It could be, and I hope it is not. Casey double on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, we're seeing Noel versus Malala. Malala could take one more loss, but I don't think that that would knock him out. Man, double on the right-hand side, the Jin is powering through. That's so much damage. Oh and on the left-hand side, Noel's board is collapsing onto the Misfortune slowly, but surely they're making their way through that front line that we just oh, saw, and it is enough. Oof. After that Misfortune on 4-1 to be knocked out and probably what looks like either a fifth or a sixth place, 
going to be a little rough here. The other thing to call out is that Double did sell the Caitlyn and was able to find a Jin. A little bit of a bailout there, but My definitely gosh. a big upgrade here. And now we have this true damage Jin. And sure enough, we see the scoreboard. Yeah, the Malala, Malala in sixth place oh despite gosh. an MF3 on 4-1. That's a like, hey, maybe I don't ever play an F again. That's a yeah. really, you know, like that's how players react in that situation. But you're up against this Jin. It's a, uh, it's pretty scary. You get a super early MF3. You get to four Jazz. You get to level nine, and you're out at six. That is a, a rough feeling on that and, one. And it's hard because look at the lobby, right? Like everyone's yeah. on one life right now. It's not like you were far off, but sometimes that's just the way it comes. That's the difference at this highest level, though. People are so good at preserving HP. You know, one mistake, one bad round can be the difference between a sixth and a third. This Jin trying to work on to Yorick. If Yorick goes down early, that's a little bit of a TPS down. But the front line is all in on whether that's Kali can survive. Boom. Jin! Boom. Shot after shot! Boom. Wow! Oh. KC Double has done it and squeezes out of top four. Ash will get the win as well. Man, the healing orbs made such a crazy difference there. I think with the Akali in the front line, that's just getting healed up by this Jin, killing units off one after another, after another, after another, barely sustaining that front line unit to keep the Jin alive. And now we have our top four. I'm gloating. There's three EMEA players in the top four. <laughs> Look at Ashman, man. This guy is so expressive. You know, when he's stressed out, <laughs> when he's happy, when he's frustrated, the um, the range of emotions that are going through his mind right now is just crazy. And, and you can really thank that little buddy. That 4 2 augment has really carried That's the best augment you can play for Swiss Bay, but now he's going up against another raid boss. It's Noel's headliner, Yorick. I love that you called it a raid boss because this is definitely a board that is empowered by that 8 bit. Everything is now coming through. You can see the Lucian in the backline is not upgraded just yet, but it has been serving well enough. Poppy oh. fights that backline, gets the hammer time off, and she will make her way through the backline. Yeah. That is it! Knocks out Noel. Look at the pop off there from Ashmu in the player cam. He's going crazy, pumped up in this one. We talked about the double shift slam. The Shiv augment, how this was going to potentially fall off, how it wasn't going to be, you know, something that could actually cap out and win the game. He's kind of proven us wrong. He's level nine, he's streaking, and he is looking like he is in such a good position. A, a big thing here was the Aegis, right? The way he allowed it to position, get that extra attack speed with the Disco, allowing that to ramp up. And then the other thing is, look at this front line, right? Look at these items. These are amazing items, just a ton of front line to get through, and that's going to allow the Twisted Fate to ramp up. And then Dazzler, right? Dazzler's another key ingredient here. Oh, Lowy too. too. Yeah, the Dazzler's really effective. And this is where Ziggs has like almost become underrated at certain points. Like he's not actually supposed to necessarily carry and shred and buff attack speed and provide a bunch of utility. I love this guy, man. Just watching he his is face so is fun so entertaining. <laughs> it, it, it is at the edge. He's going up against the ghost fight, so it's gonna be KC Devil trying to fight for his life to see if he can stay alive. Yeah, on the right-hand side, you're seeing Kevin Parker and Casey Double. Kevin on the opposite side, the Ari, is going to fight against Ashmu on the left side as well. But the big story has to be the Jin that we have been seeing from Double. Shot after shot, those violins are loading up, and he is making oh. way through this oh, board no, one by one, finding no, those targets, okay. eliminating them. Ashmu on the left-hand side, all two out, and that is oh a God, double that elimination kill. with Double taking the lobby. Double 61 with his back against the wall, able to do it again. How does Houdini do it? What a first game of this final lobby here at the TFT Vegas Open. That was incredible. I Such mean, a back and forth game. Double 61, you can see he's a little better. He's getting side <laughs> late. He knows how close that was because even when he was loose streaking, he lost one more time down to just 5 HP. A single misstep could have been the difference between 8th place and that first. I mean, the big pivotal moment there, selling that Caitlyn, finding the Jin. Yeah. And we've talked about Jin before. He's a champion that you can't really play around. <laughs> <laughs> can't really play around him at like level seven or level eight. But when you get that front line, you get him going. And the other thing to call it is he was true damage. So yeah. every shot there, I don't care how tanky you are. You're dead, you're dead. And we just saw it rip through. That's just, you know, the Maestro Jin doing his thing. I mean, the Healing Arms is making such a difference in so many of these rounds. And I, I really think it's, it's so interesting seeing how these players are navigating some of these difficult decision trees, you know, when to actually pivot, when to go forward. It's it's such an unpredictable lobby, right? You know, if we pause when, when Malala hit that three star, you would never be thinking this guy's going to go out to six. It was crazy. And it just shows you the knowledge that these guys have to play for late game situations. Also, can we just sit back and acknowledge 
Jin won the lobby. More, how many times have you been told today, Jin might need buffs, he's the worst five cost, this guy's unclickable, I'm not putting him on my board. Oh, this guy has Jin, he loses. What's your response to that? Oh, I mean, this is exactly the situation where Jin is good. And I think a lot of people are, are kind of hoping every champion can be good in every situation, but selling it, getting it at that level nine cap forward, having that front line, and again, the true damage also just making a big difference here. So I think that's what a five cost is, right? Looking at our highlights here, I feel like that is something that Double excels at, to be honest with you. We did see him yesterday roll past a bunch of legendary headliners, one of them Jin. And people were saying, you know, Jin is not that great, so it's, a, it's, it's logical that he rolled past it. But clearly, it is about recognizing your spot and being able to capitalize on that, seeing when that Jin headliner will actually do the job and shoot down your enemies. And let's talk a little bit about also how some people were able to squeeze out places. We talked about how Brocky's spot was really bad. And I do want to say that a fifth there actually is it's not the best, but it still feels okay for stopping the position. And also Kevin Parker, it also feels like a little bit of a gut punch. He was the first at nine. He rolled a ton and he was able to stabilize, but barely losing out to a cat down double 61 board, which came down to one unit. That's got to sting a little bit. I, I do think it, you know, it's a good point, you know, talking about Broccoli. Sometimes the most impressive games to me are watching when people are playing from a really tough spot, and instead of getting a 7th, instead of getting an 8th, you're able to <laughs> problem solve your way to a 5th, to a 6th, because those places can make all the difference later on. I want to look at what happened on the left here, because Ashimu, I kind of thought he was good, but it looked like he had trouble getting back to front line. Look how many units barely survived. And that was Kevin's board. That was Kevin's board, so Kevin actually was the second strongest player. Queued up in a double 61. Ashmu, I think the, the shift ball up actually just came back to bite him at the very end, lacking that extra oomph to get him over the hump. Yeah, so we get a look at these final boards here. KC double making that Jin work with the six crew damage. Again, we talked about the healing orbs. Ashmu playing around those shivs. And then the little buddies, right? The little buddies giving that twisted fate the extra oomph it needed to power through and get that second place. Kevin Parker making good use of that rich get richer, getting the economy there. And it was really close. This was an insanely close lobby, right? The fact the top six all so close, one life within each other. And it's one of the things with Rich Get Richer, you know, when you're playing those lines, it can get you to nine quickly. It can get you to that initial strong board, but if someone actually gets that board without it and they have a combat augment, that can be making the difference in a lot of these fights, right? Like, feeling orbs across this whole lobby felt like it was actually going crazy. <laughs> Also, All right. the fact that there were so many dummies, I feel like, in this entire lobby, so many targets to go through. Look at the, look at this graph, by the way. KT Double starts off with a good start. Lost Streak is in the bottom of the lobby for most of the game. Sixth, fifth, seventh, sixth. But then turns it around, finds that strong board, uses that true damage emblem, and seals it down to a first, so great play. And that's exactly the same thing we've seen from him for all of this tournament. That's exactly where he's comfortable, and I expect to see it from him again. But looking at Humbug's story, we know that that can be a dangerous line to tread. And, all right, but I mean, I'm looking at the high package. If you're an Ashimu spy, you represent the open bracket hero. It is a nerve-wracking moment, so we're gonna give him a second to rest. In the meantime, we got a special guest on the line. Let's head on over and find out who it is. I'm here on the Vegas open floor with Toast. The man behind this guy, the whole team coming into this event. Toast, any standout moments in this very first game? Well, uh, I love watching Ash Moose's reaction to all his gameplay. Like, you can really feel the roller coaster of emotions he's going through with each win, each loss. It's amazing to watch. Looking at Double 61, the winner of this first game, he was seventh place, looking like he was in a very dire position, somehow managed to pull it back. Uh, did you enjoy that performance from him as well? Yeah, it was crazy. Like, he was at one life, and then he was trying to run a, a Caitlyn with true damage and Shoujin, but just was not doing any damage. And then he hits the Jin Chosen, and he was able to clean it up, and it was really impressive. Coming into this day three, yet another new signing for your org, Broccoli joining the team. Uh, what was the idea behind that? Why Broccoli out of all players? Well, we just needed a player in the finals because uh, all of the DSG members, like half of us got wiped out day one, the other half got wiped out day two. We had nobody left and uh, we had to uh, pick up one more player and raid it. One of our players is rooming with him. So we uh, had him uh, talk up the org for us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Toast, for that little bit of extra insight. I hope you're enjoying the rest of today as well. Like the crowd is, we're going to go to a very short break. We'll be back with game two.
I'm not nervous at all. Like I can be very uh, grateful to made it to like the day three, and I'm just gonna like play my best, and whatever happens, happens. Round one is in the books as we march on to round number two here at the TMD Las Vegas Open final lobby. It's an all NA bias commentary couch. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way. Frodan in silver, Bryce in gold, Gangly represent the rodeo, and Mortdog, as always, <laughs> looking handsome. Welcome, boys, to the couch. Bryce. Welcome to the couch. Man. This is where we are. We're not co-streaming. I know. We're not co-streaming. <laughs> we're, on, we're on the main broadcast with live audience. This is my, I, I got to do a little bit of this earlier on, but there's just something special about seeing a final going to so many esports events and seeing it for TFT. I honestly never thought we would get here. This is just so beyond my wildest expectations. Your energy all weekend crowd has been amazing, and I know we'll keep it up. That's the fascinating part, though, right? You have this energy, this, this ambiance that's electric, that's so exciting, but the, the interesting thing about TFT is that because it's a community that was largely built grassroots from the ground up, so many of us and meeting during each COVID. other, and during COVID, yeah, it, it, it almost doesn't feel as grand to us here, right? It doesn't feel like we're above, it feels like we're in the crowd at the same time, right? There's less separation there. And so I think Spectator mode. It kind of does feel that way, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can't believe it's very surreal. I remember when we were just talking in Discord chats, but here we are, eight players remain. And after that, fireworks in game number one, if you missed it, double 61 with a come from behind. True damage, Jin 2 carry, a unit that people are really not having on their radar. What else does Houdini have up his sleeve? Yeah, it's a great question here. We'll have to wait and see. Looks like we're starting to get ready in the game. We've got that countdown, the three, two, one, as we head into the portal. And again, it's always interesting to see what portal are we gonna get? Is it something a little more standard? Uh, you know, is somebody gonna one guy us into Silver Symphony? Right now, it looks like three champions, definitely the favorite. Kevin Parker, though, is standing in that Silver Symphony, which one we've guy. seen. Oh, yeah. one guy, it is. Oh, Can't Kevin Parker. Is he giggling or is he just trolling? One time. Man. All right. Uh, it's just three champions. And honestly, I think three champions is a really consistent start. Bryce, why do so many players like three champion starts? I think a lot of the players want portals they feel like they have control over. And three champions start a little bit of extra econ. It creates more flexibility in the early game because it, you can much more consistently make 10 on 2 1 if you want to play towards Lost Streak. And it's not this like overwhelming swing that you might get off of for three costs, for example, where you could easily get like early heart steal online. I wanted to take a second to reflect on Ashley. We saw that second place come out of the last game and you saw the finish. He was not happy not with happy. the second, right? We talked about it at the top of the show. Ashmu is one of these players from North America who was devastated when he came out and said eight, play 15th, which is a fantastic result. But he's so confident that he can be the best, even with limited experience, that second place is just not enough for him. Ashmu also is admittedly Hardstock Diamond right now. He said that he tried climbing in set 10. He's hit Grand Masters and Challengers before, but he said Remix Rumble might not be his set in terms of the beginning, but he looks pretty solid so far. He can keep it up. What's he upset about? Yeah, I think he's agonizing over what to really buy and whether or not he wants to actually prioritize making economy. Because Bryce said you can make gold on 2 1. In this portal specifically, you can also make gold as early as 1 3, depending on what ends up happening with your with your drops. Right, if you get some good drops, if you get a champion that can play around that well. That's the thing with the three champions, is you can get a lot of, you know, one cost uh, combinations that maybe strengthen your board, and that can tempt you out of that extra economy. Uh, Malala here has the Sentinel Lilia, which is a pretty decent start, although I think typically people prefer either the Superfan or the KDA to give them that little bit of extra oomph. Um, but overall, has those AP items, nothing too crazy going on. A lot of options on the bench, but otherwise should be a pretty standard start. All right, here comes a 2-1 Augments. When you're looking at these kinds of Augments on this portal, nothing really stands out. It seems like pretty generic. As you take a look at the screenshot and see if there's anything jumping out to us here, boys. Yeah, I mean, the big thing I have my eye on is how many of these players are going to be choosing Econ-oriented Augments and how many of them are going to go Combat on 2-1 because it helps dictate the flow of the lobby. There's a Portable Forge in the bottom right. They ended up with the Collector. That's a very right. good item as long as and you're strong. And on a Quirky. Yes, with a and Quirky. And an LW to slam. Exactly. That can be a lot of extra power, generate some gold, so that's a great start with that 8-bit. We see two players still kind of agonizing over their choices, trying to figure it out. Over here, we have the Caretaker's Augment here that's going to give four components as they hit level five, six, seven, and eight. Oh. So definitely stronger later, but right now that augment is essentially doing nothing. And so that puts you in a little bit of a weaker situation right now. Does reveal that game plan though. Probably not gonna reroll. It's very unlikely if you do, it 
be at that'd be, best. That'd be a questionable that'd choice. That'd be a questionable choice. <laughs> so we're at least committed there. Gold Collector with that last Whisper, as you were mentioning. Very, very powerful combination. People look at Samira. Country Samira is one of the primary holds of it. Are there any other ones that we're not thinking of that might be slightly off meta or just underplayed? I think just playing it early with this Corky like we've seen. We've seen Corky make it all the way to level 8. This is a great situation to be, go to 8. And then you can play it on something like that Caitlyn we've seen do really, really well. Ah, okay. These are great Caitlyn items. Um, you know, and then from there, end up in like a Jin situation. It's almost like a repeat of what we saw KT double play last game. I think that's probably your best path moving forward. Well, so it's flexible though, because the point Dan was making me is true bis bis Samira is the gold collector last one yep. for IE. So having two of the three of them on two one and getting to generate that econ could easily play for, towards that strategy. And Samira yeah. while it has felt weaker this patch. The gold collector version does not feel weaker. That unit pops off. Yeah, with Samira in particular, if you can get the country headliner, yep. that plus one country just really valuable. The headliner version has that extra crit, so definitely agree that is an option. Although playing reroll in this situation, there's always that risk that you don't hit. And do you want to, you know, sacrifice a game here when you're in this checkmate format? That's always the tough Maybe one. he just believes in you more, dog. He knows you have his back. <laughs> well, I remember even back in the end of day one, I believe it was, when we saw Flighty up on stage, he opted into playing these three roll comps from ahead, right? Playing around this Samira if you can build tempo in the early game. And it allows you to, even if you do not hit on the cadence that you want, you sustain enough HP that you buy yourself enough time to eventually cap out. Looking at the gold totals right now, again, we see kind of the story, right? Casey double 20 gold right now. Everyone else in the 10, Broccoli at 10, Noel. Oh. Noel's going to hit 20. Um, Zaza, though, that's the big one, right? With that collector, win streaking, and has that 10 gold. So pretty good situation for him right now. Interesting opportunity. We come at 2-3. This is a spot where people can usually rotate their headliners. You get offered once every four shops. You see that bottom right hex, in your, or bottom right window right there. You see Kaisa. This is pretty tempting if you're Broccoli. It is. He played around Kaisa Chosen in the mid-game last game. He's definitely thinking about it. He's played a lot to towards this KDA. He's been playing Super Fan a lot of his games. He's just been a much more flexible player than most of the field. I think what made Broccoli stand out so much is the way he's played around his Chosen. He's very rarely staying committed to one cost chosen for very long. He's leveled it up as the game has gone on, and he's by far the highest AVP in the tournament heading into today. Oh, don't look now. Double CC1 again on a lose streak, which is, you know, part of his comfort zone. This guy is very versatile, but once more, he's going to have to make a big come from behind play in stage three. You know, going into this tournament and throughout the weekend, Broccoli was actually one of the players in the field that was leaning very heavily into that lose early and kind of swing around 3-2. This game and last game, though, he has not been able to sustain that loss streak. So I'm not exactly sure how comfortable he is. And part of it is that he took Inspiring Epitaph, which I think most people understand is an incredibly powerful augment, but where it's weak is more is at the very beginning. Yeah, for sure, because every time a unit dies, you're passing on that shield, you're passing on that attack speed. There aren't a lot of units to die, yeah, it's not more. very powerful, but as it goes into the late game, that's where it gets pretty insane. As far as the augment choices go, I think the interesting ones to call out here are Noel taking, I believe, his three's company here, getting those four three costs, that's some yeah. extra econ, and then Kevin Parker taking trade sector. I think yeah. that's, one, that's one that generally is sort of just like baseline. It's very safe. It gives you some extra strength, but not really something you're looking to like cap out your board. There's no combat power, so pretty interesting choice there. Yeah, I think Tree Sector has been largely used for around two to three cost reroll because it's a smooth curve from two to stage three and maybe even early stage four. You can hit very early, but I am curious because Kevin Parker loves playing those big cat that boards and goes to the win. Also, Malala, in my opinion, has the most interesting one. He has escort level six. Quest. He goes to level six. Zaza goes level six. Oh. Two streakers. They don't hit each other. Oh, man. What a surprise that would be to be able to snag that win streak by going to six so early. Bebe approves. <laughs> Bebe definitely approves. You know, does not approve his broccoli. He's like, what, what, I, what did I do? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm trying to hang out with Earth Mage P over here. Why am I playing six units in stage two? <laughs> yeah. It does have a red buff slammed onto that Kaisa. So able to. Wait, wait, wait hold on a second. Hold Corky's talking the wrong units. And if Kaiser can get this Wait. kill before Corey cast again. Oh! oh, oh God. God. Bigger than you! A big <laughs> oh, loss oh, here for Sasha. Nice. How devastating is this price? Big loss does not quite cut it here. You look at Sasha's face. It is devastating to be able to be in a spot where you're committing so much economic resources only to maintain streak. The entire purpose of that is to maintain streak. And if you don't do it for all of stage two, your entire game is dropping multiple AVP. 
again. And then, and then Malala's just relaxed. He's like, wow, wow, what was going on over there? Everyone's like freaking out. I'm here just escort questing. And escort quest, the win streak is so huge, but the popularity is actually very low because you're only supposed to pick this augment if you think you can win streak, and Malala's doing exactly that. Yeah, for sure, and that's going to be a lot of extra econ. I have to call it the Kaisa, by the way. So instrumental in that fight. A lot yeah. of people kind of think Kaisa's kind of weak because she you know, can't really carry late game fights. But man, the ability to chunk out that damage and position in such a way that that Corky just got destroyed too soon. So. Also, Wait, red buff oh, is oh. broke. Uh, <laughs> oh, Garen, Garen is Garen. really strong front line of Kevin Gosh. Parker. Malala not Wait. actually going to maintain the win streak. Wait. No. The revenge? No. Oh, no. no. She doesn't move again. No, okay. Oh, OT timing. Oh. Is this that surprising? Honestly, when we came over to Malala's board and I was like, this board is war streaking? I mean, it's not bad. We saw him playing the Lilia Chosen earlier. He did get to upgrade to the Gnar, which is a big difference. Yeah, Gnar also with Headliner has a couple of uh, awkward moments where he actually immediately casts some transforms at the beginning of combat, but sometimes that ends up messing up your fight because yeah. he gets targeted super early and dies. There's actually a trick you can do. You can put him in the back row if you really want. And that way, he doesn't jump really immediately to the point's back line. I was about to say, you know who's in a great situation right now? Our first game winner, KT Double. <laughs> Full loss streak, yeah. a little low on health, 63 is not ideal, but had plenty of economy, has already, you know, leveled to 5, 53 gold here, so really good spot for him. I also want to call out the components here. You know, so much of Stage 3 tends to be played out front to back, and Double's got a lot of these defensive components, and, you know, some offensive stuff. Let's see if he's able oh, to get that the online. That glove is really big, because that opens up a world of possibilities, either through crits or armor reduction. We'll see what he does. Meanwhile, early Zed for Sasa. He's trying to pick himself up after that level six. But the good news is it doesn't look like it's all for naught. Usually when you level the six, you're around that 20, 25 gold range. So he's actually recovered nicely because of that gold collector. Yeah, we have a Zed on the board actually. So Zed using these items could use some healing, but Zed's a champion where again, melee combats get harder as the game goes on. There's a lot of CC, but the fact that he's got this early, this Zed should be able to output a lot of damage. And I like the positioning near the redemption on the Pantheon. That's going to provide a little bit of healing for the Zed. Right, a lot of people say, why not just play this Zack? It's also a four cost, it's EDM, it ties in with Zed. I feel like a lot of people say like, I can't just keep playing Zed, play Zack. Well, the, the problem is that EDM as a trait is not very good, and you don't really care about having it on Zed, and then Zack as a unit is also not very good, so he wants to put good on his board, so I agree with this decision. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Taking yeah. notes, we got red buff, EDM, so anything like else? Buff, red buff, <laughs> this is nerf, EDM. Got this got is it. good. All I have to do is just be on broadcast with more, and then I can affect the patch. Chat, you got anything you want to uh, take care of? Uh, or augments coming in, any recombobulator, bottom, bottom middle. The Humber is option lower. A lot of people love Cybernetic Bulk. I see several Wait, of those options. Casey Double. Oh, re Recombobulator. He, he already rerolled the other two. Oh, he did, he did take oh, it. He did. He did. Recombobulator. He has, he has a, Sona. a Sona. 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 He's a Sona. That is a but Sona on 3 2. What? It, it's not even that good. <laughs> oh, actually, I'm actually being dead serious, serious with guys. No it's ironically not that with good. No, with no Gintsu, it's no not Gintsu. that good. You can get a rod in two turns, but it's not actually going to do anything right now. Not right now. He doesn't have a forger, but soon. And also, soon. he's he's not trying to win, man. So he yep. actually has time. He's going to be first pick on Carousel, so it's not that good Yet. right now. Yep. Yes. We'll see what ends up happening in a little bit. Yeah. That being said, look at the quality. He's still got, he got heart steel in. Yeah, he recombobs into heart steel plus a Sona alongside. It, the most contested five cost unit in the yeah. game. I mean, things are looking up and, and bad for everybody else. He did use the reforger. He got a cloak, so definitely not what he was hoping for there. Yeah. He wanted to either be able to do a Shojin or a Rage Blade. Yeah, but again, the nice thing is he's already at the bottom of the lobby. Unless we get one of those crazy carousels that doesn't have a rod on it, that would kind of spell disaster here. But as long as that's not the case, he should be able to get his board stabilized. He just needs some front line. He needs to buy time for that Sona to cast that spell. Speaking of disaster, that was a really bad loss. You really? can't take five unit losses. Senna headliner for Kevin Parker. That's got to be dead. Yeah, all the way down at 40 HP on 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, we've seen him do that before, though. So I see, it feels like it's a position that he's very comfortable in. So I'm not too worried. He's going to have that Sona that's going to be able to cap out. He's got 60 gold. Like, he's very clearly being intentional about this, and I think this is great using the resources that he's got here, so not too worried. Ashmoo, by the way, Tiny Titans, 101 health. That's a great situation. And then Kevin Parker right now, our current win streaker. Malala, by the way, still playing around five super fan. I feel like this uh, this 
vertical trade is a little bit underrated, but it's also awkward to play sometimes. So what, in this situation, do you like the 5 Superfan more? I think the 5 Superfan is great here to make this Gnar a really big threat right now. It's definitely not something you're going to be sticking with long term, but this is a Gnar with a Radiant Steric that's going to be providing a lot of damage. Is struggling to get through this Pantheon, and the oh. Zed takes it down. It's a positioning error here from Malala, but he could have been positioned for someone else, so it might have been just unfortunate matchmaking. And the Zed is also printing gold. There's a lot of beef left. This fight could go to overtime, and we could theoretically kill this Zed in overtime. Oh, you're right. Diver Sun oh, comes right. out, but Great the Corky's still alive. There's Zed Shadow, and Zed's going to go down here. So it's just oh. going to be cannon versus oh my gosh. two units. Oh, not the dummy, not the dummy. Wait, not the dummy. Oh, oh. oh. okay. Oh, well, definitely good. Leveling to seven, two on three, three. I don't even yep. know if we talked about the, the, the in, in terms of the, his economy, that fight All right. had a lot of impact. By the Rod. way, Casey Double lost another 10 health. Rod? Is he taking Rod? Okay. okay, okay, okay. He's got the Rod here, but all the way down to 30, this is really the, low. The Rage Blade Sona gets the Sona online, but it doesn't get the board online necessarily. Right. Yeah. Sona is a War of Attrition style. You need to cast multiple times to get the Rage Blade value. You need frontline, you need units that are going to take advantage of it. I'm not and, seeing that on his board yet. And I think the big thing is we saw the gold count be very high. This is going to be a key turn for KC Double, right? Like you said, what does the board look like after this turn? That's going to be the big thing to watch. And so we're getting a glimpse of the board. Sure enough, levels to seven has 54 gold here. And so he's far, not he's rolling. rolling. This he's is... not rolling. Wow, this is a lot. Oh, of he is, he is. Okay, okay. <laughs> he paused for a second here. Probably collecting his thoughts. Mordekaiser is something you can play around at level seven. Reliable frontline. He already has Mordekaiser. He can slot one for one. And he wants to roll as little as he possibly can. That's right. The game plan is to get to level eight and build a board around a four cost chosen that can take advantage of this zone. I, I do like I picking the tank. The tank was a really good choice. The headliner Mordekaiser can do well. There's a crazy out here where you play around the Mordekaiser getting these kills and stacking up. That's the special ability of this headliner. Pretty unlikely, but again, at least now with the Sona and the tank, should be okay for a while. Yeah, I mean, Bryce talked about it before. It's a war of attrition that Double wants to play right now, right? So he needs to make sure that these fights are not ending immediately. Having that Mordekaiser's online, it's going to, it's going to give enough time for the entire board oh to gosh. have that attack keep up the damage on him. Find a win. That's huge. It's a big win. If you can two-streak, win the next fight, and end St. on a high note, that is his goal. Dude, Ashmu always popping off on camera. You love to see it. Ha being able to see these players' reactions in the moment has made this tournament so fun. And Kevin Parker on oh. the opposite oh. end. Oh. Nice oh. call, but he oh. reacted to that. <laughs> Speaking wow. of reactions. Early Kiana while playing Drew damage? Are you kidding me? So Kiana this early generating the extra item value, that's the kind of thing that can snowball you into a first place. And the fact that he's already win streaking, He's at 88 health on the six win streak. That is a massive pickup for you. You got to get an item component on it. So yep. unfortunately, we've got one turn where we're not going to be able to generate any items, but we're going to drop them in 4-1. And so should be in a good situation from here as long as he wins this fight. And we've seen headliner Senna just be so good. I can't imagine he loses yeah. this fight. Yeah, in this case also, she's just adding utility by stunning that Sam 1 remix, just keeps stalling out that tank and displacing it. Another loss for Humbug, who we haven't checked in yet, but Humbug's on that five loss, so it's gonna be a lot of people attempting a spike. Ashmoo trying to see if he can continue his win streak, and he is on a three streak, looks good for Ashmoo. Taking a look at Humbug, who's actually scouting uh, Noel versus that Malala board, and Malala is continuing to pile on that goal with the Esper quest. He is. He's in a really good spot. We see Humbug on the lower right, the opposite of a really good spot. He basically didn't play a board for this entire stage, and he lost infinite HP as a result. And this is part of the challenge, is that as the field has gone on and we're getting into more and more stacked lobbies, the pressure is increasing dramatically. So maybe he could have gotten away with this board in stage three in, on day one or a little bit on day two. But on the final lobby, you just have no shot. You cannot play this board. Yeah, I mean, even looking at Brock, there's so much throughout this tournament we've seen Brock be able to sacrifice that early game and find a really strong board that can streak, or at least relatively streak through stage three. Not the same position here, but does have a bit of gold, level seven, so definitely not a bad spot. Double right. one has gotten level eight, had the crowd diver yeah. said, and I think that's good enough for now. Again, you can't always just wait for the optimal, but how much more is he gonna roll? God. Frontline upgrades. Okay. I'm not entirely sure what he is rolling for the Ezreal 2, but with no items on it. Take it out, actually, in that case, uh -huh. and play around a Kali instead, and that's exactly what he's going for. 
Texting KDA, slight misposition, wanted the Lilia in. He's going up against Sasa. Let's see what happens. This, that person also has an Akali. I mean, this fight should be really easy. Sasa has an Akali 1. That's the primary care. We have a Zed 2, plus we have a Sona taking care of business. So I have to imagine that this Zed just alone would go infinite on this board. And you're seeing the ramping up with the Lulu and the Sona in the back line casting yet again. So this should be a pretty free fight win. Yeah. All right, and double is well on his way. And now we come to the 4-2 moment. Humbug, 71 gold. Big He's gold going out. for it. The only thing worth noting is double did lose on 3-6. Dropped all the way down to 20 health. Oh, no! The crits! The Infinity Edge on Broccoli ending Ashmore's streak. All right, final augment, gold augment. So at least nothing, you know, crazy curveballs here. We'll have to see what everyone decides to choose. Again, we saw a lot of things like healing orbs, martyr, stuff like that. Uh, stationary supports, pretty popular. Uh, Gifts of the Fallen, so we'll have to see what we're getting here. Little so. buddies. So this is a big play for level or four cost units here for Humbug, but somehow he's used all of his gold, and I'm, I'm seeing no upgrades. Literally the only upgrades besides his headliners that Yone do. Yeah, and this there's a Kali to if he can get there. Oh, oh, oh that is oh, a bad big hit. The only issue is his item components. He has nothing he really wants to make with this spatula. He has Jazz Emblem, KDA, and 8 bit. And I think he was looking for either Pentakill or True Damage yeah. in this spot. Bryce, can he pull himself out of this spot? Ah, it's tough. If he can hit the Akali 2 and then he can start to slam his items and he can go True Damage for that spat, I think that we might be cooking with gas. He's just slamming what he can. Supposed to be Claw's not that good in the meta right now. He's primarily AD. Okay. And this lobby's looking like an AD meta as well, or AD lobby as well. I think he has to go for Pentakill. He's holding a Kali pair. Yeah. That's hard. This playing around Viego. So he says, you know what? I don't have the flexibility of choosing lines. Didn't get that partial ascension. See if this Kali can work on the rest of the units. And this is good. Malala has lost all of his DPS. So a moment to breathe for Humbug. But he's got to continue his streak now that he snapped that loss. Humbug said going into today, one of the ways he wants to try and find an edge is by playing around some of these other vertical lines that Poppy trying to do enough does not look like if Broccoli takes the win there. But Humbug said he wants to try and find this edge. He says KDA verticals, Pentacle verticals, this is my comfort zone. Okay. It looks like it's probably the out he's looking to play with and going into the next carousel. Kevin Parker win streak did get snapped that fight, so we're losing the extra gold. Zaza right now on a five loss streak here. We're getting a look at Malala's board here. Has that Viego? We've seen Viego be a really good carry at this point in the game. One of the better four costs that you can hit if you have the right items. Now we're looking at Zaza's board here. Has that Blitzcrank, really good frontline. Found the Caitlyn too. Has those items that we were talking about earlier, right? Has the Last Whisper, the Collector. Those are going to go on there to help out a little bit. Crown Guard on Blitz. So good frontline, good backline. Should be a, a decent spot here. Goes up against Humbug, whose board still does not look that strong. Yeah, it's a cool board. He's it, playing Caitlyn, Blitzcrank within a KDA shot. What do you make of it, it's, Bryce? It's really good fundamental TFT, right? He, he's, he just knows he needs backline, and he needs frontline, and he's duct taping together whatever he can. It's a board that I worry about the scaling, especially from an itemization perspective. This Caitlyn DPS is going to be on the low end. And so I, I worry about how it's going to scale into the late game. But yeah. for now, it's a pretty good I mean, board. look they, at it. He's making it work. Yeah. There's also an opportunity we'll here. Whoa, and a oh, gold. It's really close. Depends if the call is going to execute this. Oh! Game. Caitlyn does fall there. Oh. And that's the problem with giving units like a Kali and that Poppy time to ramp. You can see why Little Buddies is also crucial for these boards. Yeah, Poppy, they're just able to heal up so much, casting repeatedly. The no anti-heal, you know, slowing it down. Getting a look at everyone's augments. We do see Noel with return on investment here. Okay, Open best spat humbug. for Humbug. Let's take the vest. Yeah. They've been rolling for days. Return on investment, synergy, right? Noel going for a big roll down on level A. Wound up playing around this Ezreal with the super fan core. The super fan core has become increasingly popular as the tournament has gone on. I think there were some players who came in who were not looking to play around that. Felt like it had been you know nerfed and was just not as good as it was on the first patch. <laughs> I think that's been proven wrong. I think Super Fan has been a really, really solid core. It just creates so much flexibility when you're playing around these four costs, being able to guarantee an item for whatever your headliner winds up being. Transition coming in here from Ash Moves. Gonna do a roll down. Okay, play around Super Fan, see what you can get for the four costs. So far, only seeing three costs, and not interested in playing any of them right now. Uh, Disco Blitzcrank, which is similar to what he played actually the previous game, and actually could be exactly what he's looking for adjacently to what he was initially rolling, because he played Twisted Fate to success, but where's the damage? Where's the DPS? Yeah, it feels like he's not quite out of the woods yet. Did spend a lot oh of good time to transition. not good. He's putting these items, probably just play them on Ari for now, and then eventually try and play around that TF. Okay, Ari won, but this is a Viego. Two's in the back line. 
And that is really bad news for Ash. We can look at his face. He knows his board is bad. His board is bad. <laughs> he's tunneled on the TF line, so he picks up the Chosen Blitzcrank, which is great, oh. but he's going to have a damage problem for the foreseeable future. He's so far away from getting a real board online. You can see no TF taken out of the pool there, so it makes sense to continue rolling for him to try and find a TF. That is the line he wants it to go down, but right now he <laughs> oh. just has no damage on his board. Humbug loses again, by the way. Casey double also, by the way, didn't get that 5-3 going. He lost one time in stage three when he snapped it. And now we're in a situation where HP is critical. Before you're preserving gold, you were focusing on your board, but now HP also becomes that resource you need to be thinking about. Yeah, it's just so unfortunate. Like you said, it feels like there's a little bit of tunnel vision going on here. It does find a Ziggs. You know, these items aren't the worst on Ziggs, but we've seen Ziggs just not be able to support it from a damage output, right? He's great utility. You put on that red buff, good stuff but it's still not enough to win fights. And so he really does need that Twisted Fate, activate that Dazzler, but need to hold the gold right now. And at least he's got health to work with, right? He's got 55 health, can go on a full loss streak into PVE and maybe come back after that. One thing I will say, you saw at the bottom of your screen, nine out of 10 Twisted Fates are in the pool. So uncontested, people are pulling the Akalis, you're seeing the Viego, you're seeing the Zed. So theoretically should be easier to hit that Twisted Fate. And that's why he's saving that gold biding his time. Meanwhile, a person who bided his time a lot can double win this fight. It's crucial that he loses no more fights going to stage five because he needs to have at least two lives going into it. Yeah, Double really understands how to play from Lost Streak on this patch. He, he's flexible in what four cost out he's playing around. The, the recombob into the Sona winds up being a big high because he's able to get this, the Wraith Blade online, so he trades some HP immediately. Okay, okay, Humbug, big win for him. Ash takes a loss. Yeah, so he double trades HP immediately, but then he gets a board that's online and is capable of playing for a win out. Let's see if he can go to level nine and cap out his board and win another lobby. Is there any possibility that Ashmu also just sells Blitzcrank and says, hey, I want to stay with the KD shell? Because the problem with Disco a lot of times is you have to go back for some of these low cost units like Nami, maybe you want to take in, and, and Gragas, but he only has a single copy of it. I, I think that would actually be correct. Like you said, you really, you've already got the echo with these tank items. What you don't need is a tank headliner. You need damage, right? Even if you have to play something a little more suboptimal, like a Karthus, which wouldn't be ideal, at least you'd have a way to kill units to get you to level nine. But playing around this Ari is just going to be a little tough. Playing around Ari in particular is Ashu's comfort zone too. This is a line that he's very comfortable playing in. So we'll see yeah. if he's going to play the TF or the Ari. Yeah, definitely looks like he wants. I mean, to he definitely wants to play TF. TF. Yeah, 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 he's yeah, been yeah. telegraphing that the whole time. The question is whether or not he can hit. He does. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. And, and this is favorable odds for him, right? Because he knows that it's sure. uncontested. But the, the speed of which he hit is really important because the thing about Twisted Fate historically has been, can you stop rolling on eight so you get access to level nine? Does end up upgrading that set as well, which could be an MVP. But here's the problem, no items on that Blitzcrank right now. Yeah, no items on the Blitzcrank and no Sona as well. I think that the big difference in the sports we've seen find success playing around this line has been and some Morello oh, to go with his red buff. Morello and red buff. You can see, I think he knows about the stage. Yeah, 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 he does. Morello is really good oh, on dear. Ziggs, but when you already have the red buff on TF and it's spreading, and you can see the reaction, oh, this is, you, it's just hard on his sleeve, man. You just feel for Ashmo. And you know that because he could have potentially made something like a redemption for the reinforce that front line. He also has a shift with that six. So there's a lot of redundancy that just lowers that power just a little bit everywhere, which makes him overall kind of a weaker player right now in the lobby. Here's the oh! poppy. Oh, and then that's a poppy off. Humbug needs to make this charge. Remember, he finished eighth place in that first round. All right, we're getting a look at Zaza's board, who has that Caitlyn we talked about earlier. But, you know, traits wise, has the two rapid fire, has the blitzcrank. So plenty of front line. But it feels like anytime he runs into something like an Akali, it's going to be a very difficult matchup. And then the other thing is that Caitlyn can spread that damage, but she struggles with any super tanks. We saw her lose to a Poppy, right? Like that Pentakill Poppy. So any of those matchups could be bad. Feels like she needs at least one more carry to help her out. Or better items. I mean, she's just not going to put out the DPS with yeah. this. This is this is a duct tape board. It was good fundamental TV. TFT, but we talked about the problem with scaling, and we're seeing that problem yeah. come to fruition. I'm not surprised to see this board basically losing to anyone who actually has built a good board. Can he beat Kevin Parker, who's 50 gold going to level 9? Yeah, playing around Senna too is excellent. Demonstration knowledge from both ends. Whether or not we can kill the Akali quickly, that's the crux of the DPS alongside that Senna. Our front line is falling, and Caitlyn's trying to target. She did get stunned temporarily. And Sasa does oh, barely get a win. Oh, oh, oh. 
but again, he's playing against someone who's greeting for their level nine. So this win is a it's, little bit. It's a little suspect, but hey, at this point, I think Sasa says, I'm not gonna top four, maybe. I'm trying to play for placements. For sure. And I think he's demonstrating the vast knowledge of the patch. I think he's playing around a lot of underplayed units. He's playing on Caitlyn. He has Kane on the board. No Disco Blitzcrank. I like what I'm seeing here, and I wouldn't be surprised that even if Sasa takes another bot four here, they can make a charge later in the day. On the other side, Humbug falls to three HP, so this is going to be a very important fight for both Zaza and Humbug. We'll see who they match into. And that's going to be Brock on the other side, who's very healthy, but it's only 10 gold. He rolled a lot. He's an RE2. He's an RE2. Dude, He's got Sona. Zach. So we're going to get a split screen and look at both fights. We have the Caitlyn board on the low left-hand corner of the screen going up against Broccoli's Ari. The Ari DPS is going to be bigger, but there's a lot of front line that that Ari is going to have to get through. Meanwhile, on the right side, we've got that Pentacle Poppy popping off, getting cc a little bit, getting kicked around. But it's going to be Poppy versus the world on the lower right. It's going to be oh, the Ari's coming down. Oh, the... And Sasa taking big damage. If he loses here to Broccoli, so he could be out. And Sasa's eliminated. Wow. Meanwhile, Poppy in the corner is actually beneficial for her, so you can't get back to the surface <laughs> the area. Yeah, they can't get damage. What is happening? happening? Well, he does want it. 1,000 HP for this Poppy to shoot through. Can she Oh do my it? god! <laughs> it's, time. it's like the 500. Do it, no. Poppy! No! <laughs> oh! My god. More plot armor than Faker on that board. What was going on? Listen. We saw it in the 300. If you get in a choke point, maybe you can make the magic happen, but just too much <laughs> HP to get through. A Poppy gets overwhelmed oh. in the end, and it's an eighth place down there. We have them both, but it looks like Humbug goes back to back. I think Humbug's blue streak uh, style needs to be evaluated when players like Double Sixty One, who are trying to also undercut him in that spot, it's just not working out for him you, so far. You just can't play the, the mid game into late game that way. Like Double has a very clear plan of action when he's playing from behind. How he's going to turn his game around. He knows how to get stable, get to level eight, then get to level nine and cap out his boards. Humbug created a lot of HP in stage three, what, in what felt like for nothing. It didn't really set him yes. up for success later in the game. And and his, and his gamble, right? Actually, even paid off. Got the pentakill online, but just like. Nothing ended up coming to fruition. We'll see if he's able to recover. This is checkmate. We can always come back, live to fight for another round. In the meantime, Kevin Parker has made it to nine. He is a strong level nine player. What do we make of this board? Mort, Mort he's still carrying Senna two. Yeah, again, Senna two, but you've got that true damage. You've got the Akali. We've seen it throughout this tournament that true damage is starting to get figured out. Has been in a good spot. Noel, by the way, did get a true damage emblem right. off the carousel. Trying to recreate the Jin from last game. Unfortunately, it's a Jin one. Good itemization otherwise. But this Akali just tearing up the back line. Jin's trying. He's ramped up, but it's not quite enough. Oh, no. And it turns out this is why players say Jin needs the buff, right? Jin one couldn't win the fight, <laughs> uh, even with the exact same items. And we're seeing on this board here the Zed trying to hang on against this champion here. It's going to be able to get through it here. That is going to be a win. Can't get through. And so we did lose another player. Ouch. So that Jin board. Jin is maybe the highest cap board in the game, but you need yep. infinite frontline to actually get there. And that's the big difference in why we saw a double find success. It wasn't just about Gen 2, Gen 1. I actually don't think Gen 2 would have been the difference in that fight. No, it I... could have been like anything, really. If you look at Double 61's board, it was very expertly crafted for that Gen last game. But also, it goes to show you, you just can't copy the best and expect <laughs> it to work. TFT is a game of decisions, but that's also a game of context. Yep. And when you're able to actually bring that context to the forefront, like Double did last game, you get it first, you try to impersonate it, maybe you end up bot four if it isn't your way. Yeah, I mean, it's a game of win condition, right? Every board has a set of things that can happen that will enable you to win. The problem is, even if you have the strongest unit by the numbers, it's not gonna do it if you don't have the proper condition set up around it. Yeah, who's gonna die with 60 gold? Oh, this is terrible oh, feeling. Man. You're trying to go to nine. Is and Ashmo takes the fifth, but hey, fifth is still a good enough point to get there. And with his second last game, puts him in that top half of the points. That's bad board strength evaluation. He thought he yeah. could go nine in that situation instead of rolling and trying to eke out more placements. But he takes a bad, he takes a really bad loss to someone who's still carrying a setup. And there's good fists. Like we thought maybe Broccoli had, kind of was able to squeeze out. And those are, those are some bad fists. And I think Ash was probably like, that was a bad fist. Yeah. So big stories here right now. KC Double been at 20 health since 3-6. 10 game win streak was able to snap the okay. win streak from Broccoli here. Can't. <laughs> Can you he... repeat the match? This guy loves Jin. I mean, I get it, man. So that Concerto in D minor is lit. It is. <laughs> I will say that in this situation, I would, I mean, I guess you have to. You're so low on gold. But but the reality is if you get manage if he gets blue buff or Shoujin, he's double winning this game. And so right. for him, if you, if you get this and see if it's a mana item, then buy the Jin. 
Yeah, that's the thing. Without that Shoujin, it's really hard. You know, like I said, Shoujin or blue buff, but otherwise, right now, I think the other thing is he's really counting on this Akali and Kiana to do a lot of the work, and Jin's just support from this position, so it's almost a different way to utilize it. Doesn't ah. find the mana item here, unfortunately, but can play the Gunblade. That's an option here to support and keep those people alive. Is instead going to move the Thieves Gloves over, put okay. extra items on the Jin here. Whoa! I like this. this is Ah, oh, man, getting attack speed and other variations here and see if he can make it work. Let's see if Double 61 can turn around. Is Jin truly the answer? Jin going up on the right side, and we got a left side fight with that Broccoli Ari. We've got Jin slowly ramping up his damage with no mana. Jin is just so, so slow. The cards of this cast coming out. There is the, the support Gosh. Jin, though. There's plenty of DPS what? on double side. Take care of business. Meanwhile, Broccoli's Ari is ramping up, and there's just no threat left on the other side. So it's going to be an easy fight win for Broccoli over Malala. Does NA suck? Why? This Jin unit is actually kind of good. Like, every, or maybe it's just double 61 dip. What's happening here, Mord? I mean, again, the fact that he has the attack speed items, right? We do talk about, like, you need Shojin to get that thing, but attack speed is just another form of that. And real, realistically, Jin is ending the fights, but it's really Akali yes. and Kiana. Akali and Kiana are carrying the fight early, getting the Jin to that point, right? The Kiana spreading that extra value from the tank items, Akali vamping up off the damage she's doing, and the fact, again, it's true damage, which means you can't stop it. Two players remaining in the top three, Kevin Parker and KG Double, they make their return. It's not Ashbu, it is Broccoli, and Broccoli, the North American hope, trying to get up the right target that, uh, that Ari could potentially work on those carries, Bryce. Yeah, the, the Ari is going to be on the right side, it's going to get onto this poly really good, and Ari's one of the only units in the game that can deal with this because it's actual single target oh, no. DPS, but it's getting overrun right now. There's just too much on the other side here from this true damage board, and Kevin Parker choosing not to sell his Senna at level 9, going with two cost carry, but it's going to be Senna versus the world. There's very little... Okay. Okay. But it's enough to take care of business. Big fight win. All right, I, Senna is great. I love her. She's fantastic. Probably going to uh, be tweaked later on, but I mean, you're <laughs> I'm still playing. Oh, Senna is... 2 and 6-3. I was about to say, this is news to me. Interesting. All right, I have to check the patch notes. Like, 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 true true damage, damage. When you have true damage emblem and you can play around another carry using true damage emblem, I can see it. But when you get to this spot, I feel like dropping down for true damage is actually not that big of a deal. Let's be reasonable, man. This is Senna 2 in stage 6. Uh, this is a, a tier 2 unit versus tier 4s and 5s. I'm not entirely sold, but maybe I... Kevin Park says, I'm just playing for a second. I think the big thing is sometimes you play your headliners for the traits, right? And that's what matters. You have other carries. You've got these Akali. If anything, it's these Akali's doing well. We're getting into this fight here. And again, watch the Akali healing back up with that Omni Vamp from the Blink bonus. It's already almost back up to full. Oh, that Edge of Night drops the aggro. And Jin. now Jin. Oh the my Jin. god. Snipes the carry. Can you get more get there. No. They have to there. walk. They're so far <laughs> away. No one is getting the oh. Man, that was so close, and that's the no oh. mana Jin. Jin, it just took too long to ramp up and get the DPS online. The positioning is really clever. Look how he positions away Great. from the Jin. Everyone has to walk over after the Edge of Night drops the aggression. Very clever board, and you can see why Double 61 is comfortable playing those items. It, it's fascinating to see, obviously, Casey Double, one of the most decorated, actually, at this point in time, maybe just the most decorated player in TFT world right, wide. I mean, this guy is the original world champion, two time uh, world attender. To see him come out to Vegas, make such a, oh, excuse me, three time world attender, to see him come out onto Vegas and make day three and put out such an incredible performance, it's great to see. This Archangel, by the way, is a massive power boost to this board. We've yeah. seen the frontline survive for a bit, but when that Sona casts with that extra AP, that is just going to be so much damage now that the Sona is providing to the team, that extra attack speed. So this is just a very tough board for anyone to deal with. And I think Double is benefiting dramatically from the fact that there's a lower top end lobby because his front line is not that good and would get rolled over by a true five cost carry situation. But because he's going up against Broccoli on the Ari carry, he's going up against Kevin Parker on the Senna carry. There's plenty of time. And as this fight is ramping up, you see that nice. Jin is going to take big damage in the back Jin. right. It looks like Jin is going to be overwhelmed. The Edge of Night does proc, but it's staying oh. alive. So close. That's Barely surviving. You talk about the single target damage that comes out of things like the Jin and the Ari, and it's fantastic at taking out Ooh. when you need only one unit on the other team to, to die. But when you have a multifaceted threat board, it becomes significantly more difficult for things like Jin and Ari to take it out. The biggest problem right now for Double 61 X actually is not Jin. I don't think Jin's the problem here. I think the front line is front line. so fragile. Yeah. No defensive items except for Dragon's Claw. I don't care what you say, Sunfire is not a defensive item. <laughs> and, some, and, and Spark is not, and Gargoyle is very low 
value. Unironically, just steadfast heart on account of one, and the Gargoyle, he might have to rely on the this fight. Yeah, and, the, and it's also not just the items, the units, right? He's not playing around any of the four and five cost main tanks that yeah. you see as Lilia 2 is our tank! Yeah, Lilia 2, we have an item on Lilia 2, unironically going into this fight. So the Jin is going to have to hold up. That front line is going to get started, started to get rolled over on the right side because the Sona carry is going to be ramping up. Meanwhile, on the left oh, side, the Sona is getting back into the corner. The, here comes the Akali. Oh, the is going to get onto the Ari. Can Ari take care of business? Yes! She does. Ari is just going to be dealing no with Sina. The Sena chilling. The Trinity is chilling. It's so close. Oh, oh my, my God! Goodness. Everyone's still alive. No one died. No one died. Not even close for Broccoli. He did not sweat that fight for a second. There's a lot of small things, too, about the positioning of Broccoli. He's letting you guys like Zach get Keanu because he knows he can bounce back into the fight and no fear of things like that. So there's a lot of nuance of positioning that's the slimmest of margins that's making the differences. Yeah, this is insane. 13-5-3. Again, still playing that Senna, but realistically, Senna just kind of providing those crates and a little extra support damage. But really, it's about that six true damage. The three pentakill also being a nice, massive spike here. And now we get this last item anvil. This item anvil could make all the difference, right? If you get the item you're looking for, pop off, you know, something else for this uh, Yorick, Yorick 2, yep. right? Gunblade Yorick 2 could be really good here. Shiana 2 would be huge. And if we can get it as well. If I can set the stage for these fights, so much of this is going to come down to position because getting this Kiana to farm tank items is going to be really important. Oh! oh for Kevin is going to be so big. And also, so many of these fights for Kevin have come down to whether or not he can get his Akali into the right position so he doesn't have to walk all the way across the map to deal with this Ari, to deal with this gen. That's a Kiana 2 as well. Just take a look. Broccoli Allowing is trying to. to survive. Going up against double 61, which means Kevin Parker does get the ghost. Is this a double kill or are we going to see a duel at the very end? And it'll come down to whether or not this Kiana can work onto the front line here for double 61. And the Ari can stay safe. Ari's trying to target every single tank one by one. And we're working through it, but that Dragon Jin claw. is starting to erupt, ramp up, and then a lot of damage. The front line has cracked for both sides. Kevin Parker is starting to crack, so he's Everything able to actually done. survive. Ari, and then Ari yeah. has the Jin. Oh, oh my god, god. god! Broccoli survives, and now we have a 1v1. Casey doubles Jin board goes down. Casey doubles Jin board. We saw him try to run back that first place for playing around Jin, but just not enough front line to get it done. Actually, a pretty good third for him, considering how rough his early game was. We have this final fight now. So much of this is going to come down to whether or not Kiana is going to be able to get onto a tank early and farm items. You see those front line tentacles from Broccoli. He knows what he has to do in this fight. Can he execute? Yeah, like you said, using the tentacles to buy the time as we head into this final fight. Ari versus the true damage. Can that Ari get on the Akali and make all the difference? Once more to the corner, moves back to Zack and trying to draw that aggression. And that is the Kiana 2 trying to work onto the front line again. Can we actually get some items for our units? And how much damage can this Ari do? The Akali's getting focused down by the Ari. That's one tank down. And now we're working on the rest Kiana. of the line. Dead. Kiana is dead as well. Broccoli charges the back line. We got it. Short the America strikes back. Broccoli in a ground two. The all in a death does it. Broccoli, the hero, the recent signing for TFT, putting all of the superstars of TFT on his back. He came in as the favorite for North America, the highest AVP in the tournament, and he showed you exactly why in game number two. When you look back in the story of TFT, right, there was once upon a time where Broccoli, you think set five, set six, was consistently in this top 10, top 15, and he didn't always, wasn't able to sustain that through some of the later sets. This time around, though, Broccoli is making a spot in set 10, showing why he deserves to be on that stage. At the same time, so much consistency coming up from Kevin Parker and Double 61. The road to checkmate victory is not paved with 1-1-1-1s one, 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 all the time. It's about whether or not you're consistently able to get to that top two, top three. Kevin Parker showing some excellent skills right now. I think that's one of the big stories here is the fact that, A, Broccoli kind of playing Ari just so much better than everybody else. We've seen Ari kind of do well in the mid game and then fall off, but Broccoli's been the one player that shows he can build boards around that and get it to the late game and play around that strength and then that positioning to take down that Akali quickly. But the other big thing is that we have a very top heavy, bottom heavy situation now after two games. Yeah, we take a look at some of the highlights. The fans are elated as they're trying to look and support their favorite players. But Bryce, when you look at it, 
we talk about uh, the the RE board from Broccoli, that comp also doesn't win very often. It's actually one of the lowest win rate comps we see in the entire, uh, entire field. I think part of the reason why it is because this was an overall lower top end lobby. We talked yeah. about double playing the fraudulent frontline version of Jin, which is not the conditions to find success with Jin. And we talked about Kevin Parker choosing to offer a safer placement, not opening up his chosen at level nine, even while rolling quite a bit of gold to continue to play around six two damage. I think that's a big part of the reason why Brock was ultimately able to get to level nine, build out his legendaries, and then win this lobby. A lot of this tournament, it felt like there's this tension between the players who want to cap out really high. We saw Ash move, for instance, right? He greeted his gold, ended up taking a fifth because he wanted to play for those higher placements. In doing so, though, puts himself at 11 points, no longer in contention to put himself in check, right? So there's this tension of being able to greed for those top end. You have to, you have to recognize the consequences that come of going for that fast nine. I mean, yeah. Broccoli, you can look at him too. He's usually actually very really calm. Yes. That's some of the most emotion I've ever seen him play TFD. He knew he did something good with his big new boss fan watching. And I was in deep with Broccoli's study group. It was Broccoli, Pitsy, and Ramblin heading into this event. And Broccoli came into this event chock full of confidence, which is not typical for him. Yeah, he actually he's going dead last. And yeah. he often does. Yeah, he does, <laughs> right? Because he's often not informed. He's a player who's who's top and his, his peak form is actually on par with the peak form of North America's best. He just doesn't get there that often. He's IRL dipped. It's hard for him to invest in TFT, but this was an event that he wanted to come in playing his best. He played 80 flex on the prior patch when it was not peak of the meta because he felt like that's where the meta was going to be going and he wanted the maximum possible reps on what he thought he would need to succeed in Vegas and it's showing off. <laughs> I think that's the way to play TFT, right? Is you're not necessarily playing the efficient LP game. If you're playing to learn the set, you're playing to understand the champions, their strengths, their weaknesses, their itemizations. And so far, that's what we're seeing is Broccoli basically putting on a clinic on how to play these champions using unique items, things like the, you know, the red buff, how to optimize around that and stuff like that. You can see in the graph here, the fact that he goes 655 five, five, and then slowly builds back up into that first place. The engineering student from Vancouver with limitless potential. If he has a read, he is sitting pretty. But let's take a look at the standings and see what's shaking out here, Gangly. AC double, Kevin Parker, the two DMEA representatives on top. Ashmo, Broccoli right behind them. Here's the nature of the checkmate format, right? You have this big lead that you can build, but the reality is players like Zaza and Humbug, they're not out of this. All of a sudden you go 8-8 eight, eight, or you go if you're at the top or you go 1-1 one, one if you're Humbug and you have slingshotted yourself right back into contention to take a first place finish. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the fact that there's a top-heavy lobby means we have three players right now that could go into check next round. If any of them, you know, Broccoli needs a first, Parker second, the Casey double third. If any of that happens, we are in that check format, and then from there, things get a little crazy, so. All right, as we get ready for round number three, let's head over to Mace and Casanova and find out what's happening. All right. I'm in the field with Nix here, and as you can hear that crowd reaction, it's been amazing. We heard the DSG chant at the end with Broccoli finding the win, but Nix, you were wandering around throughout the entire game. What are some of the things you saw in the crowd, some of that energy that you were feeling? You know, I feel like this event is so, so special because everybody that is here is here because of TFT. And you get so many big events where players are just you know, there and then there's a big crowd at like game conventions, but everybody that is here is here because they care about TFT. And it's been so amazing to see those small little moments every time something exciting happens in the game and the whole crowd goes like, whoa, it's so cool. And the games have really been delivering, right? We had Kevin Parker hit that stage three Kiana and then execute on that to make such a strong board. And the fact that Broccoli was able to overcome playing his style, playing around the four cost that we've talked about instead and get a first when Kevin was playing such a beautiful game is incredible to see. So both those players, threats to move towards check. Absolutely. I mean, of course, Yumi is still on top, you know, but, <laughs> okay. but we have to recognize the wall of NA is right behind them. It is so, so close and only have one more thing, which is a little bit odd, but we're going to try it. I heard Noelle's wife is here watching, cheering him on, and we would love to talk to her. So if she sees this, come and find <laughs> us. I'm trying. <laughs> All right, well, with that, we are going to get things ready for the next game, so we're going to head to a break. When we come back, we'll have game number three of the finals.
Honestly, day one was the least stressful for me because uh, I didn't expect anything. But as soon as like uh, the rounds went on and everything, my heart started racing, you know, my head started clouding. I couldn't really, uh, I was just too focused on the game. The tension was there, you know, like once you see the prize, you can, you know, you can almost taste it. It's, it's great, it's amazing. A very stressed ass move closes out round two in fifth after dying with the goal, but still very much contention to cross that check threshold. One of the most fun players and gems we've discovered in this Vegas Open. I want NA players to take note of this. Turn your cameras on, please, when you do an <laughs> NA event. We want to see reactions like this because it makes it more engaging. It looks so good. Who's he talking to? <laughs> yeah. Did you talk, did you try to talk to you more? Is that what you want? I, I mean, you know, they usually curse my name a little bit, but <laughs> it's been two games and we already have enough B-roll footage <laughs> to see that much emotion. That's right. In that's two right. games. And so, I think it captures the high highs and the low lows that some of these players are going through. And for those who are just tuning in, we're coming into round number three here at the Team Fight Tactics Vegas Open Finals. And we actually have some players that are pretty close, Mix. Yeah, we do. There's three players that could potentially make it across that check line. Double, Kevin, and Broccoli, of course, with differentiating points. It is a little bit close for some of them, but it could happen that we have one player on check in game number four. And, Mort, you and I, we've been around <laughs> for a little bit. You, of course, as well, Froden. We know that that could be a big threat. Yeah, I mean, you know, someone goes one, two, one, one, and just drops the mic and says, I guess I'm the, uh, you know, set nine world champion. That tends to happen. So Casey Double right now on really good track just needs a third or higher. That's a great spot to be in. You know, trying to get that first for someone like Broccoli is a little bit tougher. Um, but even if you don't, right, someone like Broccoli is in a really good position, right? Like, let's say he goes fifth or fourth or something like that. Then the next game, all you really need is a seventh. And so the pressure's off for a little bit. The thing we have to be careful for is if these three players don't perform this game, we end up in a situation where all of a sudden like five players are in check and that's where it gets really wild and the audience gets hyped up. And the other question is, how are the other players on the other side? We're looking at Sasa, we're looking at Humbug, 7-7, seven, 8-8. Seven, eight, eight. And the answers begin in just a moment. I'm gonna ask one more time, Las Vegas, are you ready for round number three in the finals? They sound like they're ready. Let's go ahead and get into it and see what Fort Dog has for us to offer to take a look once more. The eight players are loading in. What for it will be? Three, two, one. Let's play some TFT. <laughs> and it looks like the decision is pretty clear cut here. Yeah, the, a unanimous choice here. Looks like I believe we're going to get some component anvils. So another oh. solid one, yeah, a little bit of toying, but yep, component anvils, everyone's kind of agreeing here. And again, we've seen sort of preference in these competitive states, right? People like these low variance portals that allow them to kind of play their game plan, right? They, they don't really want to deal with some wild thing like an artifact portal that may give somebody a massive advantage. Instead, two component anvils is going to let them build the items they want. It also helps too if uh, you just get gold on these first few creep rounds. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, and, and it largely depends on the combination of the items plus the champions that you get. What direction are you going to take? The, the unit that stands up the most, fast Thelios. Very, very nice. Oh, that's, that's exactly that. what I'm looking for. All right, so we have Heart Steel on one three. Which again, we've talked about this a bunch on the cast so far this weekend. Is it three three Heart Steel? It's pretty good. It'll help in stage two. It's not like insane though. The big thing you're gonna be on the lookout for is how quickly can you get five heart steel online. Once you get five heart steel online in stage three, that's where things get wild. That is true. The other thing to think about too that's really nice is that Kazante is a lot stronger on the 1324 patch. He's got reduction of mana from 60 to 40, which makes him cast that much quicker, and he's a much more effective unit. So what makes him particularly strong is you get two things. You get heart steel online to get yep. a little bit of economy boost. And you get that Kasate too, which is very valuable. Double 61 got the quirky headliner though with the 8 bit, so that's already online, gonna help start to ramp up some of that damage. And we've seen just how strong quirky really can be to be able to scale through the late game. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with the Corky. The thing I want to touch on real quick with the Cassante is that with the component anvils as well, that can put you in a situation where you have two, maybe even three full items on that Cassante yeah. very quickly. And with the damage being so low in the early game, you're not going to be able to take that down. Silver augments, it looks like. Okay, 
Silver start things off, and multiple people playing Corky, but no, neither of the players that we saw had big shot Corky. A lot of people are looking for big shot at their headliner. 8th is significantly weaker because then you have to hit that Kai'Sa and get big shot online to unlock that true power of Corky. On top of the items that we'll see, taking a look at Ashmu right now, has Silver Spoon so you can get that extra level Anything else catching our eyes? Yeah, most likely we'll have to look out for Casey Double. Now, he does usually play for a little bit more of a loss streak in the beginning, so usually he has Carousel Prio there anyway, but uh, maybe for the later stages more, you're looking a little bit puzzled. Yeah, I mean, Casey Double's been the player who's been eighth place all the way to stage four each time. To take Young Wild and free at 2-1? That's a bold play. That is not something you typically see unless you have a very strong board already. So we'll have to see what board he's got, but otherwise that feels like a very risky choice. Yeah, not all augments are created equally in terms of when they're picked. <laughs> Young Wild and Free is much stronger on 3-2 from a specific winning position because then that first pick carousel that you get for being low HP is completely negated, right? So that some people can think before that and seal big units. Corky showing you really strong, of, or show, showing you why he's very strong, able to get this win over Humbug. Humbug, one of those players to really focus on. I think going, you know, 8 8 is a morale blow. It's, it's, it's not even just there about getting checked. You just feel like, man, I just need to stop going 8 here. Yeah, I agree. I think early game, especially, you know, oftentimes we've seen people prioritizing those damage headliners in stage 2. But the big thing here is that when you have these extra component anvils, you can get two full tank items online, and that can be an insanely effective tank, right? The effective health gets multiplied by all that armor, all that health. And so that's almost a better state where these tank headliners end up being really good from this position. Looking at this board, we do have a two item Urgot, which is very good in stage two, but not much frontline to go with it. Did we all just see Ash go level five at 2-2? Two -two? Yeah, with the uh, Silver Spoon, you kind of want to continue to push that tempo. So it's going to be putting a lot of pressure on the rest of the lobby. And so you want to kind of curve out. That Silver Spoon gives you that advantage early. It drops off a lot later. That and is a potential threat for players like Casey Double, though, who want to get that win streak going. Yeah, that's right. And also, even more pressure for people like Humbug, right? We just saw that he had Stimpak. That's kind of an unusual Silver Augment that people pick because People say like, hey, I, do I want to be 50 HP to even get all these uh, items? It's a lot of items, but it feels like I have to commit to lose streak. But I think Humbug, that's where he wants to be and see if he can convert off that early loss. So Malala here, taking an interesting choice, takes Pandora's items, which, but it's already slammed all the items. But I do like this because it gave three full items as opposed to two full items and a component, which is where most people are at right now. So that's just a little bit of extra power. This Annie's got that gun blade, going to keep the cannon alive a little bit longer. So I do like this slam, even just for the component. And then later can use the Pandora's if needed to reroll something. It's going to get a relatively easy matchup here against Humbug, I think. Again, that Urgot is very powerful in stage two but it just feels like that front line is going to crumble very quickly here. It is true, but they are crowding around for the yeah. AoE of yeah. Urgot, which is perfect. And you can see why Urgot's such a menace. There's a lot of melee champions. If you're not too started with a lot of durability traits, Urgot can just chill yep. through. Not to yep. mention, Red Buff is one of Urgot's best items. Yeah, that felt like a bit of a positioning dip. When you know that Urgots are out there, you've got to spread out in that situation. And Urgot able to just maximize his damage and unfortunately ruin the win streak. All right, cares. Ooh, Very Bushwick. lucky uh, matchmaking for Casey Double there as well, not running into Ashmi. Both of these players on 100 HP as we go into the carousel here. And that's exactly where you would see that young Wild and Free that we called out early. He's making full use of it, getting that high priority in the carousel. So this is the kind of thing you can't really like check in the stat, but young Wild and Free is an augment that isn't that great on 2 1 because of that high risk. Casey doubles past that risk part, right? He's 100 health, he got the advantage. Now we're actually starting to be very like worried that he's gonna be top three from this position. He got the item he wanted, he's got this three item Corky, he's at 100 health, and again, all he needs is third or higher. The itemization comp composition they're looking for is Rage Blade, Shojin, and Guardbreaker. So you're already looking at level nine. We're, we're just at level four and five for a lot of these players. Rage Blade Shojin is not really common on a lot of the four cost carries. But we see it maybe potentially for Sona. So let's see if Double Safety One can keep his streak. And it might be up to Ashmo to stop him. Does have a headliner Kaisa. He has, he has six Kaisas. Oh, you're right. Wait, whoa. I didn't check my eyes checked. That has six yeah. Kaisas. <laughs> yeah, both of them on board here. And it is going to be a matchup between both of these hundred streaking players that could be quite detrimental to how this game goes on for both of them. Oh, this is big for Ashmo. He's able to get it. 
A win over Double 61 stopped him in his tracks. It looks like the front line has cracked for Double 61. So a nice, easy victory. That's a really Ooh. big outcome here for Ashmu. Yeah, the Kaisa is, again, very good in this stage, especially with the Shoujin. Kaisa's got that 30 mana. Shoujin means every two autos, you're firing one of those big missiles that can take people down. That's just so much extra damage. And the fact that you have two of them means they're both benefiting from their traits. They're in a good spot here. You know, maybe we see a Kaisa 3, which not something a lot of people are playing around right now, but, you know, if it falls into your lap, what are you going to do? May as well. It's a nice tower spike if you can just keep oh, on to it. Oh, what? Are, do you see what we're looking at here? We're looking at five hard yeah. steel. Wow. I just wanted to confirm if that was a set in the corner. Jam into that boom box, and that is. He doesn't have a full loss streak, so not optimal conditions. But that's okay. I think a lot of people make a mistake more of trying to lose you with hard steel. Yeah, no, I mean, the fact that you have five hard steel now at this point in the game, that is an amazing position to be in. The amount of rewards you get multiplied by 2.5. And even if you win streak, okay, I'm still getting free components. I'm still getting a free thieves glove. That makes a massive difference for this vertical trade. And we just checked in with Broccoli, who's actually only fielding three units while being level four, really facilitating that loss streak, making sure he gets it no matter who he faces. And for Kevin, that's also going to go his way, get a loss here with those hard steel on line. Yeah, it's interesting. With hard steel, I feel like stage two, you almost just want to win, preserve that health. But stage three, when you start getting that extra hearts for the loss, then multiplied seems really, really good. Um, but either way, it's still permanent rewards. That's going to allow your comp to reach higher peaks than anybody else in the lobby. And then, like you said, Broccoli right now, our big streaker. Five loss streak, 39 gold, 68 health. Not too bad, right? We saw 63 last game, so nothing too bad. And on the top side, our emotional player, Ashmu, five win streak. Uh, hopefully that puts him in a good state of mind for the rest of the game. Well, he hasn't had a chance to fight up against double 61 yet, so I really feel like that would be a good test of strength for his board, just to kind of see where he's going to stack up to the rest of the competition. But I love to see what Broccoli's going to end up doing here at the end of Krugs. Yeah, he played around. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right, more dog. And he has an Infinity Edge, so when you see this combination, what comes to mind, board? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like he was leaning towards country with this state, but that changes things a lot. There could be a crowd diver angle here. If you go, you know, use this to make a crowd diver emblem and then play around something like the Zeds, the Yones, that could be another potential option. He has country available right now. He's a country Katarina headliner with Samira, but again, he's trying to invest into that law streak because he recognizes this is not his end destination and that's a really expensive purchase. That's five gold. And that's kind of the Katarina and one goal that you sell it back, plus four. So Brock is going to hold. Yeah, we've seen that even seven country is not necessarily enough to win these lobbies, especially if you can't outscale some of those higher end cap boards at level nine. Yeah. So it could just be really expensive in that regard, too. We are pigeonholing yourself into one strategy. Okay, now the thing about Kevin Parker's spot is does he is he able to continue to thread that needle, right? 71 HP is pretty good, but we've seen people get too greedy with hard steel and lose too hard in stage three. Let's see what the 3-2 augment presents us. All right. We have a last stand on double as an option. Yeah, last stand for Left Noel as, as well. well. Noel. Yeah, yep. rolls it. I, I see a blank slate uh, <laughs> uh, on the right side here, but I don't, I don't know if that's going to be what we just picked here. I'm pretty sure double picked the last stand out of this. Uh, it looks like last stand is considered to be very strong right now because it synergizes so well with a lot of the traits currently in the set. No blank slate here for Humbug. <laughs> I was kind of hoping for it, but he did at least pick up a set of headliner. Yeah, the set of headliner, idealism, uh, pretty good strong start here. Has that Urgot here. If we can find an Urgot too, that should help make a bit of a comeback. Uh, and then the other big part here is again, Ashmu still win streaking, Broccoli still loss streaking. So unlike a lot of our other lobbies, this is a very stark, you know, high-low situation. Look at Broccoli, so many items here that are not yet slammed, but he is going to get onto that. And the big one has to be where are we putting the spatula? What is going to be the goal for it? Reforges, oh. and that is going to be a quick slam. That went his way. Yeah, definitely. We, again, we talk about how true damage is a very good one. And this, by the way, has been Broccoli style throughout the tournament. It's what got him here. He likes playing that Lost Streak into a three-cost headliner. He found the Misfortune, which we know isn't the highest cap or anything, but at this point in the game, probably gives him the strongest board. And now he has that true damage emblem, so that's going to allow him to hit a high cap. Now, unfortunately, you can already see it on Ashmu again. Our emotional player wearing it on his sleeve does lose his win streak. 
goes up against that bard and is taken down. So now Malala on the win streak and Kevin Parker with, on that loss streak with that five heart steal. So now that he's on that four loss streak, probably got some big rewards from his heart steal cash out. Uh, check out Malala's Senna items too. See the red buff, also the Hextech Gunblade and the Nashers. I feel like all those items are really, really good in late game, especially maybe putting it on something like a gin. I really like the Hextech there. <laughs> Yeah, these are definitely interesting items. We've talked about Nashers a little bit, that Nashers is pretty good on someone like Senna, and it's good in Sage 2, but sometimes has trouble transitioning into the late game. There aren't a lot of really good late game users of Nashers, and that can end up being problematic. On the other side, we see Noel with that Bard. The Bard was able to snap the win streak. We've got the red buff on it. We've got the Shoujin, so it's building up those dudes. But from what I've seen in the tournament, Bard usually caps out around a third place, so we're probably not sticking with this Bard. We're not re-rolling it. It's just going to get us probably through the stage three. Yeah, you can see on the back of the board, Noel, even I think, if I saw that correctly there for a second, had an Ari, sold it off, makes bank here as we head towards that next carousel. We're going to hop on over to Zaza, who is currently still fighting against, I think that's Malala Sport or Double Sport, as we are going to go into that carousel. There's a Twisted Fade and a Blitzcrank. For any Disco players, that should be interesting. Oh, so, really? A young Wild of Three did not get, end up getting the first pick. Yeah, unfortunately, he was trying to go for that sword, and Kevin Parker manages to snag it away. So, a little disappointing for KC Double there. Still going to be able to get a choice. You know, right now, Young Wild and Free not giving him full advantage because he's not in first place, but overall, still pretty solid here. Rounding out the carousel picks, nothing too crazy. On the augment side, Ashmu does have that crash test dummies. That's been a popular one. KC Double taking that last stand. So it kind of makes sense that they'd be a little weaker here. Oh, wow. That is a, okay. Oh, wow. So again, we talk about how five heart steel gives so much value. This is one of the more unique cash outs that one of our designers did. And it's a really good one here. You've got a target dummy with a locket. And locket was reworked a bit. So locket gives, I believe it's a 200 health shield and 20 armor and MR. So now that entire- for 15 seconds, line, or 20 seconds. Yeah. yeah, for a bit. So that entire front line is going to be very difficult to deal with. It's going to buy time for this Aphelios to ramp up and we still have five heart steel, we can still generate more rewards. This is just essentially a free gold augment worth of value. Yeah. Absolutely, and now that frontline is even tankier because he's spreading out his opponents for cybernetic pull. Doesn't expect to win. That's true damage misfortune two as a headliner. And again, it's about the quality of the units you're winning by, but that Bramble Best on Urgot is surprisingly very tanky. Tank Urgot is not exactly something I would see, but when you tell me it's Broccoli doing something like that, that doesn't surprise me in the bit. <laughs> Yeah, he does tend to build these boards. We've been over it again and again. And of course, with that true damage emblem that we saw there, I'm pretty sure that the final board that Broccoli is going to put together here is going to be something that will be a joy to watch. Hopping back over to Noel, though, he's been kind of treading the line on Econ. You can see he didn't roll at all in the game just yet at the bottom there in the shop. It's all gone into leveling. And so that is the board that we ended up with, which is quite common for a lot of these players. I think that if I were to handpick the most generic item slam that would keep me flexible and open to playing almost anything in the game, it would be almost like this. Maybe the, it, with that vest, you convert it to a steadfast heart. I think Shojin plus the red buff is very versatile. It can go on 80 carries, you can transition to AP burst carry, you can also turn a skill up to five costs. So I really like the position Noel's in. The only thing is he has to close with the five streak. If he's able to do it, that would be massive for his chances in stage four. Yeah, like you said, these have been kind of the favorite items throughout the tournament, right? We've seen Shojin be kind of the most built item throughout the whole tournament. Red buff is a great choice. Ginsu's has been another one for backline items. And then on the front line, right, you've got Crown Guard, Warmog, Steadfast Heart, like you mentioned. All great wow, choices and here. Wow, tip! Not bad. Oh, okay. Well, that was nice. actually surprising my first at the very end, but uh, the Bard's done his job. And I don't think we're going to reroll Bard, so I think we're going to ditch it pretty soon. Yeah, it feels like the big story here right now is Kevin Parker, who, again, one of our players who could potentially hit check if he gets second or higher. I think he can only really afford one more major loss here. Yeah. We are going to stage four where the hearts scale up again. Losses per stage goes up, but one more cash out and then you've got to start building a real board here. Now, the good news is he doesn't have to lose, but it does feel like you want probably one to two more losses to get that biggest cash, cash out possible then convert, get a bigger headline here. So thankfully, level seven, plenty of gold. I imagine we're gonna go to eight, take it slow, and then go from there. So 
We'll just have to really wait and see what happens. What's that final augment? What's that final headliner? Slams the Titans, which is pretty interesting here. So kind of making it clear he's going to play around this Zed, perhaps? I'm not or so Diego. sure, Moore. There's some Diego. individuals I know in this convention center who say that's at least five lives. 30 HP <laughs> with hard steel. If he can take one or two unit losses, he can actually lose a few more, I think. But I, the problem is you're right. You want to at least have two lives. Yes. You definitely yeah. want to be the 30 spot. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, again, up against these Urgots here has a country. So we have a country board going on. <laughs> so, oh, look at Ashford's yeah. face. He's just, he has an Ezreal 2 on 4-1. He's winning. I this, can't tell so, if he's on, on he's... the bottom or top. He keeps looking like he's losing, but this dude is but clobbering. He's, winning. Yeah. He's, he's, he's streaking. He's 93 HP. I think he might be upset that he has to, like, get a hand a lost combo. I mean, right. it could be a two. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe, maybe taking out NA if it's NA. Here comes the third augment. And it is going to be golden augments. I'm looking at Kevin Parker specifically because he is in that state where he lost one more round. And now you kind of need to find something to make this entire board come together. Yeah, there's some good choices here. We see little buddies. Ashmu had that as well. Kevin Parker gets oh, the uh, you broccoli. have my whole game. Uh, Broccoli does get that blinked out, which is a pretty strong thing to play into true damage. Kevin Parker is now transitioning out. It's also another thing you can do. You don't have to stay on five hard steel. You can actually play three. You keep that tour box, that tour case, and now still cash out after that fourth round, which looks like it's very close. One, two rounds away. And see if Kevin Parker can take a good win here. He doesn't want to lose anymore. 17 is really pushing it. That puts you at danger zone, but it's still one and a half lives in stage five. Yeah, I mean, the fact that we have the locket to power up the Viego here, this is a very powerful Viego in this situation. Looking at Casey's double board, really it's good for him to come down to watch the Ari versus the Viego, right? If this Ari targets the Viego quickly, thankfully Echo intercepts. That's going to allow Viego a little bit more time. Ari still not on the Viego, now finally is. Finds him. Oh, that's does a little scary. Get the cast out. That's he does a little scary. Back, but in the no. back line, we have oh, good. Bellia supporting, so the Ari is going oh. to be just a little bit too slow. Kevin, it's going to be a win. Honestly, if the Ari had won that by one unit, that would have been even better. We yeah. ended up at 182 oh. out of 200. Yeah, so true. that's okay, but we'll have to see what those cash out rewards are. But I imagine from this point on, Kevin Parker's going to focus on playing the strongest board possible. So Kane. the wow. Kane's a bait, the Kane's a bait. We find three extra components, which again, doesn't sound like a lot, but when we talk about comparing boards now, the fact that you're up a target dummy with a locket and three components, and then you've already got this Viego, this is a lot of power. So now it's about finding things that you can put the Shojin, the Ginsu's on, right? Find that Sona, find something else to really cap out this board. He's got double Cybernetic augment. He's got Cybernetic Volk and Uplink. So those components are uh, pretty much exactly what you're looking for, short of just uh, hitting everything that you need. And so that's looking really good for him. Take a look at Broccoli and Ashmoo's POV. Little Buddy seems to be speaking directly to Ashmoo, who has 40 gold at level 8. He's trying to take a look at level 9. Meanwhile, Broccoli do the same thing. Level 8, 30 gold, trying to carry that misfortune and working onto Noel's board, trying to close in on that twist of fate. And the win here for Broccoli would be huge. And looks like that's secure. What about uh, for Ashmoo? He's able to get through as well. Big wins for North America. <laughs> I saw the fist pump there. He's like, yeah, yeah. Maui in the carousel as well as a spatula. That wow, is spatula. a double CC one. Double picking it up oh. right away. Kevin waddling in just a little bit too late, not able to reach it, but will take the Alawi instead here. Very popular legendary. Yeah, I mean, just the extra front line it provides with those tentacles is really good. You already mentioned Casey double getting that spatula. I imagine at least right now, potentially becoming a KDA emblem could be the choice. We'll have to wait and see here. Otherwise, nothing too crazy. Also get a good look at these augments here. Ashmo with that little buddies. Broccoli we talked about with that blinged out. That's going to be really good. Double finds the Akali 2 wow, here. Wow, that's big. This is such an interesting board, right? We've got KDA, uh, but I believe that's the <laughs> true damage Akali we have in here. It's true damage Akali, which is perceived to be stronger in terms of DPS output than the KD version of Akali, but also his entire board's one star besides these two four cards. Which yeah. is the most funny part to me. It's like, well, he hits the important units, but it's also about the supporting cast, like any a good band. 
All right. We've seen Broccoli play this comp a bit before, by the way. Again, it's that true damage Caitlyn. Wow. That allows that to be really strong wow. here. Uh, has the blinged out as well. So this Caitlyn's going to be attacking very quickly here. Pairs with the rapid fire. And here comes the ult. And you can just see... Oh, oh my god. god. Chunks that RE. That Big RE. Loss for double. He does have the last stand, though. I always get baited by that. But he can fall back onto that. And he still has 14 oh. HP. So I'm sure we're going to see kind of... Double do the same thing he usually does, where he lost streaks and then goes oh, no. together, but he oh, doesn't no. the last oh, no. and oh, Poppy, though, getting close here for uh, Kevin Parker. Okay, so now we are at mission critical. We are effectively at one life. Once we get to stage five, we are guaranteed to lose no matter what, if we lose by uh, one unit. So uh, th this is a bad situation here for Kevin Parker. He needs to roll down and stabilize, and he didn't want to roll at eight. He wanted to stabilize eight and go to nine. I'm kind of worried for Kevin. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate. Just again, the strength of the lobby here, still playing around the, the Senna. You got the Penna kill in. Right now, the big thing to call out is he has not been able to find a Karthus. It feels like Karthus would have really powered up this comp a little bit here. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, just not finding that. Even has the Morello. He has to put the Morello on the Yorick to try to stay alive. And so, felt like a bit of a miss on that roll down. Okay, yeah, he's the back going line. up against Zaza. Zaza also just invested oh, in his hey. board, but it is looking to be well enough here for Kevin to hang on. Zaza, on the other hand, taking yet another big hit. And if you're looking at the right side of our lobby standing, more and more players are finding themselves in a position where the next loss could be their last one. Very close. Cast. Oh my gosh. Whew. Very close fight. And the slim as a margin. Kevin Parker takes that win but look who drops below casey double that three hp is very critical because of that last stand now he has yet another round he could theoretically greed if he needs to but he only has nine gold so i don't exactly know how good of a loss that was yeah i mean the fact that he didn't quite proc the last stand i think is very awesome here he's got one extra life but like you said we're kind of out of resources right look on the right side here ash move 60 gold noel 48 gold, Broccoli, 39 gold. They've got health and gold to work with, whereas the bottom of our lobby, Kevin Parker, double. Those are the two people that could be in check. Have They're basically got nothing left, right? They've got to strengthen their board here, try to solve it, get into a good situation. And even Zaza at 10 health right now, these are all on one life, basically. And the big threat has to be Broccoli. Nine wins already in a streak. If that board rolls around in your matchmaking, I think you may be, might be praying to more dog. <laughs> Broccoli in particular is another interesting case because he needs exactly a first place. A second place is almost pointless for Broccoli because then you're just kind of in an awkward situation where next game doesn't matter for you. So really needs that first place. Well, I think something too about Broccoli's position that's really nice is that if you are win streaking and you still have to keep gold, you don't have to level right away to nine in order to preserve board strength. So you have a lot of econ to work with when you actually do level up and you have time to roll down. Yeah, that's true. You know who doesn't have a lot of time? Kevin Parker needs to get this win. Does end up taking an easy victory over Ashman, who is greeting. Same with Sasa. Now double is down to his last life. What can he do? Last cent. Now Proc, he needs to make big moves. But last time we checked in, he had, what, like nine goals? Yeah. That's not a lot with, to work with. So I'm curious on how he's trying to make it happen. At the same time, though, Broccoli, you were talking about it more, that he needs this first place. In a sense, he's already playing checkmate without being on check. He's going <laughs> for that very risky play. And that might just be a taste of what we'll see in the next round from him. And it's paying off. He's still streaking. There is also just something to be said that, yes, you want to aim for that first place, but also if you go like seventh or sixth, you make your life much more difficult for the next game. But he looks like he's in a good position, and the HP count does favor him. Double 61 on his last stand has RE2 and that Akali 2, and this is his last stand for the 7 KDA board. Is that good enough? As he's matching up what looks like to be against a pretty healthy player, I think it's Noel. Don't think it's very threatening, and he should be able to collect the victory. His board looked very good. The problem is the Ari has been stuck on that poppy for what feels like forever. Now she's getting surrounded by those tanks. At the same time, the Twisted Fate in the background has just been spraying, praying the entire board down. Will be enough for Casey Double to hang on though. But I feel like this was closer than it needed to be. Unfortunately, Zaza goes out in eighth place. Oh. That's just another really rough finish. So seven, seven, eight. Yeah, unfortunately, that's going to be really difficult to come back at this situation. Broccoli, on the other hand, now 11 win streak here.
So just having a dominating okay. performance in this lobby, but again, needs that first. Ashmu here we see playing around this Ezreal has the heart steal the KDA kind of a, a nice mishmash of things here on this board He loads a nine and he's at 30 gold, which is a really interesting decision here Because it seems like he wanted a level and maybe perhaps move to his board But uh, he looks like he's going for one more heart steal cash out before he maybe makes a big transition on his board So he's trying to layer it. I like that and double 61 in the meantime trying to see if he can fight for his livelihood can he get onto the Ezreal on the back line and capitalize onto Ashmu biding his time? And then it is an easy victory. That's a great victory for Keith Double 61. Hamba Pao, though, unfortunately, similar to Zaza, very, very unfortunate oh positions in the first three games. We're going to be far away from that. Not Hamba also knocked out here in six. Okay, so this is starting to become a very big deal here because now Casey Double, we talked about, needs a third, is in fifth with this last stand, Brock. Uh, we talked about Broccoli, who needs the first, and I believe it was Kevin Parker who needs the second, right? So if any of those happen, that's a big deal. And then you've got Ashmu and Noel, who aren't going to be able to hit check this time, but are going to get very close, right? Because we have, again, other than uh, Zaza, you know, we've got a very top-heavy lobby right now. But them doing well could also deny them that check, so it does buy them an extra yep. round, too. So if I, both of them kind of hold hands in that first and second, then we could be seeing a really interesting game, especially just limiting it, to, or, or even maximizing it to five games or more. Um, let's see look at these roll down so noel and broccoli are now level nine i feel like what you're saying is already a great point to when players are in check because you kind of as a lobby need to make sure that the person that is on check if it's just one doesn't actually get there so in a sense oh. ashmu is already going for that together with noel but double and kevin are going at each other and somebody's gonna get knocked out someone's gonna buy four between these two top point finishers right now and double 61 is getting closed on and I think this Viegos might be able to get rid of the Ari very quickly. And the Akali has to do 1v6. And I don't yeah. know if that's going to happen here because there's a lot of DPS still remaining. She's going, but I don't think she can do all no, of that. Can. Look at the HP pool. She's trying to knock oh. out everything. And not Kevin be Parker possible. in that top four. So WCG1's not going to get past that threshold for this game. And now Heartbreak can actually come to him as well if he finishes fourth. Yeah, it would be pretty wild if no one makes it from this position, despite how close everyone is. But Broccoli now on a 13 round win streak with that true damage, Caitlyn. It feels like it's really up to Ashmu. Ashmu with this Ezreal board is level 9, has a lot of gold to work with. I think trying to go level 10 perhaps here even to try to strengthen it. Ashmu wow. might need to be the hero to wow. stop Broccoli. He's trying to go to level 10. He's, he, he's feel like he has to go really big. He's already got top four secured. The problem is he's giving a lot of easy wins to people in the process, right? Kevin Parker gets a much weaker board because he's not rolling at nine. Still playing around a Nico headliner. And Ashmu is trying to play for first. But as a result, he's giving easy places for people like Kevin Parker to potentially fight for a third or better. That's a lot of damage, too. That's exactly, I don't know if I agree with this. That's exactly what Ashman needs to do, though, right? He needs to try and find that first place to deny Broccoli from getting there, because he needs the first. So it's really playing 3D chess while everybody else is playing checkers. At the same time, though, look out for Kevin. If he has Broccoli in his lobby match pool, 14 wins, this board is insane. It's, it's fascinating, because I think if you, if you break it real down, you have to stop both of them, right? And I think Kevin Parker, we know, has the advantage from those heart steel items that he generated earlier. So that's going to make his board really strong at level 9. Broccoli has been on this win streak. He'll also be strong. It does feel like the only way to stop both of them is for Ashmu to go level 10 and hit something really big. The problem is, I think he's just short on gold. Yeah. He doesn't, by the way, unless... The he's thing rolling. He's rolling his gold. He's rolling. He's not level 10. So it's really just a yeah. question of how strong did this board get, right? We see that's seven Ezreals. We're not at Ezreal 3. If this had been an Ezreal 3, that is the other out here. Oh, if he could have been racking up his gold resources and now he has the out. He's not playing nine units. Looking for it. Two more copies are needed, but they don't come around for now. Noel does still, and that means Kevin is up against Broccoli. Is anybody noticing as well, right? This is, we haven't actually seen someone chase more cost three star so far and maybe it's an opportunity for people to start scouting but maybe people are too logged in not thinking about it oh doesn't quite finish the back line oh, with those two ezreal ults 
I don't know if TF, TF can just finish this by himself. I think Ashmoo might be able to get one good Ezreal out. cast. Oh no, that's not enough damage. Never mind. And that's a big win here for Noel. And Kevin Parker's out. How many points is that? That's not enough. That's no, not, not enough. enough. So it's uh, we're marching very closely to Broccoli being the solo player that's able to get past that check threshold. Yes. Double and Kevin will both be on 18 points right after this. And as we have been saying, Broccoli needs that first. So if Ashmer can actually deny that, or Noel, although I don't think his board looks to be in the position to do just that, then uh, nobody will be on check in game four. Yeah, right now, it really to me feels like the story here is, will Ashmu hit the Ezreal 3? He's got seven of them, so will it be enough? And that's Broccoli actually, chasing Caitlyn 3 as well. Yeah, I was going to say, though, that Ashmu actually played around in Ezreal 3 in one of his games yesterday to win out and want top 128. So it's a line he's familiar with. Noel might get knocked out here. 15 wins. Broccoli is just cruising and fighting through this lobby. I don't think you can throw up much oh against my. this. The Twisted Fate on the back line is going to be under attack. Oh. Oh. One more. Oh. 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 Into a third place. Ashmu barely survives. And now, Broccoli was rolling, by the way, because I think he's caught on to the fact that he has to deny that Ezreal, but he hasn't seen any yet left. There are 10 in the pool. Can he deny that final Ezreal? Or maybe if something magical happened to hit that Caitlyn 3, because right now he is favored to win this matchup. Three more Ezreals in pool, but where no. are they? No, he has to sell this to make a Yorick 2 at this point. He's on his last life. And now the stage is set for whether or not Broccoli can win this game. Yeah, Broccoli right now, clear favorite, has been on the win streak, has this true damage, Caitlyn, has the Oh my Marina. god! Kiana too as well! And I think this might be too much damage. This blinged out true damage, Caitlyn Ford has gotten him a 16 streak all the way to this point. Maybe somehow the Ezreals can combine their forces to wipe the back line, but look at how fast that true damage is just melting that front line. You back to back teams! Broccoli has now entered check and takes round! That is a massive deal. Listen to that crowd, by the way. Yeah. DSG chants are now erupting. <laughs> Ashmo saying this is fun. <laughs> Broccoli is cool as a cucumber. Woo. My goodness, that is some fire reaction, but what a dominant performance. We talked about playing around true damage specifically. <laughs> we mentioned the previous game. Caitlyn is a really underrated unit, but you combine it with true damage. What are you kicking about, boy? I'm trying to be serious here. No, this I, is serious stuff on the line. Sorry, it, we've got me and Meeks on the desk here. We just got a player in check. No! Are we, are we going to see another four game situation here? Because like you said, Broccoli is playing a dominant performance. He just went first first. All he needs now is a first place, and this tournament is over. Stop this, saying that! Uh, this, I mean, <laughs> little, little deja so vu, right. but... This is a pivotal moment, right? Because you've got players in the lobby like Kevin Parker and Casey Double who are so close that their performance next game barely matters. All they need to do is stop the broccoli. Yeah, and meanwhile, the crowd is loving it. North America win on home soil. And broccoli, who did get picked up by PSG as of uh, two hours ago, <laughs> <laughs> is now putting on quite a show. He came in extremely confident. You can see why that is. Hey, where are all the American orcs? I'm just asking, how can Toast just get all of these places? Yeah, weird. How does he just get any, all of them? That is very interesting indeed. Mm -mm, very curious. Uh, also, again, highlighting the power of the Blinged Ooh. Out. And what I really like is people talk about Blinged Out being actually a little bit on the misleading side. People say, hey, it's really good with reroll, but do you actually want it for some of these like late game true damage more? The answer is yes, if you can unlock its power. Yeah, for sure. Blinged out, just getting so much power to that Caitlyn, combined with the Aegis as well. That was just a lot of power. You know, we saw some good play around like the last stand. We saw some good play around the heart steel, generating all those extra items. But unfortunately, it just oh, wasn't cool. enough. No, cool. The fight was so close here. And you can see Noel just, oh, so close here. And again, the interesting thing, you know, just so much power for this board was not really that close here. The Caitlyn just being left untouched here, clears the fight, the Kiana as well generating a bunch and Broccoli popping off here. Just a great state. So I know Broccoli found this spot, but I'm curious now, what are some of the outs that these other players could take in order to actually overcome a board like that? Yeah, it all kind of depends on what happens. The portal can even be a deciding factor. Look how close some of the points are. DSG Broccoli, number one at 20 points, exactly at check. Ashmu, 18. Kevin Parker, 18. Double 61, 18. 
But look at Double's board. I feel like he got baited by that young Wild and Free, playing something he's not as comfortable on. Den being behind on what he normally has in Econ, not being able to capitalize on that. Him and Kevin, for me, it felt like both of them played riskier than they needed to. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And I think props to Ashmu, by the way, he played to his win condition. Just because he didn't hit the Ezreal doesn't mean it was the wrong choice. I felt like he knew that he needed that first place. He needed to stop Broccoli, and that was the only way he was going to do it. So I think we're seeing some great play from Ashmu. It just doesn't work out sometimes, right? TFT is that game of variance. Sometimes he miss. I also think that some of the decisions, he's trying to show that he is willing to deviate from his primary strategy. I think looking at 10 was a little bit too optimistic, but he immediately recognized that in that moment and said, hey, actually, yeah, I don't think I can actually get away and go to 10. I'm going to go ahead and roll down. And we, he found a different win condition, which is chasing the Ezreal 3, which I wasn't even seeing. So good on him to spot that. Yeah, we get a look at our standings here, and you can see that Broccoli is, in fact, in check, which means all he needs is a first place. If he gets a first, this tournament is over. Everyone else, gotta stop that. That's the big story. And if he doesn't get a first, there is a good chance we'll have at least four, and if not, five players on check yep. in the game after that. So it is going to stay very tense. I was gonna say, you can't count Noel out. That was a great game that he was just played there. That's right. So we'll find out whether or not Ashmu, Kevin Parker, or Double61 from France can stop him. And speaking of France, we got one of France's finest waiting with Panda. And I am here with Sean's president, CEO of Team Aegis, all the way from France. Sean, this game, Broccoli, really did pop off. Have you been catching his games this weekend? What do you think about him as a player? Yeah, uh, bonjour, uh, l'Amérique. Uh, we have uh, like uh, excellent performance from Broccoli. Like uh, we have been casting him, and we are really impressed. I think he just understood the meta before everyone, and uh, he's like just crushing the lobbies. Looking at the only French player in this final day, Double Sixty One. I think everyone in the crowd knows him already. You definitely do. He's been playing from a loose streak most of these games, seventh and seventh game one and two, and then comes back into that first and that top two spots. In this game, didn't quite work out. Do you think it's a game plan he's gonna try and, and go for every single game on this final day? Definitely no. Uh, I think uh, it's way harder in this uh, set and in this meta to play loose streak, but sometimes you have to. And I think he's still doing pretty well. He's at 18 points, pretty close to the checkmate format. So we are just pretty confident. I'm sorry, but I think he's gonna win it all. And looking at the rest of the French players in this tournament, 29 players flew over to play in the Vegas Open. Yesterday, three players finished 9 to 12, so almost made it to the final lobby. What are your thoughts on the French players overall as a region, as a country, coming into the Vegas Open? Oh, I'm so proud of the French guys because, like, they all flew and they decided to give it all. And uh, even, like, the teams decided to uh, support the French players, sending them. So uh, we think we are, like, very uh, strong as a country. But uh, recently, America has been showing that they are very good too. So, yeah, Double is our uh, best uh, player to, to get here. So hopefully we will win all. And uh, I want to thank you guys, uh, especially Riot Games. Thank you for the event as uh, the French competitor. And thank you also Las Vegas and United States for receiving us. Thank you so much. That's going to be it from us. Thank you, Sean. We're going to a very quick break. We'll be back with game four. So much action still in store.
So the lab group origi was originally just a small Discord friend group that slowly started to expand. I was one of the later additions to it. We also just wanted to give ourselves like a brand name on the ladder. Our names are like Lab0XX. I am number 23. We range from zero to 26 right now with a few outliers like 72 and of course 420. We usually study all together. We usually prepare for most tournaments, a new patch, and we usually just talk about like what's good, what's not. And if we're not doing that, then we're probably just playing like League 5v5s. All the lab people were all very noticeable inside the venue with, we all have huge lab coats. All thank you to Lab 014 Molly. And we're all just kind of crowding together. I was not expecting them to be as loud as they were going to be. They were all just like, whoa, let's go humbug. Most people by now know that me and Ashby were pretty good friends. And so when we both make it together, both out of the same lobby, both of our main groups, we're just all ecstatic. So you have 50 people all yelling, humbug, ash, move, humbug. humbug, humbug, humbug. I've like never gotten support this loud before. <laughs> it just made me feel a lot better about myself. Like I did it, like I can do it again. It's hard to put into words, but you just feel proud of yourself and a lot more confident that you can do that you can do it. I can be the person who wins Vegas Open. Welcome back everyone to the Las Vegas Open for Team Fight Tactics. We just closed round number three, but we do have one player in check from DNT is Broccoli. Who will be able to stop him? It will be somebody at the 18 point threshold from EMEA, maybe Ashmu, or perhaps a member of the lab. What a powerful segment that was to show you that TFT is a lot more about strategies and meta and stats. It's also about community. Lab members pulling together their resources, improving together as a collective whole. And my God, that was just like some of the best moments we've seen all weekend. Ash moving Happy's first friend, watching all the labs pull together. It's, it's by far my favorite moment. I was actually standing right there, st looking over Ashby's shoulder because I knew how close he was. And this moment it happened, they just exploded. He stood up, everyone's yelling, he runs over to Humbug, the game's still going on. It is by far my favorite moment of the event so far. Yeah, welcome to the couch, by the way, Cass. I know, <laughs> hope you had a great weekend. Panda also is joining us as well. What's it like out there right now? It's been really fun. I have some great interviews, some great people in the TFT community, but overall, I think this level of play has been fantastic about all three of these first few games. Uh, looking forward to this game four. As we mentioned, there's been a bit of a curse in past World Championships with game fours being oh. the final game. We'll see if it's the case here with only Broccoli in check. Yeah, I'm certainly hoping not. We're really going to have to see everyone try to like counter draft a little bit, things like that. The other fun thing that's been is the sort of natural evolution of the meta we've been seeing. In this particular lobby, there's been a lot of true damage. We usually see two, almost three players per lobby really leaning towards that true damage Akali, those true damage emblems, and those have been very powerful. All right, we're getting ready. The players are loading in. It's game number four, the beginning of the end. Four. Are we just getting started? It could be any of these players stopping. We just saw Malala. Can he do it? It's Ashmu, the open bracket hero that can stop the Broccoli Onslaught. Three, two, one. Let's get ready to go into game number four. All right, immediately we've got these portal selections, Golden Symphony, Training Dummy, and Item Payout. Looking like either Symphony or that Item Payout coming through. And you need to remember the players are currently second and third in the standings. Only need really a six to make it into that check as well. So they are the ones that really can start contesting Broccoli right away and trying to see what he's trying to do and stop that in the process. Another way to think about it, two players I believe are guaranteed to join Broccoli in check if the game in the series doesn't end right here. So. We will see what ends up happening in game number five, which also can continue to heat up exponentially. Yeah, exactly. Three players can't all go eight. So even if they go eight, seven, six, the seven. Th yep. Yeah. Why does every streamer say that then? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like in third and they're like, I'm going eight. Yeah. <laughs> it's like stage seven. Three people are on me. Ah, it's an eight. Uh. Going dead last. <laughs> Take a look at Broccoli's spot here. Starts off with Olivia, and I got a chance to talk with Kevin Parker between rounds. He's like, man, I know Broccoli's playing well, but like, she, she also feels like he's getting all the roles. 
How good is something like early set, uh, Lilia here in your opinion, Morb? Like I said, I think early Lilia is quite good, but usually you want the KDA or the super fan version. Both of those open up a lot more lines, have a lot more power early, whereas the two Sentinel, it's a little extra armor and MR, and you can usually find that second Sentinel anyway through things like Asante and Garen. So it's kind of not the most desirable one. I think for now we're going to let it roll. And the other thing is we've seen with Broccoli, this has been his strategy, right? He usually doesn't buy these headliners in stage two. He, if anything, he lost streaks. And then we're going to see that level six find the three cost that we've been seeing throughout this tournament. Yeah, realistically, unless he sees an opening that feels like a guaranteed win streak, it feels like he's a lot more comfortable with just the full open fort stage two. A lot of other players have not liked that because HP preservation has been such a big part of this tournament, especially with those harsh cutoffs. You think about Broccoli, and the word that comes to mind is potential. Everyone talks about what he's capable of at his ceiling. And this weekend, he's showing what he's really made of. Because he has gone last in tournaments before, even though he's qualified. Can he get over the hump as we take a look at the 2 1 Augments? Maybe gold Augments to chart things off. Some gold generation there. Lucky streak available for Broccoli to try and again accelerate into that fast state, fast nine. Nothing too crazy. It looks like from all the other sides. But it doesn't kill you for Kevin Parker. We saw it from double in that, you know, one of those first few games. Can't work out from a loose streak angle. Yeah, it rolls past the uh, the, the lucky uh, a gambit as well. I think buried treasure is a pretty safe choice here. Sure enough, that's what he goes with. That's going to be some extra component power. And again, for Broccoli here, he's got to be playing for first place, right? So every item slam, this can't be tempo plays. This has got to be things that cap that board. But Broccoli has shown throughout the tournament he knows how to cap the board. This is a new one. It's a new one, and also, it's, I, lo I love what you're highlighting more, which is uh, the ability to change your play style and shift, because Broccoli's a little bit more top four oriented as a player, like to be consistent. And so we'll see if he can uh, get stopped by someone like Kevin Parker, who's playing three out of four, by the way, on this uh, <laughs> Philios 2. That's essential because he has no more gold. Yeah, three out of four with the Philios 2. He's also playing around Gargantuan Resolve, which is not an augment. We've seen people clicking very often, even uh, the Titan's Resolve being something people don't want to slam as much, but there are quite a few units that have been popping up in popularity that can use the item quite well. We've seen Diego, Zed can use it okay. I'm wondering if Gargantuan Resolve will see it still be able to stack up in time because that's been the problem in set 10. There's a lot of things dropping off before they even get to the 40 stacks. Even with the Yorick Headliner as well, if you have Ethical Online, that could be a win condition in and, of, in and of itself as well with Yorick. I think having some games where we saw fast 10 boards that didn't quite work out with Yorick, but I think the key thing is including Pentakill to make that Yorick really shine. Yeah, I love the idea of a giant Yorick with yeah. two Titans maxed out with summoning giant zombies. That's a, uh, that's a great idea. And, and I think Cargant Resolve is a really underrated augment. A lot of people look at the stats and surface. It's not great, I'm not gonna lie. But I will say that that doesn't mean that you can't play it. And also, it is a melee carry oriented meta. They're not the only units you can play. We just saw Kaelin win, but they can do well under the right circumstances. The one unit is my absolute favorite. I love playing Cargant Resolve Poppy. I think it's so fun to play when you yeah. watch uh, Poppy uh, jump up and down on a close. So KC Double, by the way, leveled to five on 2-2. Two -two, so definitely not playing his normal loss streak here, playing pretty aggressively. Again, all he has to do is not go eight. So that kind of makes sense. Don't take the risk. Don't do the loss streak. But again, the other thing here is that with Broccoli being the only player in check, you've got to make sure to stop him. And so I almost wonder if like everyone in the lobby should be playing really hard tempo to try to stop him, see if they can make sure that he never reaches that full cap that he can win the board off. That was a, that's a really fun thing though, because we talk about, you know, the world championship title did it four games and everyone was still playing pretty tempo oriented. And he just sat back, open forwarded, lost, and then popped those tomes so late to go into his composition. And this is kind of reminiscent of that with Broccoli playing open fort on stage two, potentially looking to go into whatever composition he's going to play after other players have started to settle. Yeah, historically, loose streak has been much better for playing for first because you get to pick your carousel, right. you get to pick your spots when you spike, and win streak, you get last pick priority, you don't get that the best items, and so you're often playing for more of that top four, so Broccoli is setting himself at least in a really good position to do it. What a strong tempo start here for double as well. We understand now why he went five. Three Bruiser online, that four Bruiser spike could be huge in early stage three. Three Country online, both Urgot and Samira, and a Death Blade slammed as well. On Noel's side, we saw Sniper's Focus picked up from that portable forge. Could lead into things like Karthus, potentially Ezreal as well. Yeah, it's definitely a powerful artifact. Anything that can shoot across the board gets all that extra power from the range. Really powerful here. So we get a good view of all of the augments. I like the level even more from double because, you know, you sacrifice some econ to push the level, but you have cut above, and because you're going to be winning all of these rounds, chances are you might be able to make up that one or two gold that you might have missed by, you know, not going to 10 as early. 
Yeah, I will say that items like, or rather the augments that give you items like the Death Blade and Cut Above is a little bit awkward. It feels like Death Blade's in this interesting spot where theoretically it's just like the best item on all the AD champions, and yet when I see people picking items, is it because of sword economy more? Like, is that why people aren't building Death Blade more? I think it's part of sword economy, but also a lot of the AD traits have like built in attack damage percentage ah, as well, okay. right? Like Big Shot, for example, already has that, so it doesn't necessarily want the Death sure. Blade. It wants the multipliers of things like Infinity Edge or Giant Slayer, things like that. So you end up not really wanting to go that. And the other thing is that there is a massive premium right now in Shojin. True, true. And so every Death Blade you're making is two Shojins you might not be, and <laughs> so level six for double. Stays oh, down, oh, but he goes add oh, in, as I mentioned, the four bruiser as well, so a massive spike here. Has to almost guarantee the win streak up to stage two. That's so unusual when he's going up against a very difficult to kill Olaf. Olaf in this setup can actually be tricky, and we'll see whether or not he has enough DPS to actually take it down. Yeah, I mean, being able to grab that uh, Hodge is also going to help just pull off the same through, but there's so many Too units on this stuff. board. He's trying to live, but he can't fight through that, right? There's just so much yeah. here. But we can't double seven units because he's playing country as well. Leveling to six, and that, this is something that we've seen not once, but twice today. What do you make of it, man? I think, as you mentioned more, Double just wants to make sure he's staying stable in the early game. Doesn't want to have any chance of going eighth. We saw the last three games, there was a chance there. On those rollouts, we missed a little bit, was not as flexible as he usually is. It could have been a problem. Yeah, I think also with the augment, right, with the extra death blade, the ability to generate that gold, it's actually pretty good to just kind of win streak, get that extra gold back, build your econ. So I, I do like this play here. It's also more player damage across the board. So if you face Broccoli, that one, two extra player damage you're doing could make a massive difference here. So we'll have to see. Broccoli meticulously scouting, trying to see if he can lose this fight. No item slam, three hearts steal in. He probably was even willing to sell some of his other units, but he waited to see the matchup before committing his items. He's being very careful with how he's approaching his loose streak, which is very important. Now he knows he's gonna lose, he's trying to kill an extra unit or two. What I really like about this is usually stage two heart steal. I'm not as big of a fan because I'm like, oh, you're sacrificing health for what a component. That is true. But Broccoli already was going to open fort this stage. It, it, wasn't, it didn't matter if he had heart steal or not, he was playing around open fort. So if you get to tech in heart steal, you're just getting an extra bonus from something you already wanted to do. Yeah, we've talked about it before though, that like three heart steal stage two, this is six gold, right? We're not swinging the fight anything. This is nothing crazy. Um, but like I said, the fact that we're lost streaking level 540 gold, that's the big story here. Now, comparing this to Tidal, who was able to win it on game four, the big thing with Tidal was when he did that roll down on 3-5, he found those two Mordekaisers, right? That was a bit of a high roll, but it really allowed him to just dominate the lobby from the rest of the game. So the question is, what is Broccoli's two Mordekaisers, right? What are we rolling for? What is it that's going to spike us? And again, with Broccoli, he's been playing around, I believe it's the 3-2, level 6, find that 3 cost. What 3 cost will he find? Take a look at Sasa, Rage Blade Slam, which might look innocuous, but Rage Blade is actually quite an unusual item to choose right now, unless you want to play for a level 9, but that's sort of indicative of what's happening. I think a lot of these players, Sasa, Humbug, feel like they have to swing big, because if they go first, they're still an entire first behind of catching everybody else. So let's see what he can do there. And Kevin, despite the 3 out of 4 in that very first fight in Stage 2, relatively healthy with that Olaf as really a big carry in Stage 2. We saw it from Canvas in that last game in Round 4 yesterday. The other big thing to call out here is we have two win streakers. It's the first time we've seen this today, right? Double and Humbug, both at 100 health, both looking pretty strong. Will they face each other? Humbug has much more economy. His board, he's got the Akali, which is really good early, has that Senna, which we know has been really powerful but up against a level six board. And here we go. This is the matchup to see who is going to keep the win streak. Humbug really needs those points. Casey Double trying to keep that momentum going. But the Senna, just we know how powerful that could be. Hecarim comes in here. Watch the Akali oh. health. Every time she caps, she's healing back up a little bit. But unfortunately, it's not going to be enough. The set two just so strong. The Urgot with the Bloodthirster. And KC Double is going to continue his win streak. Yeah, Double's front line is just way too oppressive, right? We talked about how strong Senna's damage is, but she can't get through all of that. And the fact that there's, again, just so many units there for Double, it makes it just way too overwhelming. 3 2 Augment coming in. I'm actually really surprised about the Archangels on set, but I really think it's kind of clever to scale that shield in the middle of the fight and keep himself really tanky. Uh oh, for Double, I believe he's picked on Threza Crowd there. Had Epitaph, oh. but Threza Crowd even stronger in this spot. Could potentially commit into the country line. And we haven't seen much 3 cost reroll ever since we saw the, the MF incident on game one. 
Uh, and I think Threes of Crowd is, is one of those augments that really elevates and takes it over the top where you can win. Yeah, I think Threes of Crowd in particular with Country, right? You're playing the Urgot, you're playing the Samira. If we can find that Country Samira, it's that version in particular that ends up propelling you so that you don't have to play one of the weaker Country units, you can play another three cost. And again, the other thing is, We've got to watch Broccoli's 3-5 roll down, or actually 3-2. So actually, we'll have to see what Broccoli found. If you end up rolling for that, I mean, sometimes people do opt out of it and go for a fast 7, going at 3-7, 3-5, and rolling from there. In the meantime, Double 61 is trying to continue his streak, going up against Ashbu, who has a Yasuo to choose. But this is around the point where Yasuo falls off really hard. He's very dominant with stage 2, but stage 3, I feel like he's entirely manageable once you start getting a lot of frontline units. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you're asking about frontline units, that is going to be double 61's board. And Ashbu does have some very good items slammed for melee carry specifically, but when I look at those, it really streams that Ashbu wants to hit Zed. It's a little bit more narrow around that, and then eventually going into late games like Rakyon. Oh, a boo boo. And for double, with that win streak as well, it's like just the perfect augment for this stage of the game. It almost guarantees the win streak across the entirety of the stage two with how much value you get from the crowd, and already has the Zed, the Samira, and the Urgot on his board. Yeah, all right, looking at this uh, Yasuo, like you said, this is where Yasuo really starts to fall off. These are great items for something later, like a Viego, like a Zed, possibly even a Yone 3. That's definitely some options. But right now, it feels like it is going to start falling off. The other thing has that idealism, which is also going to power that up quite a bit more. You've got that Hand of Justice going up against Noel here, who has a pretty strong front line here. Although I do like the Infinity Edge Cassante. My that guy, goodness. That guy's going to punch hard. you in the face. Oh, man. That Ooh. is a stack Cassante. <laughs> <laughs> Tries to clap back at that front line. I mean, Cassante, it's not that it's a very good thing to do. It's just that uh, it keeps his items versatile. That being said, Sniper's focus. What, when, that's not, I know that when it first came into TNT, it was insanely powerful, and since then it feels like we haven't really figured out what to do with it in Remix Rumble. What's your favorite setups for it? Um, Ezreal is definitely my favorite setup. Benefits from all the stats, and when that ult hits, that's going to give you that extra oomph to maybe one-shot the backline. Karthus was popular for a while, but I still feel like with Karthus, it's just not quite enough oomph without the Double ult. loses. Double. Oh, wow. Who did he lose to? Uh -oh. that's, a, that's a big deal because Remember, he's a little bit poor. Triple he's spat on the carries off for here. stage. Well, there's the Urgot, but if double sticking to that country Probably line, not going to be one. so useful. And True Damage Slam has been the biggest one out of these spatulas. He's had, he has an open sword. This is really good for Broccoli. This could be, be the beginning of Broccoli trying to make his comeback once more. Yeah, the Samira, four double. Great pickup here if he goes for it in the end. No, it was for the Vex instead. Yeah, Broccoli now with the spatula, has the sword, has the little buddies. That's going to be another big key. Akali ends up being really powerful, powered up by the Senna that you usually have on the board. But if we look at his board, he's uh, he does have the Akali. So, yep, there's yeah, the there's true damage, damage slam. Immediate. We've he got knows. the Akali in. So we're definitely going to see another true damage line from Broccoli here. The question is, do we find another Caitlyn? Is that how we, you know, cap it off? Or okay, he's going to 7 on 3-5. I was going to ask if we thought he was going to wait till 3-7 instead, if he was going to wait till Wolves, but no. Sends it now, just trying to get some power on the board and start to turn around the loss streak. That's interesting. He leveled to not play a Kali. Or did he play a Kali? Maybe we switched POVs to Kevin Parker. We have to take a look, but that is interesting because he is on the poorer side. And he's going to need a lot of gold to get to 8 because you want to play 2 damage on a 4 card. Looking at 2 damage Zed, looking at 2 damage Caitlyn, so on and so forth. So we'll see if Brock is able to do that. In the meantime, Kevin Parker trying to continue his 4 streak. He's currently on fire. And this Crowd Diver counter, even though it's nerfed, still pretty potent in these mid-game spots. A very good stage three. It felt like it was always really good at just stabilizing your board immediately if you saw it in stage three. And then you could play the reroll because of just how good that headliner bonus was. Uh, now we're seeing a lot of players play it on two star. We actually saw someone play it all the way to like stage six or stage seven uh, yesterday. Ooh, another okay. Akali. Well, but the pair is massive. Hey, you're oh saying the gosh. two Mordekaisers. What's your two, two Mordekaisers? Jeez. More dog, have you been pressing buttons? <laughs> I've been right here the whole time. Uh, the, the thing I'll say is that if everyone's looking at the situation, now that we know what Broccoli's playing, right? We're probably playing True Damage. We've got that emblem. We've got that Akali's. What this is going to do is any armor or MR-based strategy probably goes down in value. You're going to want a lot of health. Things like KDA can be really good here. We've seen some RE boards really wreck the True Damage. Um, so something like that can be the counter. The other thing is that you've got to hold these Akalis and maybe try to stop this Akali 2 from ever coming online. 
Well, but I think that Caitlyn as well will be a priority for some of these players to try and disrupt that. Caitlyn with a yep. two damage pack would be yep. big. And you already almost have the Akali 2 anyway, so the headliner probably will try and be Caitlyn for stage four, at least for Broccoli. Here's the hard thing, though, is... Oh, wow, that's actually a big loss. big loss. I'll say, here's the thing, though, is that true damage emblem is so versatile. That's what makes it so insane. It's not just the, the raw power level when combined with the right champion. So many different champions can use true damage. Who doesn't like true damage on top of their carry output DPS? Yeah, for sure. Usually it's just Caitlyn because it gives you that two rapid fire, which gives you your team that 10% attack speed. That's kind of the natural one. But like you said, there are so many other choices. You could slap it on something like a Yorick. You could slap People it on Zed. Zed's another That's one. Right. Yeah, because it gives you that crowd diver. Um, so definitely a lot of options. It's not just one. And that's why it might be kind of hard to counter draft it, right? Because there's just too many things to hold to stop you. Twitch, headliner bot. That's a little unusual. You don't really often see Twitch as the headliner. What's Broccoli cutting up here? Usually people are not looking for two cause headliners. I feel like maybe he's trying to, he needs to stabilize to get to eight. Obviously that's his plan, right? And playing at a two cost is gonna give him more little buddies value onto his Akali. Ah. Essentially, with blinking the Executioner, it, he's thinking that that might be enough. I'm not convinced, but at least that feels like the thought process behind playing around the, the Twitch. It was a two cost that gives him an Executioner. That, that is a great micro optimization. If that even saves him, you know, four health, that yeah. is the kind of heads up play that you want to see at the highest level of TFT. And that's where he's finding his edge. Those twos and three costs all weekend long. He's been illuminating on a, a big shining light on units that are underplayed. In the meantime, Ash moves, kind of leaning back and, and slouching in his chair a little bit. It's a little bit different kind of body language for him as he's going up against Sasa's board. Sasa needs to come up big. Sasa does have a ton of gold, and Ash move, by the way, level seven, making 10 gold this turn. Yeah, Very what poor. What I'm reading from Ash move is it looked like he was either trying to commit to the Yone reroll on the level seven with a big roll down, trying to find it considering what his items were. Only but pump two. Ended up being contested. Someone else yeah, grabbing a bunch of five. them, and he never found the headliner himself, so he only found two. He's in a spot that feels really rough, and that's why we're, see we're seeing that in the body language. He's not sure where to pivot to because he's out of gold on level seven. He might be out of options at this point. Level eight for Broccoli, trying to level here, trying to find... Kali! Oh, Kali is it! And a Kali is a big... Oh, my God! Oh, my God. Caitlyn as well, which is exactly what he needed. That is the exact unit that he wanted. And there's no chance for anyone to stop him with these two massive upgrades. Very similar oh. to what happened with Title, where he found Lord. his upgrades so quickly. This this is a, a very scary situation for the rest of the he competitors has now. He got Zeke's, he has the true damage emblem. This is a powerhouse board. He's put it together. We literally just saw him play something like this last game. Now we are on, you know, he's only got 34 health, so he's- That's gonna, the thing. Yeah. His HP count could end up dodging it because it's not like this board is infallible. I think part of the reason why is other people in the lobby were not playing at strong boards with Akali 2 and Kaylin 2 at 4 2. Is it wraps? Is this the beginning of the championship march? I mean, this is at least a stable stage four, right? You should be winning through this. Then it becomes comes down to what can Broccoli do to continue to improve this, cap it out, and find that first place? Because at least for now, he's looking safe, even though it is still that 34 HP. I mean, Broccoli's on little buddies. He can go into Kiana in stage five as well. There's there's easy ways to continue capping this board throughout every single stage. Noel now also on Kiana, <laughs> but only a Caitlyn one. The pair see on the bench there. Yeah, you look at Noel's board and you feel like, you know, he tried his best to kind of contest it a little bit. Okay, here. okay. Find the Caitlyn. This might actually, by the way, this is Sniper's focus, Caitlyn. This is going to be a lot of multiplicative power and it's got blinged out. If anyone can stop it, it might be, hey, you're you, but me, but I'm better. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That might be the kind of thing that could stop it here. That's right, that's right. Wow, true damage. Oh, I, 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 think, I think the tech is out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> hiding it anymore. The the three days. Is out. I'm pretty sure people by now know true damage is very good. We were talking about how it's considered to be the best emblem in the game alongside Pentakill. Although I don't think Milano feels that way right now. Or maybe he does. But you know what? That makes sense. I lost to a true damage Caitlyn as well. Yeah, like I said, the, the true damage, and we saw it, especially in this lobby, right? Even, sometimes you have these lobbies where they have their own metas, what everyone's playing, but this is a lobby where true damage is so highly valued. We see two different true damage Caitlyn's. We see another one on the board, heading into Carousel, getting a look at these oh, augments Kiana. 
Uh-oh. And, and Noel's able to snag that. Oh my gosh, a big you moment have for Noel. Rockley second pick. And we're talking about players that could maybe stop Rockley throughout this stage four and five. Double still first in the HP standings. Has a chance to cap his board out with Freezer Crowd as well, potentially. We don't know yet if he's re-rolling country, if he has a chance to actually get close to those upgrades. So I was talking about how health is the counter to true damage, right? A three-star Yone, for example, is going to have very high health, constantly heal it back up. And that's going to be something true damage will struggle against. So there are definitely things, like this isn't over, but Broccoli is definitely in an amazing position. He's a likely big... favorite, but if Kevin Parker, oh, he's leveling to eight, by the way. Not trying to connect because he knows that Ashman was holding those Yone's. Yeah, one of the big things was the fact that Kevin Parker and Ashman were contesting Yone. So that's going to make it harder for us to actually see that three-star Yone come into play, even though Kevin Parker does still have, you know, he has six of them. Formulala, a big roll down, still no headliner. Finds an Alawi, finds a Lucian in the shop there as well, but has to buy a headliner here. He is not able to do so, and finally commits once again to that misfortune. Man, that feels so bad. Feels like in this situation, Malala is... He's like, wait, this is literally what I was trying to get off of. Exact thing. And here, exactly where we are once more, Malala. Looks like he is, at least for now, at least preserving HP. Might even get this win over Sasa, who's playing around the disco board. No such luck here. Malala takes another loss, and Sasa lives with almost no gold, but I don't think Sasa's board looking very strong at the moment. Yeah, the other thing is that KC Double now has been slowly bleeding out down to 61 health here. And we've seen this a lot today, right? Where the bottom of the lobby starts to stabilize, the top starts to, you know, use that health a little bit. And now we've got everyone in this really tight range here, 60 to 30, basically, as we get a look at Broccoli's board here. And the big thing for Broccoli, he doesn't have blinged out like he did last game, but he has little buddies, which is another very strong augment. And then this Zeke's. This Zeke's is another very powerful augment, giving that attack speed to the Akali, to the Caitlyn allows for good positioning here. So just a really strong board. The only possible weakness here is we only have two frontline items. We need more frontline. That's why I think we're not seeing the Shojin slam on the Caitlyn, despite the fact it's a very good item for her, is because we need anything that's going to make this frontline stay alive. I mean, it looks like some people are playing some pretty weak boards, though. Sasa's still on, like, one star carry. Noel taking damage, and we might see one of those situations where there's a big gap in HP, and it might be down to just one or two people to stop Broccoli from taking the belts. And yep. Double 61 seems still so far away from any of those crucial upgrades. He is sitting on 73 gold level 7, so we might see a big roll down at 5-1. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it is going to come up, but that's the big thing with Jersey Crowd, because now you play around the Amumu, you play around the Vex, you have actually so many of these different free costs, and you were talking about health, you were talking about a three-star Yone being the potential counter to true damage. Well, this oh, is a lot of it. Oh, he got it! He has a Samira. Now he's one off. A little bit awkward too, because he wants to keep bench space in case some of these orbs are going to be making two-star units, and that's one of them. The fact that he got the country one in particular here, though, that's yes. massive. That's the one you want. If you look at the stats, that's the highest, you know, highest headliner in the game right now. So we're going to see a big roll down here. Keep an eye on KC Double. Can we find the Samira three? Again, things like the Amumu, stuff like that. Okay, Amumu. Look at Samir three. There it is. Yeah, big time spike here for Casey Double. Does he have Last Whisper or an item here for Samir? None really of these fine. items are really good for her. I mean, yes, you want Sword and you want Glove, but on the bench, there's nothing else to make with it. I almost think you remake uh, Urgot. Urgot here yeah. to move the Hurricane and the Death Blade at the very least. So we'll have to see here. But Casey Double going up against this true damage Zed from Malala. That's another champion we talked about. Who oh no, he's Zed stuck. Again. <laughs> he got trapped behind the full front line. He severed himself. He joined the fight at 24 seconds. Yeah, a little unfortunate here, but it's still a one item, Samira. That's the one thing that gives a little bit of a, a hope here. We need to get more crit items on the Samira for it to really do a lot of damage. We don't have, like, the Last Whisper, for example. That's something that is missing. Broccoli, though, now on a five-game win streak, and oh, we have to be keep Make six, it six. Make it six. So this is the big thing. Is Broccoli on his way to the championship? One Yone off for Kevin okay, Parker as well. Okay. Another player trying to enter what could be that final battle coming to the end of stage five. And he also is one off Kiana 2, which we all know what Kiana 2 can really do if she's able to use her sample and remix to farm items and stun the front line. A big thing that comes into play here is we actually have a Samira reroll being played into the Yone reroll, but the Yone is playing around Gargantuan Resolve, and Samira instantly stacks that thing all the way up to the top. It's going to make it a really tough matchup for Double to play against. 
position here as well is really good, so that way you can get focused onto the Samira via time to ramp. A crowd diver is also as well, so big. getting the stuns onto the Samira. This is really good for Kevin Parker, but kind of running into the country wall. There's just so much HP. Yone, though. Here's the Yone. Oh my god, no last must burger. Two draw resistances. Didn't even fully stack with 40 on the Titans, by the way. Yeah, if we ever see Samira target him, though, it's just going to go all the way up to 40 right away because of all yeah. the multi hits. And Ashmu has two duplicators. And at this point, he's at his wit's end. He thought that maybe he could cheese that Yone because you can use those duplicators. But by my cow, almost all Yone's are gone from pool. So the minor story here, Zaza getting knocked out here. Unfortunately, another eighth place here. But what that does mean is that three players did just make it into check. So if Broccoli doesn't win, we now have three four, players. Well, four total four players. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Look all look the, look all the, the 18. Three. So the top three, once again, Kevin Parker, Double, and Brock, who have been dominating all of this day three. Yep. So it really comes down to can we stop Broccoli? Broccoli right now running away with it. I don't it. know about that. He's at level 9, 10 gold. He looks unstoppable, and now he's e counting up to go to 10. Ashmu, is he alive? It can Noel survive against the Onslaught of the country? Looks like he can, because this is also another true damage, Caitlyn. Double taking damage is so I think he big has for to consider Broccoli, selling right? the Urgot at this point. He's lost two fights in a row now. He's looking for max That's a true damage emblem. Oh. Oh. true damage emblem. Oh my gosh, and Noel, I mean, Noel or Malal, whoever can go, they have two emblems, they can go for nine true damage potentially? I mean, Malal is still level eight, so it seems unlikely that we're going to be able to get there in time. But at the very least, you know someone had to take that. If you give that to Broccoli, this tournament's over. So Runon's for double to add onto that Samira. Now, two items Samira, but still, this is your only three star on your board. You have to do more with her. Jazz Emblem's actually pretty nice for Broccoli to continue to cap the board. I mean, it just yeah, gives more HP, bad. more damage. He just has to tech in a single unit. I, I think it's, I was going to say, it's actually a good thing that he didn't get a great item. There, there wasn't a lot left. Jazz is okay. It's not amazing, but it's not going to be like a third item for your primary carries or anything like that. Because we know that Caitlyn was like kind of struggling to get that third item. We needed front line. So Broccoli did kind of low roll from the carousel bell a bit. All right, let's see whether or not Malala can make something happen with that second true damage emblem. Ashmu, also on his last chance, despair has fallen upon our open bracket hero, recognizing that one off Yone while being contested is just a death knell. Malala going up against the Ghost. Can Ashmu survive and potentially fight for another round? Uh, going up against the country board from double, we do see that there has been a Vex 3 hit as well. It has an Archangel, so that can start to become a massive carry. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Malala should be staying alive, and Ashmu will be is down for the count, and that is a green light for Kevin Parker. Yeah, I mean, again, even though Ashmu takes a pretty bad loss here, he is in check, so if Broccoli doesn't win it, we'll still be fine. But right now, things are not looking like that's unlikely. Broccoli on a nine round win streak here with this true damage board. Has the Jasm. Again, the one weakness here, if you look at this front line, there's not that much front line. But on the back line, that is just so much damage. And the fact you have the Edge of Night on the Akali, that's going to allow it to drop aggro, heal back up. That's the real threat. The biggest thing to look at is he had a pair of Alawis here. If he can hit the Alawi too, that frontline problems, it, they're fixed, right? And it just comes down to these back lines. There's a little bit of melee uh, traffic jam as well. You saw there was a moment where Akali could potentially have not gone through. And so Broccoli has to be careful about it, but unfortunately it works its way. Akali on their side, taking down Noel. Oh, oh, oh the snipe! Out. One and, more cast! No. Oh, I don't know. Akali's Edge of nine. Edge of nine. Nine. Do we get one more cast? Oh. Oh. Only three players now remain. Broccoli, double 61, and Kevin Parker. That was probably the biggest threat because if the Caitlyn got some key snipes here, that would have made a massive difference. But again, the edge of night making all the difference. That was the thing that saved the Akali, allowed her to heal back up, win that fight, knock out Noel. That's a bunch of true damage units back in the pool. And now Broccoli on this 10 round win streak going into the PVE round can find another tank item. The positioning, the items, the reads. Broccoli has played near flawless TFT. Averaging a 2.2 coming into Championship Sunday, and now only two doors remain before he can claim the belts. And he gets a frontline item, Bramble, into two attack damage compositions. could be incredibly strong. And the big thing to look at is the HP values. Double is lower than Broccoli, and Double has an unwinnable matchup, in my opinion, against Kevin Parker. One off of Urgard as well. He cannot find that final upgrade on his board, which will give him a huge spike. 
No armor reduction either. Using and that no last item for Samira. Oh my gosh, she so doesn't have to go for it. Yeah, oh, the fact that we have a two item Samira here, I feel like doubles out of it. It's really just down to Kevin Parker. Can Kevin Parker stop this? Right now we get Broccoli versus Double, it looks like here. And again, that Samira just does not feel that threatening here. We're seeing this fight no. here. Every Caitlyn ult with the true damage, wiping out just a ton here. The Urgot is alive, but again, watch the Akali. It's going to be able to drop the aggro. Snipes. No way. The Akali is not focusing onto no. Samira. And that's another win for Broccoli. 11 in a row. It's just Kevin Parker. Double is completely out of this. Double He's not going either Double of these for Broccoli as well. Another spike here. Oh, that's an Urgot 3. Could that be enough for double? It's like it's too, too little, too late. It feels uh, like that too. His HP lead, he's not been able to leverage it and push to eight and usually add that extra oomph to get over the top. And meanwhile, keep in mind, Broccoli's at level 10. Yeah, this next fight, if we see Kevin Parker fight Broccoli and it goes Broccoli's way, that's a very clear sign. Because if you look at Kevin Parker's board, there's just not a lot to strengthen here. You have the two-star Kiana, you have the three-star Yone. We head into this fight, and it is going to be Kevin Parker versus Double here. So we're still not seeing the final fight here. And I feel like this might be the end of KC Double. The Yone is just going to be a lot here. Can the Yone get versus down? He is CC'd. The Yone stumps in the back. Oh my oh big. Full He's out the count once again. Oh, there he goes. Healing oh. back to full. Look at this Yone go. Wow, and that Kiana also doing a number of work. KC Double 61 is down for the count. And just like we picked up, it is the two EME players facing off Broccoli, but only one can challenge him for that win. And Kevin Parker still on level eight. I think the biggest thing here will be the positioning for both the Kiana and the Yone. York two for Broccoli. That's a big oh upgrade. He's finding gosh. upgrades to the front line. The last one is going to be that Alawi. And there's just so much problems with going up against Echo with melee carries with no Quicksilver to stop the CC from coming through. That Yone has to go through the hard way. Yeah, the Yone can do this, especially the big thing is going to be watch the Kiana. If this Kiana can generate a lot of value, that might be able to swing the fight. So here we go into She's not our last fight. Oh, tentacles are good choices. That's a great swap. He's on the back line. Yeah, watch the Akali though. She's got the focus of the main two carries. The edge of that's gonna help, but it's not enough. Oh, the Yone is out. It's just the Caitlyn. It's just oh the Caitlyn. Oh my god! Just oh. barely gets the cast off. The Yone was like he's able to win the fight here. 40 stack on the Titan's resolve here. The Lowry cannot do it by herself. Oh, it's not god. over yet. And positioning again was so key there. Yone just barely able to survive. The country of the world. Two damage, two damage! Oh no. Oh, it's going through Kevin Parker's way. Kevin can deny it. He has oh, to take okay. it. He has to take it. And that. that's Alawi too. That's Alawi too. Also, Casey Double staring at the country. Double had to survive here. Yeah. My goodness. <laughs> oh man. Whew. We still have a couple more fights potentially on the table here. Broccoli can survive another hit. Kevin Parker has multiple lives. Still cannot go nine though. And I think positioning this Yone is so key. We talked yep. about positioning into Echo. Those tentacles. On the low, could be sabotaging Broccoli. Is he going to ever move them back, or does he reposition them in another way? Yeah, like you said, it's all about this positioning. If the Yone dies quickly, that's going to be a big part. And then the Kiana, as we head into again, probably not the final fight here, but Kiana, really watch, see if she can generate that value. And then the Yone, he needs to stay oh, alive. The Kiana's Yana. in the right spot. Kiana's on the York right away. But Caitlyn's focusing the Yone immediately. Yone goes the cast. Does it go down? No! He's down! Just the Kiana, and she's gonna fall as well. Big win for It is still one life for Kevin here. 20 HP should be helped enough for at least two more losses. Yeah, we're going to 7 1 here. And so the okay. nice thing is, Broccoli's board is relatively capped here. You know, a Twitch 2 is not gonna make the difference, a Kennen 2 is not gonna make the difference. Kevin Parker, though, has 50 gold. He's gonna be able to go 9, he's gonna be able to throw in another unit. There is a chance here for his board to get a bit stronger. I love that. Even in the height of the moment, Ken Parker is reaching further. I can go to nine, I can cap higher, and I can contend for this win. Yep. So again, unless something goes horribly wrong here, this probably isn't the last fight. We'll get another glimpse of how this is going here. Okay. Watch the Yone. The Yone on the other side here. Yep. Yep. So he's going to be able to ramp up. He's got that fully stacked up here pretty quickly. On the back line, has healed to full. Yours, now he's though. Okay, okay. More ghouls. All the oh Shrek my God, on the Yone. Yone. Yes, oh. he's gonna come in. Kevin's down. Broccoli. All One right. more win.
8 HP separates Broccoli from TFT Immortality. Can he close it out with such little gold, or will Kevin Parker play the spoiler? The, the big thing here is that you look at this Yone and you think, man, maybe he can 1v4 it. But the problem is the second that Caitlyn gets that ult against that single champion, that is four bullets to the face. That is a dead Yone. That's not going to be enough. So now it's really about watching Kevin Parker's board. What does he find at this level 9 spike? And does this anvil make a difference? Because again, his board can get stronger, but Broccoli is relatively capped here. So watch this roll down here. We level up. What do we see? We do see a Kiana here that can help a little bit. We've already got that in though. What are we finding here? The Lowy him. comes in for now, but again, the anvil pop here, there is an item missing on the Zed, still not too well, only the Gargoyles on the Zed right now. Karthus 2 comes online for Broccoli here. I, I like the Alawi, it's gonna have the tentacles block the Caitlyn ult. Exactly. That's Trying gonna be a big thing line. here. Yep, so here we go. This could be the final fight. Let's see who wins this. Will this be the fight that determines it all? Where is the Yone position to load in? Yone's on the opposite side of Caitlyn. Caitlyn now working out to the front line. Yone trying to work his way through. Akali intercepts. Hitting him. Akali is trying to hold off, and by time, Yone is getting scored. The Caitlyn trying to focus on, but Yone is now powering up. The cast isn't enough. Here it is. is. Through. Does it do enough? One hand on the steel. Oh, oh. It's not over. Yone, it's not over. Four, we can't do it yet. It's not over. We've got one more fight. This next one is definitely going to end it. And you saw there that Yone takes down the Akali through the edge of night, leading into this final fight. This is anyone's game. It's going to come down all to positioning. That's going to be the thing that makes it. Big difference with the Yorick not being alive to continue shredding the Yone for the cast from the Caitlyn. That's been the big difference in those two shots from the previous fight. We'll see if the Yorick can stay alive to be in the front line for that Caitlyn. Comes down to where this Caitlyn can go. Is it on the same side as the Yone, or did Kevin Parker get the juke once more? And he's now facing the tentacles. And now we have the final fight of this game. Akali and Caitlyn working on the front line together. Yone trying to tap to the back. Here comes the hunt. We're surrounding the Yone. Yone trying to get to the back line. Yone! Akali surviving. Oh, whoa. Oh, whoa. has done it. He has smashed through the ceiling. The final kill. by tactics. 5% oh, on the Yone, nothing left. One more swipe to do it. The we were... razor thin margin, every single fight there, the Yone somehow surviving. We all thought it was over, but somehow literally healed exactly the full HP. We were one auto away from ending this tournament, and now we have four players in check. This thing just blew wide open. Potentially a $75,000 Yone swipe at the Holy. end. Holy. Oh. Kevin hydrating, drinking water, knowing that he just saved the tournament for himself. Oh, and yeah. All the other players in this lobby. We broke the game for first, Mordor. Oh, finally. Thank you. <laughs> Bottoms up for Kevin Parker. And what a way to do it as well. Doing it with a Yone Reel, which we haven't seen very much because of how contested it is. He earned that. A lot of people were going to look at that last fight and roll their eyes. Yeah, it was so hard. I mean, he was contested that whole game. And the fact that he was able to put that together, I would also say those are pretty unconventional items. We don't see... You were talking about the start of the show. Darkhantian Resolve, not a common build here. But that made the difference. It kept him alive long enough to heal up. And so this is just so intense. What a final fight that was so close. It has to be one of the higher caps for that Yone board. He started from the beginning of the game, picking that, keeping the open bow for so long, finding the hodge, playing towards this out from the very beginning, knowing he has to cap as high as possible, he has to win this, he has to deny the first to Broccoli. Even in stage four, had six Yone, decides to go to eight to stabilize a tiny bit more in that stage four, let Ashley die, then hit the Yone three after while already being on level eight. So I just think perfectly played from Kevin. He really knew exactly how to continue spiking throughout this entire game and find a way to outmatch Broccoli, who hit a very early Caitlyn and a Kali yeah, we saw these final fights. It really came down to positioning. We saw oh. 
We you see second last fight. Right, right. Every fight was so close. And here's that last fight. Just watch the Yone Health rubber band. He stacked up that Omni Bam. It looked right there. You saw Broccoli almost take off the headphones, but right there, back to full. Here we go. The Caitlyn ult, and then just enough. And, and look at Kevin, Broccoli. the explosion of his emotions, knowing that he finally made it to get that win. So close at the end. And now the big thing here is we have Kevin Parker, Broccoli, Double, and Ashmoo all in check. Noel one point away. But so now 50% chance that this lobby is over next game, but it is anyone's game. So what an amazing game. Like you said, Broden, if you don't like that, I don't... <laughs> What are you Why doing are you here? here? Why are you here? Why? And for the regional rivalry as well, two players from NA, two players from EMEA oh, in like as well. So <laughs> the parody all throughout this last day has been insane. Man, one more game is what we get here. Let's take a look at Kevin Parker's journey. And I, I, I feel like this craft is so misleading. <laughs> no, it is. This is not <laughs> real. On how the tension was built. You're like, okay, well, yeah, you're like 30, you only three, whatever. The important graph here, as you can kind of see it here, is Broccoli's graph. It's down at the bottom. It ramps really high up, stays at the top. And then just on that last round. I mean, he played such a beautiful game to play for that first, right? It felt like he was on top of the world. No one could touch him. And it was Kevin Parker just figuring out the puzzle to make something that could outcap. And then the positioning at the end was so big. Either board could have won. And it just came down to micro things. I'm curious how Ashby feels right now. About five minutes ago, this guy was down. I was like, did I just throw my, away my opportunity? Did I not get that Yoni 3? Now he steps away, and now Double 61 gets a big shot in the arm as well because things didn't exactly fall his way. His items were so tough. He had the right conditions, but it didn't line up. And we know what Double 61 does on checkmate. Yeah. He wins. Yeah, I was gonna say, if anything, if you know, if Double or Ashby ends up winning this, they owe Kevin Parker a big hug. All right, in the meantime, we have another special guest joining us. I heard we got Mr. Bok Bok, the king of boot camp, on the line. That's right, I'm here with Bok Bok. Not only that is a huge TFT competitor right now, but of course, you are a big personality when it comes to the TFT space based on your boot camp. So, what does it mean to be here and to see this competition in person? Seeing this live event? This audience is amazing. I've never seen a full crowd of TFT fans. I am so happy that I got to be here to witness the fight that just happened, the $100,000 side swap. This fight, this this event is gonna go down in history. This is amazing. Wait, I, I, like, talk me through those final moments. Did you think that we would see a comeback there and or was Broccoli gonna take it? We were doing a co-stream over there on Toast Setup, uh, four of us from DSG, and when we saw the seven Yones with double Titans on Gargantuan Resolve, we were like, oh no. We, we knew there was only like one way he could win it. And uh, it, was, it was very close. We saw him win a couple times when he was on the correct side. It was just a 50-50. Yone always goes on the left or the right. And uh, Broccoli just, he has to guess correctly and he, he lost it twice. It's not really his fault. He has to move like six units while his opponent has to move one. So it's, it's always very hard to do that. But like, it was incredibly hype. It was probably the best moment of TFT spectating I've ever seen. Well, it's kind of fun when a coin flip happens in Vegas and sometimes can decide some of those final moments. But now we've got four players in check. Who do you think can take it? Oh, if there's one thing I thought was incredibly standout, it's that at the end of every single game today, it was always Casey Double, Kevin Parker, and Broccoli at the top. Like. This, this, they might high roll occasionally, but this is definitely like, they are just on another level. All right, uh, they, are, they are absolutely <laughs> nuts level players. I'm a guy who likes to complain about bad RNG when I lose, but like, I have to show respect to these guys. They are, they are turning crazy games, like Broccoli turned an unplayable game into a fifth place, and then he turned his playable games into first, seconds, and thirds. Uh, so did Kevin Parker, and so did Casey Double. I, one of these three is taking it, in my opinion, every time. I think you're right about that one. Thank you so much, Boxbox, for sharing your insight. We're gonna go to a short break, and we're gonna find out if that prediction is right, right after this.
is Mix here, and I found some Germans and, well, one addendum here on the floor. I'm here with Hayden Zolugesang and Dark Hydra as the action is unfolding behind us. All three of these guys have been competing and are now here to watch their friends Kevin and Zaza dork it out on the big stage. How does that feel, Hayden? Yeah, it feels good. I mean, it's a nice atmosphere here in the final and it's a great games to watch, so it's going to be fun to see who wins in the end. But you're rooting for Kevin and Zaza. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been hanging out with the German players all weekend and they've been really nice to me, so I almost feel like uh, I'm going to be German after this. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Now, both of you hang out a lot with Kevin and Zaza as well. Talk to me about Kevin Parker as like a player. I know you see him a lot on the ladder as well, Zolo. Yeah, he's, he's hanging out in the chat all the time. Uh, he's like a really great player, one of, uh, one of the best Germans by far. And uh, he performs every time in the solo queue, but also in the tournaments. He definitely has a really good shot, uh, finished third place in the first game. Uh, second game looking pretty good as well, hit on Akali stage two, I think. And uh, should should have a good good chance to like, uh, win win everything here. Yeah. Okay, should have a good chance to win everything. I'll take that. Now Zaza coming into this tournament with only one game win. Are we worried about that, Dark Hydra, or is he just ramping up? He's definitely just ramping up. Yeah, don't have to be worried at all. I'm pretty sure Zaza will perform well in the finals, like he always does. He's like an amazing player and. Like he won two GCs already, and I'm pretty sure he can do well today as well. Awesome. Thank you guys so much, and let's go Zaza and Kevin. Welcome back. Four rounds in and four players on check. Live from Las Vegas, it's Brody and Azale back on the couch with Gangly and Morton Dog. Oh my god, have we have we recovered from game number four? No! Are you, am I ever going to recover from that? That was insane! I, I was watching it over there, you know, with a lot of the pros and co-streamers, and I was like, well, it's over, I guess that's it. I can't believe it, only four games, it's happening again, just like uh, the set championship last time. And then the Yone just going beast mode, chop, chop, full health, over and over, it was crazy. And the fact that we had those fights back to back, where Broccoli took the one, and then there's this positioning battle, right? It's the puzzle part of TFT, and old Ultimately, Kevin Parker takes it. And we have some people rooting. We have a new Kevin Parker the fan in the mid. Ashmu <laughs> is Kevin Parker's biggest fan, tier three sub. I mean, we need Ashmu <laughs> at every tournament. This guy's <laughs> pop offs are insane. It's so fun to watch his player cam throughout the oh whole event. Oh my god. And I mean, the rest of the devs obviously cheering for Kevin as well. But I mean, no one cheers harder. Yeah. Hey, that is that Ashmoo? That's Ashmoo that's live Ashmoo. right now. I think, uh, uh, I mean, we talked about the stress, right? The this pressure. This is very stressful. This is a lot of stress. This is a lot of pressure. Hey, yeah. hey Las Vegas, can we show some love? Ashmoo needs your support as well right now. Yeah, you gotta love that. One of the four players now that is in check has a chance here to win the TFT Vegas Open. That's right. One good game is all it's gonna take for these four players, but no one is out of it just yet, because if you can string off a couple good performances, if you can stave off these people at the top from getting those first, you never know what can happen. Yeah, let's talk about like the, the pedigree as well, right? Casey Double, he's the first world champion from the Galaxy's Championships. It's almost fitting if he wins the land. You see Kevin Parker, he's actually been a promised player from EUS for a long time, always ranked one and pushing for it alongside Sologa Song. He's kind of like Setsuko many sets ago, so he's promised. And then you have Broccoli, who's been a high potential, high breakout player, crushing it. Can Ashmu, the dark of all dark forces, do it? There's so many storylines going on right now, right? You have these underdogs like Ashmu, Valala looking to show that he can clutch it up on the final day, and it looks like right now, We've got the games ready. Everybody is loading in. All right, we're here. We go. Three, two, one. Into our game number five. Four players in check, and here we go. It's going to be a wild one. Hard to recover from that last one. The preheat is on. <laughs> two fifty. <laughs> Turkey base might be over for some Americans, <laughs> but it's continue on for a couple more weeks. Let's go into game number five. Whew. All right, so looks like we're going to be doing the three champion start here. Everyone gets those three one costs again. Nothing too wild here. And on the right side, you can see the crowns on those players that are in check. They're the players that you've got to keep an eye on. This is going to be wild. 
I mean, you know, it's, it's been hard for me to like recover from that last game. So I can't imagine, you know, where the players are at right now mentally. Oh. The amount of adrenaline that's running through your veins. You have to be able to, all right, take a breath, yep. compose yourself, focus on the game here because it has been the slimmest of margins in every lobby. Yeah, I mean, we said it even at the beginning of the weekend, right? Some players are finding their edge through the game itself. Some players are actually finding their edge through the atmosphere. And right now, if you are a player that can keep your composure when the pressure is on, it may not actually be over for these players like Malala who could clutch yeah. it up, right? Yeah, Malala, Saucier, Goals at Dark Hydra. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we might potentially see an even crazier scenario <laughs> if it doesn't end here. Yeah, I do want to go back to what Azale was talking about with the mental, right? Like, Broccoli being that close off of winning the yeah. tournament. Like you said, you've got to keep that composure. He's been playing so well with that insane average placement throughout the entire tournament. Oh. So you just keep it in line here. Decides to go with the Pentakill Olaf. A pretty good start. Do you like the Pentakill version or the Bruiser version more? I feel like a lot of people say Pentakill is so hard to play around, but with a 2 out of 3, that makes it much easier. I'm a big fan of the Bruiser version. It gets you into that four Bruiser yeah. sooner, and four Bruiser is really, really good in stage two. Exactly. Find the Grogets, whereas Pentakill doesn't really start to come online until like level five and six when you've got more units to take down. In some ways, four people with check might be easier for people players to, to proceed forward. If you like, you don't have to do anything too crazy. Any of us can do it. Just, just play our game and see what happens. Exactly. I think that's the thing. Last game was a very high pressure. How do we counter broccoli? This game, it's just play your best game, do what you can, try to win. Other than that, it's play for first and, and do what you got to do here as we get another gold augment start here. So again, all these players well within their comfort zone. So when has that jazz, baby? I'm not entirely sure if that's the, the pick from this spot necessarily from their perspective, but uh, it is something to think about because that augment still can do pretty well. We'll see if there's anything else special. See a gargantuan resolve taken by somebody. Actually, might have been the player that had the Olaf headliner from before. So maybe there's going to be some sort of edge, uh, edge lord or crowd diver angle somewhere in this. Game. Yeah, Kevin Parker with gargantuan resolve. So oh, he's going to be locking that in. <laughs> I see Broccoli going pumping up. So he's going to be oh. going much more scaling. So, I do think it fits his play style because does. he has been so heavily stacking the early game. Kevin Parker with a gargantuan resolve. I feel Again. like I've seen this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me how it ends. He also it really was a good sad. episode, to be it fair. It was a great episode. <laughs> I'm, down, I'm down for the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll see, maybe, as uh, he has had that early set, which can help anchor his bruiser board, and we have seen him play around it very well before. Will it go again smoothly this time? And it's not the biggest thing, but I always do feel good when I'm, when I'm going to slam Gargantuan Resolve, that you already have another component to that, towards that second, right? He yep. has that open chain, so if he can get a bow, he'll be feeling great. Ashmo taking, that's Jazz Baby. That's definitely an augment we have not seen much of this patch, right? It got really nerfed. It lost a ton of HP. And you can see Ash be all like, again, no. so much, hey, so much fresh. fun, so much fun. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> TFT's not stressful at all. <laughs> I love it. Gold right now on the side. Broccoli with 15 gold. Humbug with 15 gold as well. So Broccoli seems like right back in his comfort zone, building that economy, getting in a good state here. But I also want to see Ash move again with that That's Jazz Baby. It does have high potential, but you've got to find that MF early, that Bard early, get them stacking. You know, we saw in the first couple of games, all tournament long, Broccoli's been looking to play around this lose stage two and then have to slingshot back. In the first couple of games, he actually was not able to get that full loss streak, was contested by a few other players in the lobby this time around. With pumping up, it's actually very vital that you try and play around that full loss streak in order to have enough economy to stabilize later. You know, I think the thing about Dash Jazz Baby from my perspective, it's kind of hard to scale that comp unless you have the Jazz Emblem. So keep an eye on that. Yeah, that's hard. Even though Ashmo is losing early, he looks like a little distraught from losing. But if you pick up the spatula, we've seen crazy things with True Damage Emblem. Don't see it on Jazz Emblem with that Jazz Baby. Exactly. I mean, you grab, you grab that extra Jazz Emblem, then you could be all of a sudden scaling up another really powerful unit. You know, that can work incredibly well. But I just feel like it, it's such a difficult augment to play around if you don't actually just naturally pick up an MF early, if you I don't agree. find yep. that Bard yep. early. Because all of a sudden, you're kind of in this weird position where, you know, do you roll to actually dig early for one of those to start scaling them up? You also uh, need to hit all your traits. Yeah, something that helps so, out there. It's a Bard too. Yeah, you've got the Bard too. You've got the Heart Steel. But the other thing is that for this trait to do anything, you need more traits. You need three traits. You have traits in. 
and Heart Steel is not really going to do it, right? You know, generally when I played it, you need to kind of get super fan and that sort of angle in, so you can hit some early traits, you know, get that active, so you can start that scaling. But uh, he's going to be playing Loose Streak, and he is going to be playing Heart Steel, so maybe try to economy up a little bit. Hopefully, he's going to be nationaling into an MF and start to get those traits online where he can start to scale. Yeah, I mean, so much, so much of the power of that Jazz Baby is that you can build a very wide string of synergies with low cost units, right? That is the power of Jazz when you're able to ramp up. It eventually allows you to scale up. I actually wouldn't be that surprised if Ashley does find something like the MF off his carousel that he drops to Heart Steel entirely. Yeah. He's not yeah. gonna get a lot of value out of out of Heart Steel going into the mid game. I, I think that's the play, right? Is don't worry about the item, find an MF off the carousel if you can, ditch the heart steel, get them stacking. That's at least your play here because if you don't do that soon, you're in a lot of trouble. One other call out, by the way, Double did get a champion duplicator. There, there is an, there's MF. an MF. There is an MF. We'll have to see if he goes it's for it. It's opposite it? side also. I wonder if. Oh, oh okay. He, he, he just cares it. about the bow. Interesting. Yeah. All right. uh, I think he recognizes that his item economy situation is kind of awkward. Yeah. And that's the thing I like the really least have about his setup, which was when he picked Dash Jazz Baby, he didn't really have components that leaned into it inherently. So he has to work from behind. But the nice thing is, Heart Steel, maybe it gives him something kind of crazy. Another interesting augment choice here, Broccoli going with Pumping Up. That's another one we have not seen a ton of here, but that's going to allow him to be strong from that lost streak position as the game goes on. That's going to be a bunch of attack speed. And in the late game, that is one of the most powerful augments as long as you can get to the end game. And if you're looking for a first place, that's a great choice. And he's been absolutely incredible at being able to do that, at being able to manage lost yeah. streaks, at being able to lose the minimum, at being able to turn those, uh, those lost streaks into successful mid games and into dominant late games. That's why he has had, you know, the best first place rate. That's why he has had the best average placement at this tournament. More you called out before, Casey Double sitting with that champion duplicator on his bench. It is the full champion duplicator, which is a little bit interesting when you get dropped to stage two. It always feels a little, yeah. you know, confusing. Do you want to use it on a, on a two cost, on a three cost? Do you greed for those big roll downs at level seven and try and get a four cost online as fast as possible? So now, basically, when you get that champion duplicator, it replaces two gold. So it's essentially, think of it as holding a two gold champion on your bench for a long time. Um, so you have to make that evaluation. I think sometimes slamming it early and making an early three star or two star three cost is the play. But, you know, honestly, if you have to get Econ, that can be a play as well. But most players usually greed for that big five cost. Set a pair, by the way, for Malala as well. Has a lot of opportunity to improve this early Ari. I've been hearing whispers that RETF is actually a lot of people's preferred way to play around to state. So with that disco line, maybe you can start thinking about it. But with the hand of justice slammed, it is not really itemization to think about with Ari, so I'm not entirely sure. Look at this hit for Kevin Parker. Just found the thresh, so he texts in the three country. Oh, he's wow. got he's oh, got wow. I think does he have the pentacle off? He, he does, does have right? The so he shouldn't have yep. four mosher. He should be on three mosher, I think, right now. Um, but hit the NAR2 as well, so has a really strong board right yeah, now. Yeah, Kevin's in, the, uh, in a and big lead. At the this should be a five streak, I think. I, I doubt anyone has a board that can take him down, but it is going to be doubt. Malala. The only thing is, this board tends to be an anti heal Oh, he has a Propello, that's right. So he should, hey, every, every box check, this yep. should be a five streak for Kevin Parker. Oh, but it's, is the fresh going to cast? Oh, it didn't oh, cast, so the anti heal doesn't actually get off. Oh, my God. And that's and they also starting out to the Olaf as well. It's a fight to the finish. He wins. He yeah, wins. Yeah, it looks like Ed Parker just can't be denied. That heck of him is too much HP. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is really kind of like the void of this set. It feels like almost you know, yep. getting that additional unit in um, really does give you so much extra power here. Oh, oh. Ash Boom. Oh. Ashmo is so Loses. excited. So it, it's hard to tell yeah, sometimes it's hard to tell. if he's excited or sad. Yeah. <laughs> that's two four lost. Oh, streets something just happened. Going up against each other, and that's Ashmo predicting. Oh, oh, look at him! Oh, he turns around. He's turned to the crowd. Ashmo finds a hit. Oh my God! That's seven bards, and he protected his lost streak. So that was two players going up, both out of four streak. Humbug losing that kills his economy. I feel like. So so here's the thing. Yeah. First of all, he didn't put three traits in, so we, again, he's not scaling this bar. Second of all is, you actually don't really want to play around bar with that Jazz Baby. You tend to want to play around MF. Yeah. More. What, what, else, what, what else is coming up for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you, right? Like, is Bard how you win the tournament? I mean, theoretically, you can scale infinite. Okay, that goes nice, actually. That's actually a really <laughs> important pickup. He does have more rods than usual. Yeah. Sometimes you could lean into it, but the problem with Bard is he hasn't been scaling it very much with the dudes, nor the batch jazz. Let's see. Zero, really. And he does, but theoretically in TFT, 
you hit early enough and you and you, and you have the condition set up, it could actually make up for that right. deficit of the normal power curve. So the big thing about that's Jazz Baby is the three traits, that's just health, right? It's not yep. really that important. You need to get to five and seven. You need to get to five and seven. Five is where you get the attack speed, seven is where you get the AD and the AP. If you can get that eight attack speed especially, oh, if you can get that stacking, then all of a sudden you have a bard with like 1.2 attack speed, throwing those things out, casting like crazy. Especially because, correct me if I'm wrong, it's percentage AP, right? So No, it's, it's still it's, the it's normal flat. AP. It is flat, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, either way, it's still a lot of built-in power to that champion. Yeah. And that's the whole fantasy of that Jazz baby, right? Is that you're scaling that up. So, hopefully he can get those traits in. I think after this heart steal cash out, I would expect him to maximize as quickly as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And he does have the Nico on bench as well. So, honestly, I think Ashmoon's kind of playing this game like he's getting two gold offense at once at 3-2, right? At 3-2, he's going to hit the heart steal cash out and most likely immediately try and build out a large string of webs to get the, that Jazz value immediately. Take a look at the 3-2 augments, another gold. People are looking for really powerful win out stuff. Humbug does have last stand, for example. Humbug needs to make big plays, but so, so oh, not about him right so, now. So, Ashmoon just had a huge reaction when he rerolled into too healthy. I don't know if he's actually going to consider that, but his reaction was very, very big. Broccoli had a choice for bling doubt, which we've seen him playing as well, but I don't think he took it. Um, so if we look at Ashmoon's board, he has this oh, golden silk, ticket. Yeah, golden ticket, pretty good here. Hopefully, find that bar. MF. Yep. So we should be able to get some traits in here. Um, and then, kind of taking a look at all of our crowns right now, Kevin Parker, 100 health right now, 6 win streak. Casey Double, 4 win streak. Wow. Broccoli on that loss streak. Oh, is he overrolling here? Oh, he wants 5 trades. He's committing to 5 trades. Oh my gosh. I don't know about this call. Oh, I he didn't even get them in. Mm. That's, that's really, really rough. I think, you know, it's like more was talking about. He wants to get towards the attack speed, right? 5 trades. Yep. You see that scaling attack yeah. speed. He's pretty heavy committed to the reroll. He took the golden ticket, so... He feels he needs to get five trades in. He's looking for that bar three. He was one off, so that's why he's committing so heavily, I think, I to see, the roll. You know, trying to get that fifth trade, trying to get that ninth bar, but didn't hit either. So he knows he's kind of in trouble now. Yeah, economically, he is devastating. He's also on a seventh. The nice thing is on a lost streak, so he has maximum benefit from it. But yeah, the health is, is getting rough. Like, he's got to hit the bar three, I feel like, really soon and start to stabilize. He's also oh, yeah, it's okay. Lilio, rolling it's for the Lilio. Lilio. It's one of the reasons I think he wanted to go so deep there because yep. you can't Five really trades. just triangle up to seven. Oh, he's again. He's looking for Bard. He really, really wants that Bard. Yeah, he's trying to spike now. And is his impatience going to be his killer? He hits a uh, Lilia too. Oh, 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 Huge hit. Huge hit. Five trades online. Lord of Ashmoo is standing up. He's here to play. Jumping in his seat. And now these become really important rounds, right? He has committed so heavy to the reroll. He's gotten Super Fan in. He's on five traits. He has that extra item on this bard. He's got to start to recover. He's still not out of the woods yet, but he has put a clock on the rest of the lobby. Yeah, I think. The big thing here is if there is a spatula on the yes, carousel. Yes, he needs spatula on carousel. But interestingly enough, he doesn't need it for jazz. He needs it for other traits to get to seven. Perfect as loss. As possible. Uh, that's, that's actually okay. a good thing. That's, that's actually a good okay. thing. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look yeah, at him standing yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah. In, in this kind of situation, you have to remain <laughs> composed. Enough to at least click your shops. And no your spatula. No spatula. No spatula. <laughs> I like the caveat there. <laughs> <laughs> Just composed enough. Yeah. To click the thing you want to click. You do have to be able to press your buttons to win yes. a game at DFP. <laughs> in my experience. Wait, unless you're Ashley, actually. Did you see the interview where he stood up when it was the final two and gave an interview while the game was still playing? And he was I, still I didn't in even it. know that was allowed. And he got first. <laughs> he got first, by the way, <laughs> while giving the interview. <laughs> Looking at these boards right now, Kevin Parker has that Urgot 2. That seems like the strongest board for sure. Still wind yeah. streaking. Otherwise, we see some Senna's. It looks like Zaza trying to play around Senna reroll. So that's an option here. Humbug has that last stand as well. So quite rich. Yeah, it has a lot of gold to work with. Yeah, Humbug's playing loose streak. And honestly, he has some of the biggest to prove right now that he is still in it to win it because he has now got seven, eight, oh, eight, seven. seven Can he find a way to turn around? And Sasa's in the same boat as well. And here's the thing about rerolling. Other people can reroll as well. I mean, and he hasn't rolled. He's, he's just, this is the thing about hitting, right? He just has seven centers, zero gold spent on rolls. That is so true. He's actually in a really good spot. I think Thank from here, you, you, for you should be gone. rolling for that for that center three. This is something people talk a lot about in set 10. If you play around something like a two-star Senna that is not 
the headliner. All of a sudden, you find a headliner in your shop, and it gives you a great position to reroll. Did you see that stat, though, that there are only six Senna's left in the yeah. pool? Oh, and people contested. hold it a lot. Wow. Yeah. And so that's, I think, the other reason why to not necessarily roll down right now is to maybe wait until other people transition off of it and then try to hit it. How do you feel about the angle of just, you know, playing a little bit more slowly, go to seven, hope that people are transitioning out, and then roll at seven? Because you only lose 5%, I believe, off the odds for six, seven on the two costs. So yep. to me, when I see that I'm heavily contested, I'd rather just push one level and then roll. I really love the pick from Kevin Parker on Salvage Bin. This is another augment whose stats are not particularly super impressive, but the ceiling of this augment is immense, not just because you get yes. to make optimal items, but that's how you start picking up those crazy uh, emblem combinations in the late game, because you can break apart things that are craftable and make it to what makes sense for your board. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And the fact that he has the health to work with means yeah. even if he has a, a crazy turn where he has to transition and gets a little dizzy, he can afford one turn where I'm going to build the best items for the late game board versus that early game board. And that's going to make a massive difference. Broccoli sitting at 11 gold now, four big shot on his board as well. Another big call out here, by the way. Ashmoo lost again. We're on a nine loss okay. streak here. So despite hitting Bard 3, we're still losing fights. That's a little scary, right? We expect Lots the Bard 3 to then spike and tempo us back up here. So, you know, you can only ramp up so long. You need help to get that Jazz Baby going. And I think also it's part of because Ashmoo thought, I hit Bard 3, I have last to throw an MF, I have Shoujin now for Bard, shouldn't that be enough to win? He doesn't have any frontliners, and that's the really big thing about those Jazz super fan boards. Your frontline is really important. Yes, you have Echo 2, but just a single chain vest is not enough, and Jazz nerfed that HP. Okay, the good news is he did finally win a fight here, so able to get that going, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. But again, Kevin Parker right now, the other player in check with us, 26 points. We see the salvage bin coming into play here, oh sells gosh. the units, now has a ton of components. What is he going to play around? Finds a Zed, at least for now. Definitely want to put in enough units to at least win the PB round, though. I don't think if it's seen anybody lose the Wolves. I think another thing, too, is nobody's rolling for three costs alongside Kevin Parker. In the previous game, we had the one benefit of double 61, also going for Country Vex Mumu. So it felt like that was yeah. easier for him to work with. This game, we've got the two cost rerolls, unless somebody, unless Ashmus gets a lot of MF. It's going to be a big turn oh, for Kevin Parker. Oh, Let's take a look here. Take this? It, it's a hard skill variation. Yeah. It is going to be a little bit weaker. He's not rolling significantly more, though. Not Maybe he could rent it. He, that's what I was going to that, say. That, I think it, he just plays it for a bit. I agree. He's got items. I mean, that's the nice thing about Salvage Bin, right? You can play very non-committal to the headliners that you pick up. Makes it significantly easier to, as you said, rent these headliners for a stage or two. They make even Shroud as well. So everything is looking really solid here for Kevin Parker. Oh, he went for a Warmog instead. I guess at this point, he's going for three items onto his Urgot. Notice it's all temporary. With Salvage Bin, you're incentivized to slam anyways, so just get items onto your champions. And again, it's not necessarily just by Yone. This Urgot can still do a lot of work in the mid-game as well. Yeah, for sure. The Urgot doing damage, applying that burn, and again, just holding these items temporarily, trying oh, to stay Humbug. alive. Humbug. Humbug at 80 gold right now, 13 HP. It's going to have to be a really big roll down. down. I imagine he's going to level to 8, have one last chance to stabilize his board. You can see Ashman went 7. He's on 10 gold, so he's spent. He's trying to streak from this position, and we'll see. And I'm really oh. interested if he gets to his board, Little if buddies. he's actually able to stabilize. Yeah, little buddies of powerful option here. We're getting a view. Again, gold, gold, gold. We've got some portable forges. We've got, you know, some other augments here, inspiring Epta. Um, so we'll have to see what everybody ends up picking. We've got a Zeke's, I saw. I don't know, he's got to pick quick. He's got a lot of work to do right now. Let's see. Ends up going with a crash. 95 gold. Down. Time to. Not rolling. Whoa. You got to spend. Uh, what is going on? He does have last stand, right? But so... you don't want your last stand to proc now. <laughs> no, you didn't. He's trying to fast no. nine? That is so greedy. I mean, you know what? What's the difference between an eighth and a second right now, right? He wants yeah. he wants a first. That's the I mean, way back in that, the tournament. I, I think that's I the know. big thing right now is the fact that he's in this position. So. And he's rolling with the Lux headliner still in, so he didn't get opportunity to get a big four cost upgrade. I, it looks like he is. He's trying to roll minimally to see if he can get to level nine. He's trying to play around these three costs like Ribbon and Lux, but I, I'm not entirely sure if. This is good enough to get him to 9. You might be able to win some fights, but that's an Estral 2 on the other side. Exactly, the Estral 2 from uh, double 61 oh, is making oh my gosh. such a difference. And it has that sustain on it, so the Lux can't actually knock it down. He's going to lose another round. Lux misses that front line. All those weak units do not go down. One more oh. Lux will misses entirely. Oh, no. Good news is it's not last stand. That's not enough to proc last stand here. 
so still has two lives. Oh my goodness. But yeah, definitely Ooh. struggling a little bit here. Two HP in a dream. Yep. Kevin Parker and Malala once Ooh, again. Malala's it's me. That's an early Sona. See the headliner Poppy with Double Titan's War Mogs on the left side for Kevin Parker. We've seen Poppy do quite a bit of work at tournament as well. Look at Malala's board though. He already has the Ari headliner, has that Akali 2 as well. Uh, picked up a Zeke's. I always find it difficult playing around KDA when you have the support items though. Yep. You know, when I'm going to play the KDA yep. lines, yep. I tend to shy away from that because I often feel that some of these configurations make it really difficult to get value. You have to make that decision. Do I want total Zeke's value? Do I want total KDA value? I'm never really sure what angle to go for. It often depends on your board as well, but yeah. I do think that getting KD value is really powerful, which is a lot of stats. And that's an Akali and an RE2, with only one item each. It's almost like I'm lost playing Endless Hordes because of the way he's got his <laughs> items. But he is very strong, make no mistake. Broccoli, on the other hand, is scaling, but he's at level 8 zero. Look at those and heart stacks. I don't know how strong he is right now. Let's see if you can get a really big hard steel cash out next turn. Looks like he's going to cash out soon. All right, last damn proc for Humbug. So he's, he leveled. He's uh, gonna have to spend all his gold right after Carousel and see if he can actually bring this back with the last damn proc. Can't lose another round. Oh, oh he's not the and he goes for five gold, but I, I just think Humbug's too broke for this. Yeah. I, I feel like he's gonna get to nine, and, and even if he does do like get a one roll, rolls. even if he does the one roll and hits the headliner, his frontliner's gonna be garbage. He, he, either his frontliner's gonna be garbage or he has no damage. Yeah. It's one or the other because he has no more gold to buy. Because if you roll with twenty, that in fifteen are gone. What do you have left? And I feel like we've seen that so many times this tournament, where people are, are really focused on getting the <laughs> headliners that are carry that you know will give them some direction, right? And they're rolling so heavy oh. to actually hit that. That Cash out ends up being three, three components. Three components pretty nice for Brock. He already got a tier early from his previous cash out. So he's gotten four components from the heart skill that he's been playing. I, but we I gotta think, see what Humbug gets done. I think the bigger thing for it's Broccoli, nine, he, broke. he has no headline. Oh, he has a headline Poppy. I think the bigger thing for Broccoli we saw there was not just the cash out, but he had the three item Kiana already this early. Oh, no, true. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be a lot of item generation. If we talk about capping a board for a first place, that's a great way to do it. Shojin on Zig, not, you're, you're not trying to play on Zig that's your item holder yeah. at that point. Oh, can and Spark as well, you're not really a lot of value when you have Zig as your carry. We'll see if he can get it done. He can even survive this round. This is one of those things where he might just die here, and that opens it up for everybody else. And Broccoli is trying to see if he can get this win. The last damn player did activate, and Jin's now scaling. Another stun onto the Zigs. Still and Zen is on a Zig, that's gonna be it, I think. Oh man, and Jin just can't kill this Mustang in time, but I Hold do the think it's enough. Oh, 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 you can see the sign of relief. By the I, way, I love it here. Even, you know, Humbug having kind of a rough day in eighth place a little bit, but you hear the audience cheering him on. I yeah. heard a lot of Humbug crowds. Such love for all of our top eight players here, no matter how it's going. So that's just really awesome to see. I Don't look now, Ashmoor's streaking. He is, and I think he's literally looking over to the desk and, and, and praying to Mort for something to drop. And he does have seven he traits. He can't do anything, yes. he's right so here. He's got seven <laughs> traits, that is critical. He's got yep. seven traits, he's yep. got the MF, he's got the Bard, so now he's getting that scaling AD and AP in for his Jazz units. And hey, if he can hit a spat, if he can get another Jazz unit in, something along those lines, and keep this win streak going, oh. that could be huge, but he's going up against Humbug, let's see it. And this could be the end of Humbug's run, but also at the same time, Ash was still in the middle scaling. Don't have a Duke count. Also, the front line cracked pretty fast. And also, this, this Eternal Winter is kind of the death of MF, who's trying to ramp up her attack speed. Can't get through it. I'm At least not win. yet. Close. Front line does not fall until just now. The MF is now going to be on the Ziggs. Oh! And it's oh! Oh, oh, my God! enough to hold on. Ashmu. Oh, my goodness. Ash, I mean, in terms of losses, that's the best possible scenario. But he was on a four streak, so yep. losing that four streak going into neutrals really does hurt, right? Yeah, because he was a lot hoping, of gold. He was hoping to continue this streak, to be able to not have to roll more, to be able to actually push levels. And now I think he's he's faced with a pretty difficult decision here because he is down on the XP. He is, you know, okay economy wise, but I don't think you can go for MF3 or anything. You've got to push levels. Well, that's the tricky part because he does have the golden ticket augment, right? Yeah. So it does kind of feel like it's pointing you in this direction of rerolling. But yeah, like you mentioned, you're on at three. Four misfortune oh my God, total definitely? is not really where you want to be. Well, and it's like Kevin Parker is going to be nine, and you'd be seven still rolling for an MF, right? I, I feel like rolling for MF3 would be so. So low value from here because you're not gonna be able to get a bailout of hitting like an MF headliner where you just get three in a shop. So 
I feel like you kind of just have to accept that you have MF and, and push on. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I think, like you said, you need frontline right now. Yeah. And so you've got to level up, find some of that strong frontline. That's going to be a big thing. The nice thing is Bard not only scaling with that's Jazz, but also just headliner Bard, getting those extra dudes every cast. That's going to make him deadlier in the late game as well. Broccoli playing around this headliner Caitlyn. He Again, I, this. I feel like I've seen this episode before. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have true damage emblem, though, so... At this point, I mean, he has yes. been a stable unit. He's been around for top fours, but he's playing for a lot more than that. In the meantime, Humbug going up against Kevin Parker's Poppy with Gargantus all and little buddies. And our front line is getting destroyed with oh, AP Urka. Oh, oh, the back, the back, back line. line finally has nah, the upgraded no back way. line. We, but we don't have enough damage it's against Poppy, right? right? Right. Unless. Oh, wait, oh, oh hold on a second. Stop. They're playing Leapfrog. Oh, on a second. I think he win I think Humbug wins this. Pretty. Yeah, he wins. He wins. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Humbug staying alive. Not even close. <laughs> Nothing to worry yeah. about. And he does have the upgraded backline of the TF. Now there's okay. a little bit more damage. Oh, the headliner oh. Yorick. Wait, he's having a. Huge. He has enough gold yeah, for this. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. He can sell. It. Wow, and just like that, Humbug's oh, board oh, is really coming oh, together. Oh, oh my God, the makings of the comeback here for Humbug. You can start to see the chance for it to happen. So unfortunately, yeah. it's not the Pentacle version, though, because he didn't have that team yeah. wide buff, which is really big. But he you can attack that in later. A lot of times. And we'll see. In some ways, that Poppy was the tank, and now Yorick is a damage dealer. So roll for roll is not a complete swap. Yeah, I will say, when you get Yorick 2 in there and you have some items, you often get so many cool casts out that they, they do soak up a lot of damage. It can kind of you know, act in a similar yeah. manner. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it does matter about whether or not he's able to deal with the backline damage as well. Malala does have to already now focus on the Yorick. Ari's going to go on Zig next. Oh, Zig, no. Bomb. Looking OK. There's and Humbug damage. survives again. Oh, Humbug looking to make the run here. The other side, Saza. Does take a loss. Not dead yet, though. He's got one more chance to continue his run. It's not looking good, though, for Saza. No particularly strong augment. Ashmu does end up winning two more. Oh, he's yep. rolling. And he is rolling for MF, and you know, wow. I do think MF3 is the way you win six. this lobby. I, I think you can't win if you just push level death. That's, that's how you get second. That's how I, you get third. I feel like you go eight to get the front line and then roll yeah, for it. That's the thing. I think I think you're right, you do need the MF3. But that front line right now, we have an Echo 2 with two items, and that's it. We saw that wasn't really working for KC Double two games ago. So that's going to be the big trick. Exactly. And it's like when you go eight before you roll down there, you have such better odds of actually just getting some of those outs. Like I randomly picking Bilawis, randomly yeah, picking up Yorks and things like that. That can turn a, a top four into a potential win. When did this happen? We have a true damage demo to the Ezreal as well as the Kiana. That is a really powerful combination, double 61. The only problem is his HP count is quite low. Going against Humbug again. That's a stun onto the Zig, but Humbug uh, is marching forward. Oh my goodness. Double 61 on one life. This is the beautiful part of the checkmate format too, though, right? No matter how far back Humbug is going into this day, this game, he can technically go 1-1-1 one, one, one and find himself the Jimmy to make it open. Just get first. Easy solution to all <laughs> your right. problems in TFT. But double 61 now, 3 HP. He would be our first player in check to get eliminated if he loses this next round. Double still holding onto that champion duplicator from stage oh, two, I imagine. That's... I'm not sure. Could be a second one, right? If you can but... find a Kiana or, you know, like he has a Kiana with three items, right? If you can find one more Kiana and duplicate, that could be something that could really swing it back. But other than that, I don't really see an out. Yeah, unfortunately, this is one of those situations where you have this duplicator this late. Your chat starts saying maybe saving it for next game. You know, so rough situation here. Kevin Parker right now definitely Lala, looks very nine. strong. Malala also another player that could play, you know, spoiler here, go into oh. check himself, finds the solution. So pretty good here. So what's open cell is uh, open cell headliner for Kevin Parker. Finds an Alawi to. Which some people say they don't even really like nearly as much this patch. You got five seconds. There's a lot oh of guys that I've done. Oh, wait, wait, you no. gotta do stuff, you gotta do stuff. You gotta hurry up. Pick up the items. The items. Okay, oh, okay. It's, on, it's on his board. Yeah, that's actually really that's big. Actually good. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but yeah, this is the risk he knew that he was trying to incur. Oh, it's, 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 wait, it's, 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 it's dead. dead. Kiana. It's dead. It's Kiana, it's just farming items. The Zed one shot that it thing. It did. True damage dead, dealing too much damage here. Oh my god, this cap is so high for double 61. And we've seen him pull rabbits out of half before with one life left. Ashmu celebrating. One life. Sasa is dead, and that's another eighth place, unfortunately, for Sasa. 
So right now, Brock, Casey double on the uprising, Humbug doing well, Zaza getting knocked out, Ashmu on this four round win streak with that Jazz Baby stacking that up. Still on seven MFs though, still on level seven. And this is something that Ashmu has done throughout the entire tournament, is that he's not someone, a lot of players in these situations, they're two MFs off, they'll roll a bit deep, try to hit the MF three, and then try to recover their economy. He has really preferred very heavily to stay above 50 and try to prioritize that eco, even when he's playing heavy reroll. Uh, that's a level nine boy with a two star Lucian, but how good is that Lucian? Meanwhile, we take a focus on this last stand over Humbug. Can he do it again? You're gonna look at this. The Yorick's down the back line. The Kiana sending it back. Not sure if this is gonna be broken through on the other side. Kevin Parker still with a triple Rock Titan. Oh, Zalawi. Oh. They stack it up. The Zalawi is a full stack. Oh my god. That drum beat is massive. No, but Humbug enough. stays alive. Broccoli dies. Humbug stays alive. So oh, Broccoli no. will not be winning this time. Goes out in seventh, of course. Now he's got to pray that Ashmu or Kevin Parker or Double61 do not win. Those three players are still alive and in check. And Humbug, he's on a seven streak. Maybe he's the one to stop him. Malala, Noel, Humbug. <laughs> he's, he's one on MF. One MF, and he's still at 49 gold. Yeah, definitely has a lot of chances here. Nico 3 would also be another big spike that would have yeah, helped with some of that front line here. I think it's time to go. I think I think if you really want to convert, you have to hit here while everyone else is spiking, and you need to start pushing the tempo and start punishing players. Because the problem is he's taking his sweet time, which he might not have a lot of time. I mean, he's got a real chance to potentially hit the Echo 3 and the Nico 3, yep. though, right? Like, he's got six of each of those. He's got eight on the MF. So it's going to be interesting to see how heavy he rolls here. Yo, Let's find out. One more is misfortune. Yes, there it is! is! Let's see, what, let's see what he decides to do. He's going to go off. Yep. He's yes. going to go off now, look for additional front line for this misfortune, make sure it has enough damage. Dazzler is really common as well for Jazz, for jazz Synergy. Yep, yep, yep. He's going for four super fan. He's actually just going to try to juice up this bard even further. Yeah, that extra Omni Vamp from four super fan can be so valuable here. Yeah. Humbug trying to stay alive again on this win streak with the last Big stand. Do now as well in there for him. Yeah, lots no of attacks on the 6-2 though, so they eventually might get outscaled. There's also the additional damage threat of this two item TF as well, so there are certainly threats on the other side. The question is, is oh, Noel no, going to be able Kevin to Parker. break through? Oh, Kevin Parker is dead! On the other side, oh, 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 Noel the oh, wild oh, 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 making the run! Oh, man. And double take, they want it down for the oh. kill! Only remaining player in check in this game. Okay, Three everyone. North Americans remain oh my in game goodness. number five. This is crazy. So everyone now in this lobby cheering against Ashmu. Yep. If he wins here, he is the TFT Vegas Open champion. But Humbug, he's on last stand and he is on this eight streak. He has really started to cap out this board. You know, he's got a lot of these two star legendaries in there. He's got the Orc headliner, he's got the six too. We'll see what he can make happen. He's playing that four Dazzler board. He's making me eat my words. I said he couldn't fast nine, and he's making it work. He's in third place. Going against Malala with the Lucian two. Is this going to be enough? Can Humbug once again defy the odds and swing this fight? It's all about whether or not the Ziggs can ramp up and how safe he can be. Meanwhile, Yorick taking that damage, and it doesn't look like that Lucian's doing enough. No, it's not. Humbug's done it Humbug done it one From more. And Humbug stays alive, and Malala oh. down. Oh. Ashby has lost! Oh. <laughs> okay, but Ashby still has 53 gold, right? So I, I don't think he can beat this board at eight. Do you try to go nine? Like, do you even have the HP? He's rolling now. He's, he's going to roll for all three stars. Yeah, right. he's going to roll for all Echo three stars. Echo three star and Nico three star might be the only way to beat wow. this incredible I, level nine board. I think we're going to. I think we're going to game six. Here. I do too. There's just so much power on this last stand board. You've got the Yorick. You've got the Ziggs. You've got the TF. The four Dazzler. I do not think a Bard and MF with this front line stands any chance. Yeah, the MF can just get so easily stuck on this Yorick as well. It's like you were talking about, Dan. Oh. Two lives for Ashmu. The humbug chance. Oh, the crowd. They want more games. Vegas isn't ready for this to be over. The MF immediately on the Yorick. Gonna get stunned up. All right, All right. Yeah, Humbug able to yeah. do it. Ashmu just one fight away from glory, but he's seeing oh. his frontline crumble. Not the enough. Yorick with the Eternal Winter is stopping a lot of the damage coming in. Another bomb by Ziggs. Humbug, can you do it? Wait, he oh, does. 
wait a second. You look at this fight. One more fight, one more carousel. Can anything change things? That that was a close fight. If yeah. you hit Eco 3, Echo 3 on this next roll down, this is Ashley's one last chance to do a big roll down. And if he can actually scale and spike this board, he might be able to take it. Exactly. You, you roll zero here. If he gets all three stars, hey, that was close enough that you could believe. And he got another frontline item here. He I did get a redemption. I, he's redemption standing can up. Help against some of his AoE he's damage. He's rolling. He found a Lucian. Nine. 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 Lucian. He found a Lucian. Four Jazz. Oh, four Jazz. Okay. Let's see if that makes a difference. I and don't know. And the thing is, Humbug doesn't hadn't scaled his board any further, right? He didn't get an item on Sona. The big problem is Humbug is playing with suboptimal items across the board, and this level nine Lucian, remember, his, his board got stronger than last board. Yeah, the, the Jazz making a difference as we head into what will be the final fight. Can the last wait, game? Allow wait, 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 allow in. Oh, we put allow in, but he, he's standing up. Put the redemption. Did he celebrate too early? He thinks it's enough. He thinks it might be enough. Here we go. Potentially last fight of this game. And now we see whether or not there's misfortune and Bar can handle it. The front line might be able to hold long enough. Can Ashbu do it? Did the open bracket hero collect enough? The front line's not down yet. Ashbu still has units on the board and the Yorick is down. Oh my god, the big Yorick has! The amount of healing! Oh no! Humbug stays alive! Takes down Ashbu and saves the lobby. We're going into another game! The lab is back! Very are you going to game six? Are you not entertained? <laughs> How about these last two games? The finishes could not be closer. Broccoli nearly taking it in game four. Ashman nearly taking it in game five. Oh my god. It's pandemonium here. Everyone's on their feet. Everybody jumps up from their chair. Oh my goodness, Humbug in the spot that we thought he could not bring it back. Scales out the board and takes it over Ashmu. I thought maybe he did it, right? That Jazz gets stronger every single turn. Yeah. He had a redemption, which is a great way to accelerate his front line. And I thought maybe he was going to do it, but is that Alawi not enough for it? No, I think, I mean, again, last stand, the power, just that extra armor, the MR, the Omni Vamp, and that four Dazzler causing everything to bleed out. We saw it was so close. But Humbug really taking last stand very literally wow. as we go into game six. Wow. That was crazy, man. Those last those last heals that were coming in onto the MF from the Bard, I was thinking he might actually be able to turn around. Yeah. When MF gets backline, you know, one cast can be the death of those carries. It was the it carries was versus the carries. At one point there were no frontliners in the yeah. way, so it was really a down to the single margins, and I really thought that the MF was gonna take out the six, but that was not to be done. I gotta ask. Knowing that he lost that, do you think he would have had a better chance to roll to zero on a? Do you think he wins the SD Echo three? Yes, I think that likely, was. Yeah. I think that was definitely the play. We I, saw, I think he would have. We saw how long the Echo was living with the heals from the Bard. I think that would have made a massive difference here. But honestly, as far as creative lines go, we haven't seen a Bast Jazz baby line, and he played it so well. And as soon as Humbug hit, and again, you can see just the passion. He's such an excitable player here. Last stand, this was a point where Humbug was in eighth place. The Great. only person, we thought it was crazy, comes all the way back from this spot to win it all. And you can see against all these boards, the bar, the scaling, just too much. Ashma so close, watch this last fight. Echo trying to stay alive with those heals. He's so close, but falls right there. And at that point, Twisted Fate applies the Dazzler. The bomb is oh, so Oh, Edge close. of Nights. Yep. Edge of oh Nights made a God. massive difference there. That was a great carousel selection. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Excellent choice by Humbug. I did not consider that possibility. And now, no look at Lala. as well. And Malala. So two Wait, more Malala people in check. We have six players. Six players in check. Oh my god. Six players. Every single game, it feels like it's coming down to the wire. We saw Broccoli narrowly losing his last fight. We saw Ashby narrowly losing it, his last fight. Now, going into game number six, six players in check. This is the part of the tournament where we will determine either who wins or whether we're having the miracle run from someone like Humbug. You saw Ashby get up. He went over to Humbug and gave him a shake of the hand. These two qualified together to the round of eight in the same lobby of top 32. They are happy, but today they are foes. And you see Humbug, he's walking out. He's getting a bunch of back pads and hugs and high fives. <laughs> but we're not done. We got one more game at least. Look look at this graph. Oh, oh my Humbug. goodness. Oh my god. That is the true last stand. Lost streak into a full comeback. Just amazing to keep us going into the next game with six players 
This is wild. It's it's so nuts. And and you have to think that you know for Ashmu in those moments, you're trying to calculate how much value am I getting from four Jazz in this moment. It also just got changed in the past, so it's maybe maybe hasn't been playing these boards as often and has a more difficult time actually calculating how much is this going to give me versus what are my odds to hit an Echo three if I roll down. And uh, also keep in mind he found the Lucian in his shop naturally, so it's very possible yeah. he is might have made him. He's planning on rolling down there when he finds the Lucian there. It's those split second decisions though in TFT that you have to make that can have huge implications. And now that we have six players in this position, we could go six games, seven games, or we could go all the oh. way to eight. So we'll have to see. But the craziest thing is, Humbug can still win. He can. He, he can, can get back to back first and win. Yep. Let's go ahead and talk about somebody who knows a thing or two about winning. I heard we have Emily Wang <laughs> on the line. All right. Everybody, give it up for Humbug. Picking up that win, I'm here with Emily Wang. How did you, what did you make of that game? This was an absolutely crazy performance. Humbug bringing it all the way back with Last Stand. Yeah, that was actually a super exciting game. We saw Humbug who, you know, hadn't done too well the previous games, but he took Last Stand and then he took Patient Study and we're like, oh my gosh, can he pull it off? Can he do it? And he did it. And it was a really, really exciting game. Especially the last fight was so close. Like I wasn't sure if he was gonna pull it off. Yeah, and with that, he denied checkmate, and now mm -hmm. six players are on check. Who do you think is gonna take it with how they've been performing? Um, so far, I feel like Broccoli and Casey Double have been playing really, really well. So my bet is maybe on one of those two, but I mean, it can be anyone. Like, Humbug can go one, one, and one out, who knows? All right, well, thank you, Emily. We're gonna send it right back on over to the desk. <laughs> No breaks for this train. We are gonna chug along and go into game number six. We're joined once more, Frodan Azale Makes. Welcome back to the couch. Thank and you. And more dog makes. You're out there in the crowd. What's it like right now? I am shaking so hard right now. I've been back there with the other casters, with the Riot people. We're all watching. We're screaming. It's crazy out there. And of course, it's crazy in the audience as well. They've been so fantastic for this entire day. They've been loud. They've been crazy. They've been chanting for players. It's so good. My, my favorite thing there was the fact that when Humbug was in that eighth place spot, right, it was like, oh, he might be out. But the crowd cheered him on. We were hearing the Humbug chants, and what happened? He came back, he came back, and ended up winning it to take us to this game six. All right, let's just go ahead and break down. For anybody who might be late stragglers, they heard the hype was going on. What happened these past two games, starting from game number four? I mean, this has just been insane, right? You know, we oh, saw oh, it oh. was game number four. Broccoli was on match point here, and it was going to be able to beat the TFT Vegas Open champion. In. But it's Kevin Parker comes back ridiculously close <laughs> round, after ridiculously close round. The beats camera him, puts himself in check. Then Ashmu in this game five here, he was in check. He was in that top two and had a chance to win. Yeah, and you, every fight just came down to the wire. You could see them both almost ready to pop off. And again, watch the health. We just. It's so close, but the TF here dodges it all with the edge of night, yeah. stays alive, and now we head to game six, and it's wild. Six people in check. It is anyone's game. This is crazy. I love the sportsmanship as well from Ashmu. Goes yeah. over, congratulates Humbug after that loss. So many players think we'll be so focused on, I can't believe I didn't win, I can't believe it, but yeah. he's, he's focusing on the, how big of a moment it is for Humbug who had been having a rough lobby, who had been not been having the performance yeah. that he had wanted. He's one of the only two players that aren't in check, but comes up with that big win. So you love to see that sportsmanship on such an important stage. Absolutely, and that's what makes, I think, the TNT community very special in many people's eyes. As, as much as we're competitors, we're also friends. We're also rivals, but we're also cheering each other on. We're each other's biggest fans. I see so many people say, man, this guy is a beast. He's a demon. I, I really hope that he wins. I mean, I hope I win in Hyrule too, but in reality, <laughs> some of my practice partners and my buddies, the people I've known for years, some people have never met some of their closest friends in TFT until this weekend. And so it's a really special moment that we are witnessing. And I just can't be more grateful to be part of this. And I feel like these players are writing their storylines themselves. Look at Ashmu. He is a main character. Like, that yeah. guy <laughs> has been such a joy to watch. And I'm sure, like, if he turned the stream on tomorrow, he'd be out there. 
Absolutely. This is the Cinderella open bracket story, right? You know, <laughs> yes, TFT, they, they posted the, the Twitter picture with the eight finalists. You know, I was looking through people's profile. He didn't even have a profile picture. The guy no. is, you know, it's not like he's out there. He's not a known quantity. But he is showing that if you practice, if you grind, if you get to that level, you can show up, you can qualify in, and you can maybe win the whole damn thing. And now we have six players on check. What about the players on the outside? Humbug showed what he can do. Sasa could also play the spoiler again, and we could go into game number seven. But I am told that we are ready. I am told we are seconds away from game number six. One more time, Las Vegas, are you ready? All right, and with that, we're queuing up into the portals. Let's see what we have in store. In three seconds, we find out, is this the last game? Or will we play off? And that's so crazy. Two games away where we were, we were like this close to finishing out on a four game streak. As many a championship before, and now we're into this sixth game. It seems like the field is getting more and more open by every game that we enter. Yeah, now we're at this wild position where everybody is playing for first, right? Even Zaza is playing for first here, which changes things even more. You're going to see a lot of greedy play here, trying to get those big firsts. And I think for players like Double and Broccoli, who kind of have that style normally, this might actually hurt them, right? They might end up getting their loss streak broken, things like that. We'll have to wait and see. But you can see on the right side, there are six crowns now, six players in check. Very high likeliness this is our last game, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. To take a look at what the openers are for some of these items, and they can actually dictate a lot, right? You see your okay, all right, <laughs> That's on. five anti shop. A five anti shop. Now, the thing about anti, a lot of people say it's not a high win rate composition. Is this really what you want to take in? Malala's in check, he's part of that. Is this what you want to take to the potential final road? I don't think so. I believe we were seeing an interview with Crowen, one of the NA casters yesterday, where he played a lot of any on like day one and even day two. Uh, his argument was, I just got it handed to me. And this might just be a situation where that is the case. But Noel in a very similar position. I, I think it's an example where you saw he didn't buy the other two Annies. You play the Annie in stage two, maybe get a good win streak off of it if you get something like a Shoujin or he did a Nashers. Buy him. Oh, he did? Okay. I mean, hey, if, if it's given to you, if you don't have to roll for it, if you just kind of natural into an Annie 3, you don't have to fully commit to the line. Right, right. right. So it's like, hey, if TFD gods go on and give me an Annie 3, I'll play an Annie 3 and then I'll transition out of 9. Yeah, exactly. I feel like the big difference from this to something we saw, I believe from Ashman in the previous game with the Dots Jazz, is the cap out. So like you're yeah. saying, even if you're running the Annie, you have to find a stronger board later on. And we are gonna go into Augments here. It's gonna be Golden Augments to start us off. And we'll see if there's any exciting picks coming to mind. We're seeing the Dots Jazz baby in the top left corner. Is it gonna be a rerun? <laughs> you can um, see him sort of toiling man. with it. Like, do I do it again? Uh, it's definitely something to consider here. Uh, Broccoli gets the pumping up again. We saw him play that last game. That didn't go that well. We're going to watch. Is he going to be able to choose this? Cluttered Mind. Cluttered Mind is These so are three good. pretty reasonable choices. Yeah. What doesn't kill you, if you're trying to play for a first or eighth style, yeah. you can <laughs> yeah. go really greedy and lost streak with that, and that can be a very high cap. So he's going to go Cluttered Mind. Yeah, and I agree with this. I think Cluttered Mind plays for a really high cap. We've yeah. seen yeah. what Cluttered Mind can do. Uh, yep. We need to get to level 9 very quickly, and so we'll see if Ash was able to do that. He took Cluttered Mine, and he's not getting any value off of this. I guess he just feels like his board is so strong that he, he can win streak. But it's, yeah, it's Yeah, it but you're losing surprising. three you're losing, gold equipment I know. for it. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is already a mistake. You see Ash can kind of revalue this, is correct? I personally do lean away from this. I think the thing about Cluttered Mine is you're focused on the economy. You're not focused on combat. And the worst case scenario is lose. he wins, lose, wins, lose. Oh, maybe not. Did he actually win this one? Yeah, he wins okay. this one. Yeah. At least he's got that going for him here, but he still needs enough gold to fill this bench. Yeah, he And can. he's not going to have yeah. enough here. Oh, yeah. no, I, think, I think you have to sell the Tom Kench to get the gold to power you to fill that bench. You can't be spending two turns. Does he even have enough if he does? Because I think there was a lot of two costs in that shop. I don't see So I don't know does. if he even so had It was close. I'd have to go close, back yeah. and see. 
but KC Double now with a three item Corky here. This is very powerful and some good frontline to support it. This is a great start for KC Double. Yeah, great start, and we've seen what Corky can do, and really up to whether or not he can farm enough gold. KC Double 61 also just comes in as a player that seemed like he was capping out, but last game he just kind of got outscaled. But we see what he can do with that gold lead. So if he can print a couple gold here or there, he's going to be in a good spot. Yeah, and you can see on the other side, Humbug uh, playing around that posture. Does have the 8-bit Corky instead of the big shot. So uh, has the Kaisen for the big shot, has two Mosher. And this Bloodthirster Urgot with Mosher is so strong in these early stages. The okay, amount of vamp that you have is really going to push through a lot of these wins. Yeah, Urgot especially in stage two, right? He gets tons of time to clean yep. things down. He gets that shield for all the damage he does, and that's going to allow him to just be so tanky at that point in the game. And so right now, Humbug and Ashmore are our two win streakers going into the 2-3. And for Humbug, it's kind of the success story, right? After that last game, the big question that's filling the room is, can he actually do it again? Can he get us into game number seven? Is that a possibility that is open here? And he is for sure going to try it. Has that cyber great augment. He's going to get a lot of value out of that. All right, we're going to see this fight here for Humbug here again. One of our win streakers goes up against Noel, who only has that quirky one, so should be able to continue the win streak. Has that Sunfire, the BT, should be a solid win here. Also building up that 8-bit for a potential line, not that we've seen a lot of that right now. Doesn't have a ton of gold to work with, but overall that win streak should help bring that back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this one, not going to be that close, so going to be feeling good. But also when you slam Sunfire, you're really playing for tempo, right? This is not really that much of a late game item. You'd always rather have, you know, Umbrellas or Red Buff in the late game. But it really can push you through a lot of these early rounds, especially when you already have a solid board. No spatulas. That's something that has been defined the first few games, but it seems like we've been spatula-less for the past couple. Spatulas, if you will. <laughs> yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, uh, looking at Malala, Malala has a really interesting augment as well. He has learning a spell. This is a, a scaling AP augment. Mm -hmm. Is that for the anti of roll more? Yeah, this is an augment that if you get it early and if you get it going on someone like a Senna especially, it can do a lot of power. You can end up with like 40, 50, even 60 extra AP. With Annie, though, it definitely makes her more of a threat. But again, the problem with the Annie comp is always you need that Shojin, Shojin Nashers, yeah. and you need an insane frontline. Again, that extra power will help, but I don't think that's really what you're going to go. So we'll have to see. But again, if you're talking about a capped out Annie, that's a great augment to potentially cap it out. It's one of the reasons in the sense of the patch that it's so much harder to play that Annie reroll line because you can't just get your first free Shojins from Super yep. Fan, right? Jewel Gauntlet, sure, it's there, it's fine, but you really do want those Shojins. They're so incredibly powerful. Um, Broccoli, also worth noting, he is playing, pumping up once again. So he is going for that scaling line. You know, wasn't able to win last game, but of course he still is one of those six players that are in check and is looking to try to claim that title for himself. Yeah, last game it didn't really work out for him. He ended up going, I believe, seventh. Uh, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. That's just, you know, one bad game. Pumping up still an augment that caps out so high. If you can reach that late game, the value ends up being astronomical. It's a pretty nice fight for Ash to be able to win, but more team loses, but that's okay. I mean, that's part of the reason why he has this full bench and that economy going for him, so not likely to streak anyways in that situation. And we're focusing on Sasa. Need that good streak to continue as uh, we do have the ability for Humbug to potentially finish off with the full Witch And for Humbug, like you're saying, that's a big, big narrative, right, going into this next game. He wants that win streak to keep going into the Crux because that would be so good to get that up there. Is level five right now. Could maybe try and upgrade something on the board, but it doesn't really seem like the shop is going his way. I'm pretty impressed by how much damage he's able to output, even with just quirky no items. I think this just goes to show you how powerful you can really play around this quirky. Going up against Tom Kench with Scrappy Inventions. Oh, Tom Kench Rage Play. <laughs> uh, oh, I mean, That's unless. That's a mean frog. Yeah, we'll see. That is a hard matchup, especially, at least you've got the Sunfire, but there's so much item value over there, so that can be scary here. And unfortunately, Malala gets his uh... Lost Street snapped by Broccoli, who's going to go full yeah. off here. Despite benching his headliner. 
Those were both four, four lost streaks, right? And Broccoli sold. He just sold his board. So he actually did, you know, play around the fact that he could run into Malala. That Hecarim just ganked the Corgi and took out all the DPS. <laughs> uh, that's a big loss for Humbai. That's a big deal. And now only Sasa looks like he'd be the one that's streaking. Yeah, no one at 100 health win streak. But the other major story here Broccoli's is... Broccoli's health yeah, on five the, loss. I was just about to... Broccoli's health, five loss, 80. We've seen what? people as low as 63. Yep. 80 is amazing. That is that is the dream. I mean, you're playing pumping up, and you got a five loss, 80 HP. That is kind of crazy. Now, we talked about Malala playing this Annie reroll. He has eight Annies. With this augment, that's going to generate a lot of extra power. So if, if Annie could win a lobby, this is about as good as you can ask for. And he's oh, only... Gets in a Moo Moo. Yeah, Moo Moo wow. and Echo. He's only rolled twice, by the way, or two gold, excuse me, I think, spent on rolls. So one roll that he's actually spent so far. So I expect him to try to roll for it uh, right here on four, and we'll see if he can hit. If he can hit right now without spending too much gold, I think he's going to be in a great spot. That's yeah. actually really cool, because that means he's rolling dynamically on stage two. He's not just saying, I'm just going to wait in AFK. And he's collected a few annies since. Let's see if he can hit very fast. If he goes down, oh, yeah, wow. 30 gold. And that's the money spot. That's enough for you to economy back up, get to level six, and keep on pace with the tempo. Yeah. This is the moment where you kind of do the question marking. Like, wait, we're running Annie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is exactly when you want to hit it, right? This is when you play around the situation where you, you natural these Annies, you have the eight, we saw he just natural them, was open to the line, and now we could see a spot where this Annie gets tons oh, of kills, Yone. Wow. tons of stacks, it should be in a good spot. But this is a Yone already on 3-1 for Broccoli, who loves these three cop headliners. And that's a Crowd Diver Yone, isn't it? Just based on his traits, I didn't see another Crowd Diver in, so I think that might be a Crowd Diver. I mean, if it is, that's really good. That's literally the best one you could possibly afford. I want to see it. Awesome. Pumping sure, up, but, but right? I didn't see any other. That's amazing. So I agree. It's it's a great champion. Another it's a great lot. thing. But the items are definitely not what you'd necessarily want to see on the end game, but should get him through the mid game. Theoretically, that is the best damage output for Yoni. A lot of people believe it's the edge best. And if you get a Banshee's in some kind, or maybe something like a Recombob. Silver Veil. Broccoli has Recombobulator. Recombobulator? Broccoli has Recombobulator with that Yoni. Oh my Yoni. god. Top right. That's so risky, but it, hey, maybe you want to risk it for the biscuit. I mean, it turns into a three star foreground, and there's a lot of melee champions that love his item set yeah, in particular. Right, yeah. He's considering it. Oh my god, he's, he's going he's for it. it. I think he's going to do it. Oh! The arms go up in the air. He knows how big of a hit that is. So he's rolling for hearts. He even has even shroud, man. Like he's got the perfect items set up here. I think he's oh. just rolling for a board, right? Find a three cop headliner. That's true. That true. He just needs a board in here. This Ezreal could do a lot of work. Oh, big shot! Big, big shot. shot! There you that go. That is huge. Oh, I'm Pantheon. Pantheon is fantastic. fantastic. Yep. What a spot here. Four Guardian, three super fan, has a two big shot. We are at three two with an Ezreal two, even Shroud in, two tank items on the Pantheon, two headliner. This is an incredible spot here for Broccoli. He went on a six three, only down to 73 HP, and now looking to turn it around. Yeah, as long as he can build a front line to build this board, this is going to give him a lot of tempo. The question is, we haven't seen an Ezreal Ooh. board cap out and win lobbies. So it's going to be up to Broccoli to take this tempo, convert that into that first place comp. It is really interesting because we've seen a lot of second places. I've seen a number yes. of games where we've been on seven, eight Ezreals and yes. never been able to actually hit that Ezreal three and haven't been able to pivot out of that. And it often does lose, as you're saying, more to those fully capped out boards. I will say that Ezreal does lead to a really high capped board state because theoretically you can still play around hard steel in the late game if you have set and king. Yep. And then you can still farm items even to the late game where you get the extra Thieves Gloves. Just even a few extra components can be that difference and you continue to scale. So I think part of it is that people aren't as comfortable playing with Ezreal compared to some of the really powerful things like Akali. But I do know there's some believers. I was talking to Jisop over the weekend. He really believes Ezreal is that good. Yeah, I definitely agree. And you know, I know we're on game six here. We're starting to hit that long point of the day. But look who's in first place right now yes. on the six round win streak. It's Zaza. Oh, man. <laughs> and if he wins, we would be going to game seven. So I heard Zaza... like six games. How about seven? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see. He is going up against Broccoli, and that has to be a big storyline here. He's on that win streak, like you were saying, more than if it were to stop right here. Oh. That would be unfortunate for him and great for Broccoli, and that's exactly what happened. That Ezreal ult just deleted that board. And this is why a lot of people love Infinity Edge onto Ezreal. The Death yeah. Blade is actually kind of whatever, because you get a lot through Big Shot. 
but the Infinity Edge is what really allows you that big AoE wipe to the point where there's actually been discussion of when that four big shot is good for Ezreal so that you can go for those big AoE wipes. I'm not entirely sure if I believe it, but I have seen it happen. Yeah, I, I always just feel like four big shots so hard to play around exactly. because it, it makes your front line so weak oftentimes when you're trying to fit them in. Sure, if you do hit a big shot headliner, then maybe you can kind of squeeze it in, but it always feels really difficult for me to play. Another story to be looking at here is Malala with that three-star Annie, but down in seventh place despite hitting that very early, really needs the components for those Shojins, right? We talk about how Annie is very dependent on that item build, has plenty of power, but without that, could be a free fall. So that's the risk you take when you play this Annie line. That's a good point. And also has one star everything else besides Annie. So Annie 3 is great, a lot of DPS. Still need to put units in front of your carries. That's always been the beginning since, it's been true since the beginning of TFT. Yeah, she needs to ramp up at least four casts before she actually does anything, Ooh, really. Ouch. If you're looking at this, <clears throat> good units not really upgraded yeah i mean no other upgrades besides the annie and these are not good annie items this is not a winning board like just straight up you, you can't win a lobby i think with annie three with these items well here's the thing he's playing around super fan all game yeah so he could get to a situation at the end of the round at, at the end of a pve stage where he can use super fan to pop off that rage off. blade yeah put that rage blade on sona because yeah. that is the win condition for the composition is you get Annie three you speak you somehow get the sona five maybe even seven spell weird from the very like high roll case cases and then try to find a way to win but it's just so tough because, you know, there's not that many more stages to get a lot of components, right? He still needs to find the Shoujins. And that's kind, that of, kind of my concern, is that it's like, he doesn't have a single component towards it. If he's sitting on two tiers, you're like, hey, find some BF Swords. If he's sitting on BF Sword, hey, find a tier. The other challenge here is that, you know, you mentioned Spellweaver, but he's already got AP from oh, right. the Augment spell. from yeah. learning the spell. So, yeah. exactly. So it's like, you really don't necessarily want to go that Spellweaver route. You're True. looking for something with just more frontline here. Checking in with our open bracket hero, Ashmi. He has a true damn gem. We're trying to go for a hard steel cash out. Finds two four costs. That's a pair of Thresh. Now, we've seen True Damage Emblem be so good all day, right? We put that on the Caitlyn. That's been the popular one. Play around that Akali. So definitely has a lot of options here. The problem is, his item set is no kind of awkward because you have things like Rage Blade and Last Whisper. And I mean, you're doing True Damage for a lot of portion of your damage. Last Whisper is less of a priority. And even then, you want to play around melee carries. You want to play around even Shroud instead. So this is a lot of awkwardness to add to his board. I want to see how he makes it work. Because if he does, this man is cooking up something. Yeah, and you can see it in his face even. That's a lot to take in. Yeah. All of those four costs, you need to maneuver around. And the Poppy going in last second goes in the back line. You're not really distributing the items where you wanted them. And it is a loss in the end here. Kevin, however, is going to try and end this with a very elusive <laughs> this <guy's> so <laughs> <laughs> Broccoli's really looking like he's kind of in the zone, though. He's locked in. He's not reacting a lot. He's now up to level seven on a four streak. That Ezreal is going to push him towards the late game. He's going to have an opportunity to win this tournament in this game, and he knows it because he's very stable right now. He will reach nine this game. Yeah, it took a big risk with that recombobulator, and it paid off hitting an yeah. AD champion with those items. There were a, definitely a few outs there, but hitting that one definitely one of the yeah. better things he could have hit. Sasa has a headliner Samir. I didn't see which uh, version he hit, but he does have army building, so if he can spike really early, Maybe something crazy can happen if he hits three of the crowd as well. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it feels like you need kind of three of the crowd, or you need to just high roll your mind and three star everything. The only country board I've really seen get a first place in the tournament was one with three star uh, set, three star Samira, three star Urgot, three star Amumu. Yeah. It's like you needed everything. He also has Executioner yep. Samira, which is lower cap because you usually only play for two, and the four Executioner is not enough because you want to play for more of that front line to get that five country. So it's, it's actually not the correct Samir I put that quotation points. I feel like country also doesn't cap out as high. Looking at some of the boards that we have been oh, seeing, God. like the true damage one that's just coming around every now and then, we've even seen a seven country board lose to that. Yeah, we, that is also true as well. It goes up against Annie 3 here from Malala, who still is not any closer to that Shojin, by the way. He also only has three Samiras, and when the staff came up, it said that I think there was only nine remaining in the pool. So people are holding some, people are playing some at this point, okay. so uh, it is definitely an awkward spot. Maybe we're not gonna stay on it though for yeah, some. I don't so think you should. Maybe we have to figure out a different game plan. We have seen a Mumu Vex boards work, and his items with so many AP items like Tears and Rods lean towards that, but I think it caps a lot lower without a crazy powerful Augment. We'll see. Augment time. It's gonna be Golden Augments coming through here. 
couple Many of her, big hits. A couple of heroes, grab bags for people looking to three-star their champions. We see some little buddies in the corner, always a popular one. Contagion. Any last stands or anything? I don't see any last stands. Um, I saw so. little buddies, which is really high. Oh, raise the tempo. This is a really unique augment board. Yeah, we haven't seen this in a while, but basically what this does is this is going to allow Annie to get to that state quicker because cast. she gets that double cast, and after she casts four times, that's when she gets into that really scary state here. And the other thing I wanted to call out with Malala is that even though he was on that lost streak, he has learning to spell. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that's going to keep raising his power, raising his power, and now we're in a situation where he's on a five-win streak, you know, we'll have to see versus Broccoli. We do have to check in again, though, because we're past Wolves. He didn't get a tier or a, or a BF sword. Again, he's still just sitting on that spare bow. He had to make another uh, dual gauntlet there. So he's got one more PB phase. That's it. Yeah, so we'll see. And people could deny that, right? Like, say, like, hey, I need that tier. And also Malala needs it, so I'm going to grab it. Uh, we'll have to see. Oh, oh my she god. Is so strong. Come yeah. on, one more. There we go. That's the stacking AP dip right there. I wonder how much AP that Agni is actually at at this point. Malala is on the table for real threats of this lobby. I will say that. It kind of depends on how the rest of this stage pans out, but he, him, and Broccoli look like leading candidates to me right now. Yeah, for sure. And again, that stacking AP, right? That's the thing normally in any comp kind of has a cap, right? It's like yeah. Annie starts to slowly fall off, but with learning to spell, it's doing more and more and more damage as it continues to cap on, and that's gonna be so powerful. Broccoli, on the other hand, Ezreal kind of at a cap here, down a silver augment, has used that tempo, lost his streak here, so now it's about how do you convert this Ezreal into something stronger, and right now we have zero gold. Yeah, he went he went eight and did go to zero, so he's on that thresh to as the headliner. It is the Guardian headliner, so he has a pretty beefy front line there. This is a good board. Ezreal's on three items. He's definitely a solid board for stage four. Yeah, agreed, and I think that uh, he wants to look at nine, I can realize he's even staying at 8 for an entire stage or so from here, not going yeah. until the end of stage 5. Going up against a Kaisa 2, which is not very particularly powerful. Noel also, by the way, still in contention. Oh. And he gets uh, completely wiped, but he's going for a uh, level 8 at 4-5 to see what he can hit. Yeah, he has a lot of health to work with, unlike, unlike some of the other players. Kevin is down to 25, and if he loses one more round, that might be crucial. We're gonna head into the carousel. He does win this one. Good to see his first pick. Could get the Kiana here. Yeah. Or the Zona. Both great options. Oh, Sona is available. Malala's third pick. But Sona's such a premium and unit. It's gone. No. no one's gonna really pass Sona very often because she just fits in so well with her attack speed. It's just so powerful to enable many comps. Looking at Humbug's board, though, and his items, it doesn't really feel like he can actually use that Sona. He can use the Crick Love if he wants to commit to, to a Samira reroll, but look at the items. He's obviously can't really do that, so it feels like a, a super difficult position. I think with Little Buddies, the Samira is gone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, we're, we're moving on to something else here. We have that blue buff clearly looking for oh, something like that. Okay. Here we go. So we'll have to see on the roll down here. Again, looking for these four costs. Ari, probably the high roll. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, oh Spell Weaver, Ari. I swear I wasn't pressing buttons. Nah, <laughs> if you were, it would have been KDA already. And he got the Sona and an Alawi. Wow. Almost Are you sure perfect. you weren't pressing buttons? Definitely a very good spike here. Has the blue buff already for that Ari. So at least going to be able to use it there. Seems like at least a big upgrade. So that's here. five Spellweaver, right? He has that uh, with the Echo, the Sona, mm -hmm. yep. Seraphine, and the plus one. So he's on five Spellweaver. He's got three items. So. He's got some damage. I mean, if he get, but what, what do you do with the the IE and the BT in, in this? You're in supposed this to be You're looking yeah. for a Kali, which is why I think on the low, Boy. he might long term. This is fine for now because he's obviously going to win. But on the long term, I think he might have to consider selling Zari because I think that in the end, you want to play for uh, either the KD because the Spellweaver, it kind of limits you in terms of what you're able to actually do, unless you're trying to go for a big cat with Sona too, which is a little bit unpractical here. He's going to keep rolling. So he's definitely, he's rolled down to 20, rolled a couple more times. We'll see, does he actually want to you know, send it further and try to find this Akali? Ten no one Akali's has Akali. Before. Yeah, they're all in. <laughs> I mean, it feels so bad. I feel like, oh, oh. Yana, that's a pretty decent okay. item holder. <laughs> And so if he picks up, like, say, another RE2, I think that's a spot where you could there sell. But he also could have his back against the wall because he has little, so little HP that you can't sell because he's in a spot where he actually just lost too much HP. Interesting. So he drops five Spellweaver to put in the Kai'Sa to hold the item for now. How do you like this choice, Mark? It, I think that's an okay choice for now. But again, we know everyone in this lobby right now has to be playing for first place. 
and this is not a first place KDA board, right? The fact that you have that spell weaver, we know five spell weaver doesn't, you know, really make that big of a difference compared to three spell weaver. Now, the one thing to note is does have those two, uh, the duplicator. So if we find something like a Kiana too, that could be a, a good spot to transition, get out of that Ari. And the thing with uh, Kiana is Kiana is actually a very good blue buff user. You can do true. blue buff Kiana and yeah. then play something like the Bloodthirster and a tank item, and that can be very powerful. Lots of casts. Don't look now. Ashmu, we said that there was uh, 10 Akali's in the pool. Now has a Akali too in one turn. And uh, now is streaking and going to level nine. Ashmu is also in the conversation to win this lobby. I mean, it's such an interesting board too, right? He's playing four executioner with a red buff rage blade, true damage effects. Like, yeah, this is a, a pretty cooked board. Like I said, uh, the items were awkward. How he's going to make it work? He's making it work. It's it's so impressive to me when people can figure out these kind of situations, yeah. right? Because I think it's a really complex state of the game. Have some weird items to not necessarily have a clear line to play. He commits more to that executioner line for now to get him to nine. The, the bigger thing with Ashmu is the gold. If you look at the gold, he has a lot of gold. Rolling a little bit here, but he's one of the players who can probably get to nine if he wants to. I agree. I think Ashmu is looking oh, very, man. very strong Looks here. like another eight. Zaza, though, not looking as strong. Yeah. Three losses. Oh, there. oh, oh man. You hate to see it, but he, he rolled down. I mean, that was going to be an eight. He's no oh, gold left. Okay he's on seven. Business. And Delta D1 gets a free win. And Sasa effectively forfeiting, recognizing that he's too far behind. And that means Humbug is all that stands in the way. Yep. <laughs> if, if Humbug gets knocked out. <laughs> by the way, still no Shojin here on this Annie. So yeah. definitely not optimal items here. But, but getting yeah. mileage out of that Annie. We're still middle of the field for Malala. Top three now even. While I agree the oh, item wow. situation in the late game is going to be a big problem, for now it's still working. Yeah, the big question is how many stacks does that Annie have? What's mm. the AP on that Annie? Because if it's really high, it can just melt things regardless. So, yeah, like you said, the big story, Humbug is all that stands. If Humbug wins, okay. we go to game seven. Otherwise, this is the final game. Oh, six? Oh, Th damage that's six. six, too, right there. Yeah, he wants a it. shop. Uh, and he does have... He'd rather go for... Oh, four true damage, which is once okay. the emblem. So he picked up the Viego. So he has the Viego headliner for the edge lord, but he doesn't have any items on it right now. This is a moment of paralysis. I, I think. I think in these kind of situations, you got to get rid of uh, Clutter Mind. You're not going to ten. He's doing He's that. Doing it. And, and, and I think this is kind of where it confused him because he was looking at his board. Can I actually make a better board? And now he lost a bunch of HP. This is minus one life. That could be a critical mistake for Ashmo. Yeah, the good news is he does have a Ziggs too. He is level nine. He's ahead of the pace of the lobby. So maybe can trade a little bit of health for one turn to stabilize. You know, do we keep the Viego here? Do we resell it, try to go for something else here? Um, but has these items on Samira. I feel like you've got to move these over to something like Ziggs. That's got to be a little bit better. But otherwise, decides with the red buff on Viego. Interesting. Yeah, I thought yeah. the red buff was going to go on at six. Yeah, I, I would have definitely assumed that as well. But maybe he's cooking up something else. Is this really our strongest? Board when we just look at kind of how things are set up. I, I don't know if the Samir's a legitimate carry. Uh, Rage yeah. is one of her worst items. I feel like, you know, getting Dazzler in, getting rid of the Viego, getting some sort of two-cost frontliner, getting those okay. items in on the run of day. Okay, Humbug right now has two duplicators and four Aries. Oh, we could see an Ari uh -oh. 3. Oh my gosh. And if we see oh an Ari 3, I think we'd be going to game 7. So, we'll have to yeah. see if that can happen. Can how good is Ari 3 now, Mort? Oh, that is Oh my gosh, hold on, hold on. Oh. Oh. Mark, why is the one cost winning over the arc? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> no, well, Sorry. Another loss, Kevin Parker. Oh, another true damage emblem. True damage emblem, crowd diver emblem, disco emblem, pentakill emblem, a lot of viable options here. True damage, definitely the popular one. Noel's gonna pick that up. We do see crowd diver picked up by Kevin Parker here. That's another big grab. Right. Malala taking the Punk emblem could roll it, maybe, but interesting choice. That has to be it. Malala, always oh, maybe rolling for KDA emblem. That's a we'll have to see if Malala can turn that into something a little more useful. <laughs> emo, you know, he, is emo, he can make it to emo emblem as well. It's a craftable emblem. Does he have a salvage bit? No, he has a doesn't he have oh, no, you're oh, right. he, he doesn't have a, game. That's a different game. No, and he doesn't have a he doesn't oh, have a reforge. Right. Right. Oh, Kiana, Kiana, oh, Kiana, Kiana headliner <laughs> online for broccoli. That is gosh. Big. Oh my gosh, wait, that is massive. 
And Broccoli has had pumping up running this whole game, right? So he yeah. has so much free attack speed. When we're going into stage six here, he's going to transition some items over. And we'll see. Blitz 2 comes in as well. That's Shojin even now on the Kiana, plus all the free attack speed from pumping up. This is going to be a lot of casts coming out from this Kiana. The Kiana's position in front of the Poppy. If you can get some cast, no, it says he's going to Yorick. He wants to be able to farm One these items. It. Oh, that's stun. Oh, and that's actually a big deal. The fact that the Kiana aggroed onto the Yorick instead. Wow, that Ezreal almost able to snipe the Caitlyn. And it's so close. That the Poppy Ezreal's barely holding driving. down the line. Ezreal is going to wow. clutch it out. Oh, huge win here for GSG Broccoli. Look Something that I absolutely hate is on Noel's board, it's now like the third time we've seen it, there is an unslammed spatula that he's been holding, not able to transform it into anything. Yeah, look at the health, by the way, of this lobby. We talk about close lobbies. Oh my God. First place is in 28th, seventh wow. place is in 12th. This is still anyone's game. And remember, right now, six of these seven players, if they win it, it's over. So this is getting pretty crazy here. KC Double has this Akali. Very strong here with the true damage, but not the six true damage we've normally been seeing. This fight could be so big. The Kali's gonna act onto the tentacles. In fact, a lot of this positioning indicates that Malala oh, is happy. It walked around it. Uh oh, First ult is gonna come in. Well, the Akali's getting actually a lot of value. It actually went around because the Amuva went onto the tentacle. Akali went right in the middle and it's getting crazy value. No CC. With those shuriken. Oh, oh my god, the tentacle. fade on the tentacle. And that extra second could be huge. Oh yes! no! Double 61! That technical reviving was everything! We gotta see how much health, health, how much health people have now. Double 61 down to 5. Noel down to 12. No, he's actually oh, dead as an update, so he's out. We got 12, 12, 5, 16, 18, 28. This is crazy. Yeah, this next fight, 6 1, we're gonna get a very good glimpse of the lobby out. because. We could oh, lose man. three players. Oh. I really want to see what Ashmu's board is now. We haven't looked at him for a couple turns. He's on a three streak. He actually has 20 gold. He's been sitting at nine, so he's feeling somewhat comfortable and does have that extra life to give. Don't look now. That six power diver is so big for this composition. We talked about six power diver being one of the highest win rate comps in terms of traits. And Kevin Parker is streaking. He is on the low. One of the biggest threats in this lobby, but we're going to see a big roll down here. Yeah, Ashmu going to be rolling down. He has a pentakill and a true damage emblem here. I think he might be looking for that York for the five pentakill, but I'm not sure what he's going to go for. The roll down isn't really working the way Kevin intended. Does find the Kane headliner, does not want to pick that up. Keeps going here, and the board doesn't come together. Broccoli just hit double Sona. That is huge for him as well, because he wants to ramp up his entire composition. Ashmo has Pentakill Kali. Is this good enough? He does have two lives. And he's going against Kevin Parker with six crowd divers. Yeah, we see the Viego doing his work here. He's got that true damage emblem. It's on the back, providing that extra damage. There's just so much. But unfortunately, it looks oh, it's gonna be close to Akali healing back up. Ziggs doing his best. It's gonna be really oh my close God. here. The healing almost slides in! And Ashmo takes a loss down to what Broccoli is life. out. Double still fighting, but it's looking dire. Oh no! Humbug! Oh my god, Humbug now. Humbug is now the He could push us to a game seven. Yeah, he could. It is on the table. Two Titans have fallen. Broccoli and Double 61 are out. Kevin Parker still on this win streak with 12 health here. Malala has enough health to survive. Humbug, it'll be very close. Ashmu right on the line here. We're getting some adjustments to our comp here. Trying to move these items around. We've Wants got three items too. on the bench. Yep, really needs that Kiana too. It's gonna be so close here as we head into oh what gosh. could be our second to last fight. All of these players are sub 20 HP. Any massive hit will take them out. We might even see a double elimination here. Kevin going up against Humbug. Humbug has been doing a fantastic job at knocking out players uh -oh. one after another. On the other side, we're seeing Ashmo against Malala. Both of these are Ashmo so lost to Malala scaling. The rage play, and he won't be denied. Is Ashmo dead? He is! Humbug, Humbug's at one health. Humbug's living. If Humbug gets eliminated, this is the final game. It's Kevin Parker on a six streak, Malala on a three streak. Humbug having lost that round, trying to find Oh something. my God, Kiana two from Kevin Parker. 
The six crowd diver comp. That's so huge. We could see a double kill here. We could see a double kill. We could see six crowd diver Might take it. Kevin Parker to a championship. That emblem making a big difference. These items on Zed. Let's go into this fight and see how it plays out. And he's done it before in game four. He was the one that stopped Broccoli from running away with this competition. Now going up against Humbuck here. We don't know who Malala is facing, but if he takes out Humbuck, each other. It is secured that the tournament will end after oh, this. Oh, yeah, the R1. For it, going for it. Is it going to be enough? The R is casting. Zed is getting stunned. Kiana stunned again. One more cast. Can Humbo do it? He has. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. Humbo's Kiana went crazy in that fight. The two Kianas were hitting each other. Malala is still there. Oh my god. Yeah, those two Kianas. It was all a battle between the two Kianas in the 78 field. Is that what he wants? Humbug passes it. The crowd is electric. Everybody wants a game seven. This is going to be a hard fight, though. This Annie has been stacked up for so long, has great augments to get her ramped up. We talked about it wasn't ideal items but he made it work. He's got this Annie with that learn to spell. Oh Just a great use of the augments. Malala's caps. So much of it is about the positioning with the Kiana, right? We saw the difference the Kiana made here for yes. in that last round. Can he actually get it onto this Alawi? And the tentacles beat everything yeah. when they position. Right. Exactly right. It's all about whether or not that Annie can actually do her worst after all those sex. No Shoujin. We've been doubting her, but she is here to knock out units one after another. Humbug holding strong, trying to get us into that game seven. The Ari's on the Kiana. The Ari's on the Kiana. Oh, so low. Falls to the Annie. And he's still working on the front line, but now the front line has fallen. Here comes the Ari. Humbug. Going. Wow. Oh, it's still it. alive. It's not over. It's not over. But right now, if this fight plays out the exact same way, we are going to go to a game seven. This is wild. The Annie just can't quite ramp up and do enough. My God. This Kiana providing so much extra value. The extra items getting spread across is just so much. Will this be a miraculous comeback from Humbug? Will we go to a game seven? It's crazy though, because the Kiana got on to the Nico last time and got items right away at the start of that round. If right, it hits a right. tentacle, it could be totally a different fight. And here we go, final fight of the game. Who's gonna win it? This is going to decide everything. One more time, oh, Ari yeah. versus Annie. Can the Kiana sustain herself? She's in the middle of the no. field, falling down oh my God. to the Annie. And the Ari double tag team, and That's Malala it. is running away with this one. Malala has paved the way he in the did. final lobby. He choked before, but still today. Malala wins. Malala able to break the ceiling. Malala is your team fight tactics. Vegas Open Champion. Unbelievable. From 512 players down to one, Malala has bested them all to become the champion. What an amazing play, taking that learn to spell Annie and taking it all the way. A few final fights and listen to the crowd. He is pumped, he has earned it, carrying that belt. What an amazing player. Malala was the beginning of the new wave of players that grinded, that wanted to prove that they could, and today he is. Let's give it up one more time for your TFT Vegas Open champion, Malala! You've got the belt, but the your grand prize of $100,000. We've got Jeff Virtue, the executive producer of TFT, Liz Lambero, the senior director of publishing for TFT, and Michael Sherman, 
The glove will have him organized play. Tacticians, make some noise! Woo! I can't hear you louder! I'm so excited to present $100,000 to our first Vegas Open champion. Congratulations. One more time, let's hear some more noise. Woo! Malala, I know the emotions must be running high right now, but I gotta get your reactions on that final lobby. That was competitive, and you are standing above the rest. Yeah, honestly, like, the entire day I wasn't playing that well. I, like, fought forward a couple of the first couple games. And in the last game, I got, like, a really good Annie spot. And I thought, like, it was going to be, like, the meme where, like, my back's against the wall and I decided to Annie reroll. But somehow I came out on top. So, yeah, it's crazy. And you have this entire room of people cheering for you. Can you even believe it that you're here on land with all these fans? I honestly can't believe it. I've met like a bunch of my online friends at this land and they've all been super supportive and it's just been an overall amazing experience. Give it up one more time for your TMT Vegas champion, Malala! Congratulations, thank you all so much for being here at the first ever TMT Vegas land. We are so looking forward to seeing you all next time. Next year, let's go! TFT land. That's right. This is the TFT Vegas Open. 512 competitors flew here from all around the world. They're taking the stage to be able to compete for the title of the TFT Vegas Open champion, as well as for a $100,000 grand prize. They've got a lot of games to play. You're not going to want to miss it. Vegas is a good choice for a TFT event because people would just say TFT is all about luck but there is strategy, there is skill. It's kind of surreal, like, to see how far TFT has come. Oh, that mid to play constitutes the top four. <laughs> I'm winning the tournament. Keep winning, keep winning. I'm winning the it tournament. It always says that. I've played in like, tournaments on land for God knows how long. I definitely think it gives me advantage over the other players. I saw them, you know, kind of like buckling under the pressure. So they're about yeah, but here he goes. It's the Jurgen Cap! Jurgen Cap! Stay alive! It's so big! They're making their way oh. to the back oh. line, but it's not enough! Wow. Lightsey is going to cut it off. Oh, that's going to be a good one. 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 Oh, that's going to be a good it's crazy. When I first came in here, my fan interactions have been so funny. I've met someone, his name is uh, Michael. He takes a picture with me, he's like, yo, are you nervous? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm a little nervous. Like, I'm not doing too hot right now. And he's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really nervous. I'm really, really worried about Tatsuko. I actually qualified for Worlds. This guy is way better than me. I'm playing against people who are like, literally like some of the best in the world. Bridge from the Carthage does enough, but still. Oh! Mike is a one-punch man. Second place, it is going to end at that. Malala will claim first place. I won the world in set 3.5. So uh, I did uh, the hardest thing to do in TFT. People can stress because there is no wall jump in the, in the table except me. Once I get onto stage, it's going to feel absolutely amazing. And I'm going to be absolutely so stressed. 
I think you can make it. I can win. Being in the final is an overwhelming feeling, but feeling all the support behind you, like it's starting to pay off, you just feel proud of yourself and a lot more confident that you can do it. I can be the person who wins Vegas Open. I think it's 50-50. Uh, Either I win or I don't. I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna make sure that I uh, have nerves of steel. The Humbug Champ. And Ashby still has units on the board and the Yorick is down. Oh my god, the big Yorick is down. Oh no! Wait, we missed one. Malala has paved the way in the final lobby. He choked before, but still to stay. Malala wins. Malala able to break the ceiling. Malala is a team by tactics. Vegas Open Champion. From 512 players down to one, Malala has bested them all.